Thank you, Atul. And I, uh, uh, in kind of fortunate that we didn't have Atul Aramis to, to be here with us. Um, but uh, again, this is in collaboration with uh, the Center for Advancement of Tagayan Scholars, the CATS Tagay Communities Forum here um, with uh, under the Wa'la umbrella and GSDS working together to bring you today's event uh, and uh, to, to uh, speak on behalf, the chair of the Tagay Communities Forum Women's Committee uh, I would like to introduce uh, to come on and, and say a few words uh, before we get started with our first session. Thank you. Mama you there? Okay, there you go. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's good morning in my place. Hi. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, thank you, Kat. Uh, Kat. Uh, Walana uh, Tigray Community uh, Forum, uh, Anna Be Nida Kanstio, uh, Kama Womber Nita Committee Malatiu, and part of Night Walaya. Uh, Hade Musbinakum, Kal I, and Tayu Serhana Nizibil, and Hana Serhana Nida Kanstiona, uh, inspiring women, Yevil Tuxina, and Alamana Nusu. Women Taina Nebarata Aluda Kanstiona Malatio, Nusser Antaina Gabber, Hada Arsam Nat Kilona, Al Kulana, Kal Ai Tanan, Tana Beta Sonan, Nukun Hulu, Alzgubber, Kulu, Mikas Asin, Mithagazin, Kin Maher, Kin Zata, Nigabber, Mazahatu Aflut or Amahavina Sofa Shahazi Zelena. Uh, after the law of Havavi, which is diaspora and Dina Kuduna, Hazi, after the Nakan Piltalana, after the Lena Luhavavi, the social do you, the economy do you, the political will, uh, no was a Luka participates in the Gora do, and the Sat of Tinukona do. Madam, Bimudilau, Walla Kamzi, a panel discussion at Bimudwar, Bismasasala in Anna Raha, Walla Bizadalu would Amit Amata in the Raha would be the wood, Bimuzuh Melkota, Naraha Vina Malatu, Mizaka Lumalatu. Kauzi Tala Ila Hazi, Avishenda and Inata Rahina Nena, but Andi Kastaina Wun. Arsena will say, Ya, I wish and I give it. Come to his shahs in Riozit and Hana Akarawa. The Kanustiana of Bibahali Deraja, so tonight we give a civilization to Bahal, Taisum Hamzelena, Zer in a Gari, Ziba Alusi Hade Nahalfo, Kafti Bahalina. Sultan Zuhone Taismu at Hazaham Zinever is a Rieta. Tayu, Hadaham Lipaham Zra Ta Gizesa Tawan Nissa, Haza Anna Zawa Hulhavavi, Kav Zamaria Jemira, Maria Ayuz Bahal, Ashenda Bahal, Av Kali Havav Amelisu, after Gray wished him out of you, Ainwar and Atahalez Bahal Malatu. As of the Anna's Aukul Havavi, Kavta Ashenda Malti, Kavta Maria, Jemira, Shah Meskel, Darga Mishet Mishet, Stylo, Goilalo, at Ruun Goilalo, Goila Bevezhi Kayed. It's a Sunite Hawas Gize, Tendek and Stah, Tendek and Stahuligize, Sabi Zosa. Hazi, Anantai Yul Maslaku, or Ashenda Haitimor Azuil Namutai Gilwood Okoto. Well, I shall damn the Rihatumra. 
انت تصبق انت لا تاي كم تمسل يخاطر يازلخا تصبقا هزي تخالي خطفلت اتدليو لا وشتي صبقا فلتتان كالي حاليوتان انت اكثر يكا كتفلت يا خاو نورها جن بملك عريخا بمرعو جن انت موتي خالا او غزاها مستمر حيا مالتي كم تا اول عشان دا نبرتا اونجنا كتقصل مخانا فليت كاس حما اتبه البالت نشتي تي اوت دراي كم زي لا يا انا زري مو بتلم دوخا عوي تايسمو تمرت زهب دك انستي اوف تي وانسو كم لبن ززاره بالو مرحتن زمرص قالو مك اقل زمهرالو تبا ايسن بعراق كم تزغلت زنبره زري قالو ازي كله ادمه خمهرو زغبو نغره اوزات توسنت اوان بزح نغره تخايدو بزح نغر ريئن سن كستايلن يزغدا هذه ناي قدم مرحت من الباش ورتها لكم انا بعد ما وقروا دفت سنزبركم اتناي مرحت بعد خمس باسان تايبل دك اشندا تايبل ايول ابو درفي او غويلا فتزغبر غويلا خشع مسكن زدرفو درفتا تلو نمرحت مون يوم زنفو سميو صون تسب اشمر دي تسب فيتن في ان قديميت كاز زرب نجر ديو يقرب يو زيتات كله افت بهلنا زعته ونجر يو دحر دحر زما صاي مثلا حد حد غزي مراحت خمز زبر صحيي زنجس نغسي زبهل بعلو دحر زما صاي مثلا مخنياتو نيرو يو تو حساب كم مجلس تدلي يوم مجلس دليت كم فلات نيرو يو زبل تايسمو لنا افت بهلنا مالتي لذي زي تات كل سنة أنا ينتخذنا أو زي زي كم لبنا أنا حزب أو زمن الشندة كم لبى يخزر توانا نجر تأيو اتباه لناس بزح نجر بزح كيف التشيز جب أم نجرة مهلا وماما أزي نختم جور زي جور كم نختم صوت جور وزل لقطة وجسخة بتعم نادن قام قلنا نقبل قام قلنا كفلت يفوتو كالي إجن أب أب زلنا يو نيديس برا عالم مالتيو تنورا لو مالتي أزي بمن تعينا حزوز أوان زيس بخمين قل صون هلنا أب زلنا يو دك أنستيو كم دك أنستيو إننا تودونا ببخبابينا حدا أفتو نيزا عدي لك أتو نحنا ولكم على ما زحزنا يو كان أي كعجزة زت على ونجر أوزنا إذا عدي ناي بوليتيكا أمرت عديو أو تفعل عليه زجبرو من كسر أسد تساتفتو قينا بكومنيتنا بزح جزء أو زلقو الخبابي ناي يس ساي حدست كولورادو أو ينيقو هذه بتخ على متن نا نتسمنا نفتي أعمل لني أنا كاردي كم كاتقينا ويكع كمرت أكاتقينا أفزبل كستين إن أطول لمن قد تقدم يلزنا برا بزح زي ما قداش أفتو سرحن أفتو أنا أبرخ من محاش الترح الجورة نورنا قلبي أيرنا politically ون نحنا أفتو نورا العدي خمس كم دك العدي كن جورة زقبة إننا نجر كن هو زقبة إننا تس إنه فترت النقون اللو دكنا أوريدي حزام ملو بمزح ملك عحزي ناتواسو نعنا وني لا لنا خبز النور إلا هو سلازين نحنا خا كم تي رخيبنا يوز لنا هناك نفعل تقلو تقرأي نبينا أيا إنه لو زي خلاص ااا مساء خوينو دم سخس مع الله خوينو دم سنا سامي عمس كوسنو ويك عبتو زقبوهم عقمي كحقزو نازخو إلو اللو مقردي توديو نانو سرحلو حادة كم تلاوو وقروفتو كم قدي تاوون قدي تانا ايو نحن وصلق مكيلا لنا كال اي كم دك انستيو مت انتعا زيشن دا قزيزي تنا يحواتنا مكراوون اتوزو اتحن نازل لو شيقر مساكوني نازي خونس محرني ناخ خوون كم زقبوه 
خجلت حزي أبزا كل تسلل استمعت تزجات أما دودا نايس على أتنا كل نوسم سقوميو بناء علم هجي يخلو بناء منم هجز جز أم نجار شلا زي كونو أجنبار أنتو أنت وقعنا بحساناتن نبدأ كنستيونيو أما تو ناب زدخم ولادي خم تاتز مسلسل زرقة ولنا خد زدودو هو أزيت هاد كله إنك على حلو من جد إن مكتلو من جد إن أنا جد نجحريت كم السنة ويك أخذ دخم النق سكون الناي ولون رأيكم أنت خوينكم تندك عديت عتنا ندك أن جنبارهم سيمن كسردان تلا أو كدمي أو ما يبغي نفع زودي برتع أجرك نز أو سعي ينزل ويك نجز بخا تسوى إلى الناس هذا النهلو أكرمي أيريا، سلازين إحنا ونتحرننا تي وش تنازل لجودعتنا وحيتنا بحرنا زاد اللي نجر كله نتدري يكون ن دك أنستيانا يكون نزلو ت أو تدري زلو تشجيره زنا برزلو كن كون يجب أن إلى يحسب تحرنا أو دمنا له فلت إياه كن جو رزق بقنا بقى تجبره ومجبري اتحرنا ودمنا له إهن مهين قرود خمنا بلينا أو أنبرت أو أنبرت أبزنا يدك أنستيونا عشان دا جزين طريقهم ما كافي بلا إنير يما خر أيه نبي يجمرة بيبي يودع تاي جورة يتكامل له سلازي اتزات هذا نبرأي أول الدنيا نيرو أفتنا نأشتي يدك أنستيوني رأي وأنا أشتريت أكاويت بيت السبع أو أفيد بيت السبع كمقانا مثلا الترئيو نجارات ما بزحتيو تبرتاو مقانو رينا كاو نمهارو بزح نجارات اللومو بخمزي كنواسا ناتلاوكو بتعمي يقني لنا كات إلى يمسكن. ثانك يو. ودي. Dani, Dani. Naidi, I saw Anya. Dani, you are muted. Ah, well, look at look at technology. Ah, uh, my apologies. Ah, uh, members of thank you very much. It's a pleasure to hear you. Uh, you know, you've always uh, put light on what we mean and what we've done uh, in our communities. Uh, you touched on uh, the youth, you touched on the, the women's, you touched on the men, you touched on all aspects of our society. And, and it's, it's a delightful thing for us to hear. Uh, following uh, that great speech, uh, we're gonna go on to our uh, keynote speakers. Uh, we're gonna start with Professor Hetian Abai to, to, uh, to be the keynote speaker here. Uh, and then after that, uh, Professor Dan Frank Brewer will be our uh, follow up uh, keynote speaker here. Thank you. Do we have uh, Professor Fetian on with us? Yes, please, yeah. Hello, oh, yeah. There you are, Professor. <laughs> have you here? Okay, the floor is yours.
Uh, Professor Fetian, uh, I'm not sure if uh, you're speaking, we can't hear you, or uh, is it me? Hello? Yes? Are you okay. waiting for me? I'm sorry. We are waiting for you. <laughs> oh, I, do, I don't know. I, I, just, uh, <laughs> no I, I don't know that. Uh, sorry for that. Mm. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, uh, you know, we, we have you as a, a keynote speaker, and uh, I want to open it up with you. Uh, you um, too well. Go ahead. That's it's uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good morning and good afternoon for those of you in Europe. Uh, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, for the most, uh, you know, uh, 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 most important uh, part of my life. Um, Ashenda, I'm my living witness, a great fan of uh, Ashenda. So most of uh, my speech addresses uh, my personal uh, experience and my group's experience. And uh, as a Tigrayan who worked for 28 years continuously as a professional, I've been involved with myself for, in Ashenda as one of active participant and leader of Ashenda. So Ashenda is, uh, um, as it was already mentioned very well in the documentation, um, it is a, a you know it's a, a woman gathering where we can also develop our womanhood and uh, sisterhood spirit, and also um, we also del deliver our services uh, and also deliver our peace orientation, it's about love. It's about taking care of yourself and taking care of the society and also showing accountability, uh, starting from the religion, religion respect, but also respecting elders, uh, respecting married friends and respecting mothers, respecting um, parents who had no children also and show them love. Uh, we belong to them, and that belonging was also a great hope. Uh, I know so many parents with no child are still really uh, adopted some of Ashenda children uh, because of that connection. So um, Ashenda has uh, uh, so much uh, undocumented uh, processes. It's very invisible. Most of people observe it, what is visibly demonstrated in terms of music or whatever, but the, the, the internal, what matters is the internal and the invisible process that develops within the system of the girls and the women. And we used to uh, practice agenda very well uh, before the dark and uh, during the dark, um, it wasn't possible, especially at the end of the dark collapse, the whole society of Tigray cannot uh, demonstrate the Ashenda holiday. And it was almost forgotten in the system. That was the reason where uh, married women and uh, adults uh, were involved in the ceremonies uh, to, you know, to recharge the system. But also, you know, Ashenda is not a static. Uh, Ashenda is a very dynamic process where you have to react based on the situation and based on so also the, the current administration. For example, uh, when I was a high school student in Mekale, came back from a degrad, I used to travel to Mekale purposely to see um, the uh, industry workers. I mean, relatively, that was the only industry we had where workers on, um, uh, uh, Gamma Arabica uh, collection center where the, revol the revolutionaries in that time and uh, they have to, uh, you know, respect the governing body who already uh, replaces Lul Bangesha and they have to visit uh, the governing body there and the, the respect given to them was very low level as compared to the previously known and previously defined kind of uh, recipient. And um, they have really to create an immediate song to criticize uh, about, about uh, the whole stage of the government was not uh, 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 as expected. And of course, the militaries were ready to 
uh, <clears throat> to disregard them and also to you know to attack them and they have to deliver a new song uh, again that uh, military and when the military starts to be aggressive they immediately change another song which really shows a loving statement for the militaries you know all this flexibility and creativity is already there so it's right like you know where we have to show uh, rejection of uh, existing uh, governance, you know, even for the recent uh, government, the current government of the Gray, if there is a comment to be given, uh, people expected um, the Ashenda doubters will express it, wait for them, you know, this is a culture for, for Tigrayans. So if there is some serious comment by the people, it's always expressed by the ladies and uh, they take notes and then, you know, they, it is a time where the governors have to take it very, very serious. So uh, recently uh, we are facing a very disastrous and unfortunate uh, attack against uh, the Tigrayan community. And um, when the woman, you know, I was really, uh, I had a mixed feeling when I see the, the young ladies who are really fighting for their right. Uh, in one side, I was very sad to see them in that kind of uh, living condition where they cannot, uh, you know, go to school. Some of them I have noticed were my university students. Some of them were also, you know, university staffs, young ladies uh, under that condition, you know, they are not in a very good living condition, but they have one purpose to fight for their uh, for, for their, you know, right, for their survival, even beyond right. Um, so they have a purpose. But I was so amazed also, you know, I was inspired by the girls when they create several uh, songs, they cre create several songs, which really re reflects the situation, the current attack. And uh, this is what Ashenda means, you know, Ashenda, we should not really, there is a, an interpretation by various presenters, advocators. They advocate that we have to keep it as is, as indigenous knowledge and or a culture without any change. And uh, But uh, it's really a process. It is a process. It has been really changing, changing. But what we have to be worried is whether that direction and the dynamic is going into expected direction otherwise um, i'm always optimistic for uh, for the dynamics and innovations going on you know they are not very well captured they are not uh, very well presented we had uh, a master student who who did a wonderful uh, job she presented during our uh, international women networking conference that was an amazing study that has to be promoted otherwise you know the current agenda is also an amazing because, you know, combined with the current education status of the girls, they are so innovative and they bring something important for a woman. And also they collaborate, you know. It's a collaboration where you have also organize yourself, where you have uh, to help each other in teamwork. And the continuous uh, networking has been established in the agenda forum. And um, you see women are making friendship and they have time also for themselves and they can drink, they can eat together, which was not there in Tigray. During my um, uh, earlier uh, young stage, you know, you, even you don't go, uh, uh, you don't go in the town, in the street in Makala without having the traditional gavi covering all your faces, you know. So this is really completely different. Uh, where we, when we talk freedom, it's uh, a freedom what you want to eat, a freedom what you want to, to speak, a, a freedom what you want to express. Uh, there should not be restriction. But you know, uh, Ashenda is peace, Ashenda is love. So I was shocked when the government of Ethiopia bombarded the Tigray during Ashenda, you know, that's a very big shame because it's attacking the girls, it's attacking the, the mothers. And uh, these are, you know, the reproducers of the uh, current generation that everyone in the world has to really uh, respect women and children. And in the big event, 
doing such kind of disturbances is so really uh, uh, shocking and, um, uh, you know, they, we have to really uh, stand against it. And uh, all humanities, all collaborators of Tigray, all the lovers of Tigray, Ethiopians have really to stand against this uh, event. And my focus is more uh, what, what is the most amazing part of uh, Tigray is, you know, it's very diverse. It's a very small uh, region in terms of area coverage comparing to other regions, but the most diverse region in terms of the tradition, the cosmetic and the, the um, traditional uh, beautification methods. When I, when I have to prepare myself for agenda to make decision what kind of decoration I have to use, I have to travel to different sites. That was my purpose. In agenda week, I never work. Everybody knows about this. Before my marriage, I used to go to my office even in the new year after eating lunch. Doesn't make some for fun for me, but agenda is a big holiday for me. If I don't do agenda, if I don't really move with my group in the street of Marela, I can't function the whole year. You know, I met one woman, even um, uh, a little bit older than me. Uh, she's married and uh, uh, had six children. All her children were married also. And um, her husband accepted that she would stay in Mekele for six days with a group with us, singing and enjoying and dancing in the night, in the day. And he has accepted, but her children could not allow her. Are you getting mad? We are ashamed of you. She said, I don't care. I have already contributed to your growth. You are a grown up married children, but I have to do what contributes to my health, to my happiness, to my continued life with my husband. So, you know, she was so amazing and a very from Devry had a group, a group of uh, 20 women. We always go on street and um, I like singing. That is, you know, um, this stress killing strategy for me. But uh, since I came here, I never sing, I never, uh, uh, I'm not happy here. I had a lot of happiness at home. And the major factor is uh, Ashenda. Ashenda contributes for your happiness. It contributes for your effective working environment. And you have also a very good work relationship with people, very charming and also very loving personality. And you stand firmly and also speak with a strong eye contact with people, with your leaders or whatever is because of Ashenda. We grow up in a similar culture, but whenever you are involved in a gender practice, it has a lot for me, for other friends like me. So this has to be really preserved. This has to be preserved. And the diversity in agenda in Tigray is an immense. This close, for example, is from Maxub. I had my Raya. I had my indirect, I had my kiltawla, and I had my agama clothes as well, you know? So these are a very rich heritage that we have to respect. I was very much impressed also the decoration type. It's not those in the markets. I appreciate the current innovation to unify the decoration in the market with a very little cost everyone, everyone can afford. Whether we are rich or not, we have to, we have to buy that decoration. That is an innovation, you know. Previously, you can identify who belongs to the better us, who belongs to the poor people because of the decoration and the type of the clothes. But right now, we have similar decorations that you can buy and throw it for one year, very cheap and accommodative for everyone. So that is a very much uh, interesting point of it. And uh, the clothing is, you know, when you are young, you are not required to to wear elfi or traditional cotton dresses. It's obvious for having chiffon. And uh, I, I really remember, I don't know how many times my mother or my father used to buy clothes for me, but what I do remember is they buy the Ashenda clothes. And I have to sleep with it and, you know, earnings the day to come off and to close. And at 6 a.m., we are already outside. And uh, 
we don't come back home, you know? So this is a very big memory I have. And um, we have to respect this culture. We have to promote this culture. We have also to condemn the current uh, attack during Ashenda means a lot. It's not an ordinary, ordinary week we have. It is a week of peace, a week of love. After the three days celebration, uh, there is a community gathering in the marketplace where parents and elders are out for enjoying the, the gathering of Ashenda ladies. All the group members in a given town, whether they were 20 or 30, they gather and they pray and they sing for peace, you know? Peace, let's gather and pray for peace. We'll have a good, a good season next year. Some kind of like that demonstrations are already common as a conclusion of the event. And uh, as it was mentioned by Memher, uh, Memher Zanash, um, it's not only three days actually. The three days are uh, more connected to the town, the city, big cities, events. But if you go to the rural areas, it's a very extended event until the new year and sometimes mescal and uh, you know, you see girls are enjoying their areas, their environment and their localities. And um, they are, uh, the most uh, triggering uh, uh, topic of uh, Ashenda is, you know, it is a platform where we also stand the rejection of violence against women. So all the songs currently uh, uh, produced this year were really against the rejection of the violence that happened on Tigrayan girls and women. So this is a dynamism of uh, Ashenda, and uh, I'm so glad to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I think I have to conclude my presentation because I see so so many experienced uh, personalities like Dr. Hagos, Dr. Wolbert, more professional on this area. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Professor Fatin. That was a very good detailed expression of uh, Ashenda in your eyes. I think. Some of the key points that you touched on are, are, are one, how innovative our women are, how innovative. And that's something that we absolutely have to focus on. And then secondly, um, thinking about the resiliency, you know, the, the, the fight back, the saying of, you know, this is a moment in which that we will stand up and then not allow the gender-based sexual violence that, that continues to happen to the, to the woman of Tibet. And a lot of evil deeds, and touching on what just happened recently, the bombing of uh, elementary school or, or children's school, preschool, and these kind of things, we, we do have to stand up and use our culture to make sure that we defy against them. And, and you expressed that so well. And thank you very much for doing so. Um, <clears throat> and I do apologize for not uh, reading your bio. Um, you, you, your bio is extensive, and, and I hope we get a chance to cover that. Uh, at some point here today. Uh, but I do want to move forward to uh, Professor Dan Franz Boer. Um, uh, Professor Dan uh, got his undergrad uh, study, studies in mechanical engineering and journalism at San Jose State in San Jose, California, uh, one of my favorite cities, so go San Jose State Spartans. Uh, and then did a PhD from the University of Rochester under the supervision of Alan. Hoban, who did research on Highland and Hara land tenure. Uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer, uh, Professor Dan uh, served in Peruvian Andes uh, upon return to the US, did a graduate studies aimed at social anthropology in Ethiopia. Uh, in two years uh, in the Harina, Harena, a uh, community of a thousand people prepared me to prepared him to better understand the social world. Uh, the Derg made uh, the continuous the continuation of the research impossible. Uh, the Derg imprisoned one of uh, his Tigray former assistant for seven years. Um, he then began research among the Highland uh, Chimatic in the Octagon region of Mexico. Um, he taught at the Wesleyan University. 
Uh, he's out of the Lafayette College since 1972. Today, he directs a team of the Lafayette students helping solve uh, organizations, uh, organizations' problems. Uh, they work with hospitals, development projects, municipalities, NGOs, and et cetera. Uh, I do welcome you, uh, Professor Dan, to uh, take the floor and uh, um, make your remarks. Thank you. Hey, is it possible for me to show some slides on the screen? Absolutely. I, I think you should be able to. Um, yes, grant him uh, a co-host status. Yes, yeah. It's enabled already. Okay, we'll see if that works. Um, yeah. Is that visible? Uh, not yet. Not yet. So you okay, let me see. So use the, the green arrow at the bottom. Okay, well, I'll see what that does. I'll get the up again. Oh, that one. Okay, yeah. share screen. That'll probably do it. Yeah, it will. It should. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah, good. We can see that. Okay, good. Okay, uh, the uh, slides I put together are really not well suited for Ashenda, so I'm going to reduce the number to just a few. Uh, you've already summarized what I did before I came to Tigray, which was uh, more than 50 years ago. And uh, so I uh, arrived and there was Abraha Castle. There was a very small town compared to today called Makele. And uh, I got there to join and understand a Tigray community. So we see some uh, entertainment people doing kene and uh, producing uh, ironic music, which was kind of nice. Uh, for me to get permission to work in a small community, I had to have permission from the hierarchy of the empire at the time. So I had uh, uh, notes from the university that were okayed by the emperor, went to uh, Ras Mengesha, uh, and then from there to Wukro, and then I took them the hand by hand, place to place, until I got to Harina where they accepted me. Uh, incidentally, of uh, sort of uh, celebration, uh, I was invited by Mangesha to his house, and he and Prince, Princess Aida served me mies. Uh, so anyway, uh, my main problem was knowing enough that I could learn about community through language, and I uh, had had a lot of trouble trying to learn Tegunia. I could find no grammar on it. I could find grammar on uh, Amharic, and eventually I was given uh, the assistance of two young men from Makale, uh, uh, Berge Gebru, who you see in this picture. And so uh, I set off into the community. This is my wife at that time holding a small child, and this is me with a number of people, including the village uh, administrator. Uh, the, uh, uh, what would that be called now? Uh, um, anyway, uh, he's the one who ran village meetings and things of this sort. Uh, I got a house at Hidemo and met with people in various parts of the community, went to church, uh, and in church, I uh, uh, played the Dinatsu and sat as a uh, deacon in that part of the church gathering. And then we played Tim Hatz afterwards. Uh, everybody got together and did uh, a game to uh, sort of, as a community, sort of think together. And then uh, after that, uh, I had joined a Sinbet Mahaver, and this is my group. And uh, it was a little complex in that when uh, my wife had made Hambasha, and I had, and she and I had made Sua, Kashi uh, Geb Gerges, uh, who acted as my confessor, said, well, he couldn't be there to open my Sua 
because uh, he wasn't sure I was a proper Christian. I need to be baptized. And so he was going to arrange for that. And then he uh, didn't do it. So it came the day for the Mahabharata to be at my house. And uh, I felt I had to have uh, my assistant, Berke, who was a deacon, unseal the sua. Uh, but uh, Gabriel Gerges showed up and said and unsealed it. And it was kind of a uh, political ploy uh, to tell the group that I had already agreed to give the church a Coleman lantern. So he was a little political about this. So I'm going to go on beyond that and just say that uh, one of the things I thought was most important was to understand where respect came from, Hibri. And uh, there were certain things that were fairly obvious. You know, wealthy people were little, went through doorways before people who uh, were less wealthy and things of this sort. And I think we're all basically familiar with how that works. Uh, and people would slide down on a bench to make a place for somebody who was going to be entering into it. But one of the things that I wanted to understand, and I still try to understand as I work with communities around the world, is what are the values that people are expressing when they give people the respect to go forward or be put back in terms of respect. And so I have spent a lot of time trying to do that in different places, in different communities, in different projects I've worked on. And I found the way I understood Hibri in Tigray has helped me a great deal every place I've worked uh, on a couple of continents. Uh, what kind of respect people had, how much it was, uh, what were the values of the community that, that pushed that forward was it religion, age, intellectual power, uh, showing community uh, orientation, and all those kinds of things. I'm going to skip through these things because they're really not necessary today. Uh, but it changes the way people show their respect to their community. If their community shows them respect, it's because they have been properly doing the deeds that that community would like to see. And I think that's an important part of our lives and it's been an important part of my life as a result of my uh, membership in a community in uh, Tigray. Uh, this was one of my assistants. Uh, this was a picture I shot coming back 23 years after I left. Uh, the man is holding a photograph I took of him when he was three. It's probably too small for you to see. So he is holding himself, holding his father while he's holding his own three-year-old. Uh, so that's kind of a nice uh, cycle of, of families over the years. Uh, this is my assistant, who was my best assistant uh, in the period I was doing research. Unfortunately, the Derg treated him very, very badly, put him in prison for seven years, and it wasn't until the uh, Tigray Liberation Front got him out that he was freed. This is his daughter. This is myself and my ex-wife. Uh, these are my old friends. And here is the most powerful woman when we speak of Shenda. Uh, this is Mitzlal Muz. She was the wife of the Chikashun, Kenyat Dimtsu, uh, who welcomed me in, but she would hold meetings, even if he wasn't present and preside over them, and was a very powerful, influential, influential woman within the community of Harina. And at the time I came back in 2003, the first time in 33 years, they said, oh, you can't see Mitzlal. I said, but oh, I really got to. And I said, no, she's up at the church. Uh, she's expecting to die right away. And I said, well, I'll go up to the church. And they said, no, you're an old man. You can't make it to the church. And I came back two hours later after they were ready to greet me. And she had already come down from the church to greet me. So uh, here she is coming into the house. This is my current wife. And uh, she and I sat together and discussed the events of when we were both uh, younger and in the community. Uh, 
this is Gadele and his family. He was my closest informant, a person who was extremely creative. Uh, Belinish, who was the sister of my main assistant. And here is my current family and my daughter who was conceived in Makale. Uh, she always feels she's somehow there, though she has been there only when she was in the womb. And here is uh, the icon maker who was a tremendous artist of the time. I thought did beautiful, beautiful work. And here he has me uh, in this corner, my ex-wife in that corner. And uh, I will drop this out now and go back to uh, the main of slides if I can figure out how to do that. I think, will that let me get out? Stop share, will that do it? Yes. I don't know whether I'm visible or not. You, you are, we can see you. Okay, anyway, uh, I, I think the reason I missed Ashenda when I was there was that I got very sick for a while and was in Addis in the hospital for several months. But I certainly witnessed people taking strong positions, uh, women taking strong positions, though they were not judged intermingled in terms of uh, kibri. There was a list of men and you would sit around the table. There would be on one side, the most important man, most important woman and going down. So you couldn't measure whether a woman and a man were above each other. You could measure how women were against women, how men were against men. The only time that seemed to pause was when a powerful woman would take the stage. And that was what uh, Mitzlal would do. It also, sometimes women would speak in the village meeting after church in the morning. Uh, certainly women who were not at that time married would always speak in that meeting. But on rare occasion, another woman would. Typically, a woman had some things to say, she would have her husband say it. He would represent the household and she would not because it would kind of be embarrassing to him. Uh, but the idea that women had equal legal rights was certainly part of the land tenure system when I was there. If a woman uh, died, the land that she had brought to the household went to her children, not her current husband's children, unless they were the one that was by the two of them, that uh, her kids by her previous husband would inherit part of what she had, even though she and her husband were using it. So women had a kind of rights to land uh, that were much stronger than they are in many other countries and were at that time. Uh, but in terms of public presentation, women tended to present a little bit less than men in large gatherings. Though there were some gatherings, only one that I remember when I was present that involved performance primarily by women, but this was something which was sort of outside the Christian sphere. It had more to do with Tsar uh, involvement and people thinking that they were protecting themselves from being uh, overcome by Tsar spirits. Anyway, that's what I'll throw in here. If anybody has any questions later on after people have made their speeches, I'll be more than happy to you know, tell them what life was like 53 years ago, 54 years ago in uh, Makale and the region around it. Professor Dan, that's an incredible presentation. I, I, I was mesmerized that I want you to know that your daughter is a Tagalog too. So just make sure that you tell her uh and 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 we would accept her she can come to Magalandu Ashenda amongst the, the, the girls uh at any time uh, once once the guy is free obviously but amazing amazing um uh, album that you have of pictures that trace back 50 years ago so uh thank you for your presentation and and also shedding light on you know, women did have rights that were way more progressive than other other countries around the world. And that's important for everybody to know. Um, I think uh, there's a stigma that, that you know, uh, the, the, the Tigrayan heritage or culture is, is 
holding women back or not allowing women to have a progressive and, and land ownership and other things, other rights, human rights that they should have. But it was far far more progressive than any other cultures, any other, even okay. including Western Western nations. And so the, the fact that you point that out, that's important. And uh, we, we really thank you for, for making that oh, presentation. I could throw in one more point on that yeah. topic. And that is that uh, if a man uh, was widowed or divorced and needed a wife, he would bring in another woman if she wanted to join his household and pay her kind of an amount every day or every month until she owned a share of the household. And then she would, they would get married and she would own half of it. Mm -hmm. So that was what a, a man would do. But if a woman was farming and had no husband and didn't want to do male labor because male and female labor had a yeah. distinction within in farming uh, she would hire a man but he would not be her husband uh, he would not inherit anything he would just get paid as a worker on her farm uh, and for men it was the other way around she became a wife so it was a distinction that i find kind of interesting i don't know what we can make out of it except that uh, women felt they had a certain authority uh, to deny man partnership in their particular household. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll mute it, myself at this point. It, it goes to show uh, how independent women truly are in, in, in our uh, patriarchal society. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And I think this this actually requires a little bit more study and understanding that to see how how independent women were and are and continue to be through Ashenda. Ashenda being one of the main ways of expressing that. And, and uh, thank you for your presentation. Absolutely loved it. And, and I'm thrilled to see if you can do more studies and, and, and present more things in the future. But uh, we really do appreciate your presence here with us today. Um, so moving forward, um, we're going to go to our session, the first, our first session uh, for the day uh, to be the moderator for that first presentation. I would like to introduce uh, my sister, uh, Samhal Harbu, to, to the stage. If you, if you can come, uh, I think you got all the content you need, uh, but take it away. It's all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. Hi, everybody. I'm Samhal. I'm super excited for today. We have some amazing speakers. We've already had amazing keynote speakers for the event. So yeah, I will go ahead and just start with our first presenter's um, bio. So our first presenter is Dr. Hagos Abraha Abai. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Dr. Hagos has been teaching linguistics and related courses at Mala University for more than 10 years. After getting his PhD in Ge'ez Philology from Addis Ababa University, he founded the St. Yared Center for Ethiopian Philology and Manuscript Studies at Ma'alan University in 2015. And he was the director of the center in the university until 2019. In 2017, Dr. Hagos had been appointed as Deputy Executive Chief Officer of the Ethiopian Tourism Organization by the Ethiopian Prime Minister, and he went back to Ma'ala University after self-resignation for academic interest, six months after the appointment. After that, he resumed his academic and research activities and coordinated dig digitization projects of manuscript heritage in some of the Tigray monasteries. He is also the founder and principal organizer of a cultural initiative called Mahale Gumaye, named after one of his poetry books. He is now a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Hamburg in Germany, in Cluster of Excellence since October 2019, working on his project in non-codex manuscripts of Tigray, archiving and usage. Dr. Hagos has been extremely committed to documenting Tigray's cultural heritage damage since the war in Tigray started. Thank you so much, Dr. Hagos, for being here. It's an honor. And um, Dr. Hagos will be presenting research um, on Ashenda time space. So Dr. Hagos, feel free to take it away. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate our uh, previous presenters, and I, I, 
uh, would like to wish a comfort for all of us uh, to grants and international community about the air strike in Magala and Mahoni uh, in the few days ago. So today I'm going to present, uh, of course, I don't have a slide um, as I have been informed in very recent time. So I will try to finish uh, on time. Uh, so when I say agenda time space, it's simply to mean the agenda setting or it's uh, from the physical scope of agenda up to the eventual setting and its discourses. Uh, so when we think of or speak of agenda, what comes to our mind is <clears throat> three things, Tigray, ladies and organization. Uh, so since long time, there were lots of ladies organizations in Tigray, uh, especially concerned about their freedom, peace and justice. Like we had, uh, for example, Devarte, which is a uh, women affair um, in some part of Northeastern Tigray, uh, who are like, which is a group of women asking or aspiring for women justice. And then anything that has happened on women would be judged based on this group. And we had also other like uh, night club or evening clubs uh, movements, especially around Enderta, like I go. Uh, so Ashenda is also one of these uh, bold and climax point of uh, women organization. So having different names across uh, Tigray villages, what we are thinking now is it's an attribution of women freedom or women organization uh, congr congregation of themselves against their own peace, love, togetherness, and, and freedom. So geographically, uh, Ashenda covers all over Tigray in every village. It also extends to some part of Eritrea and then some part of Lashta Ago, especially Aghumra and Sawata, and then in Kobo, which is today uh, part of uh, Olo. So and then it has different uh, names uh, across this small village of Tigray which is diverse and that makes it more colorful and beautiful. Uh, for example, it's called Solel in, in, in Kobo. It is uh, Shade or Ashendi in Waghamra. It is called Ashenda in Raya, Wajarat, Nderta, and Tembien, which is also called Awesie in those areas, which is the second name for Ashenda. And then it's called Maria in Eastern Tigray. And then even in Western, in East, Central Tigray, including Aksu. And then in Western and Northwestern Tigray, it's also called uh, Maria. Uh, I'll come back to uh, Ainuari. And uh, it is inconsistent uh, uh, regarding the dates and, and, uh, and the performance and also in naming is whatever, all do have the same thing. That's our most important uh, point. Uh, for example, in uh, Western Tigray and Northwestern Tigray, Ashenda Girls or um, the ladies organization is, uh, it, it happens during the first uh, September calendar. I mean, at the new year, they don't have a congregation or they don't do it during 16th uh, August. It is Maria, but the Maria is just simply a holy day, which is connected with the Assumption of St. Mary, which has its own biblical and deuterocanonical exegesis. And uh, the same is true in other parts of Tigray. And uh, when, when we come to Ainuari, it is something special than what we think is. Uh, it is celebrated in 24th of August, just one day. And then it's more special uh, than, because there is also Maria and Aksum and 16th of August, but it's more connected to like um, the concept of Awali de Tzion, and it's connected with Ainwari is the name of a bird, by the way, a beautiful bird with the um, bold and yellowish eye. And it's also called Warda in some parts of Tigray, especially in the Southern Tigray, which has lots of oral tradition about this bird. And also Warda Hoye is also, there is a kind of boys play in Ago, so this bird is popular and its name is popular and it's something distinct than Ashenda, but uh, all 
this ingredients have been converged into uh, the same name agenda mainly after the the millennium uh, because of the millennium development goals in by the Ethiopian government that concerning about culture heritage and tourism uh, and then female began uh, to be invited to celebrate agenda in squares of big cities like in Noela. otherwise agenda was like uh, uh, celebrated uh, in baskets of small group of ladies in a scattered way of every village of the Um And most of the time when I present about agenda, the most common question I have been asked is, is it cultural or religious uh, uh, festival? Yeah, in case of like um, culture and religion, mainly in our case in Ethiopia or in East Africa, like religion is cultural identity. It's not like, you know, it's not an exclusive. There is no clear demarcation between secularism and religion. I mean, we had no had a clear and um, uh, successful uh, social, industrial and secular revolution. And because of this uh, religion, culture, and, and most of other things are intermingled with each other. They are jam packed. So it's very difficult to say, this is religion and that's culture. And of course, it's when we say religion, it's more in, institutionalized, uh, but, but still within our religion, with this Judeo-Christian religion, uh, Orthodox Judeo-Christian religion, we do have also cultural ingredients and some other, even some pagan elements and other elements. So everything is within there and religion is also identity. So I would answer it is culture and, and, and religion. Uh, but one thing that I can contemplate about Ashenda uh, is all about the seasonal and cyclic event. The space of Ashenda is more connected with ecology that during the summer season, at the middle of the summer, there is like uh, springing of flowers and, and plants, uh, all the fauna and the flora, uh, like like uh, domestic and uh, uh, wild animals jump and then just they, they rejoice and so on, if, like even dogs and so on. Also people, uh, uh, whether women and, and men, uh, so all social uh, organizations do have their own rejoicing organizations. For example, we do have this test in and a concept in deacons and priests. We do have this Ayyan uh, Allah, Hoya Hoye, Talile, and many, many other of boys. So gender gender exclusive. Uh, the same is true for Ashenda, but Ashenda is more bold and it's so clear. And it's one of the big space that has substantiated Tigrinya literature, Tigrinya poetry, or oral poetry, uh, and so on. So it is, Ashenda is a folklore, a Tigray traditional folklore, folklore that has uh, consisted all elements of folklore, oral tradition, social performing folk artists, material culture, and folk tradition. These four elements of folklore are embedded within the uh, agenda. And then it's dynamic, like what Professor uh, Fatin said, like many other cultures or tradition, it's dynamic. It has its own time spirit. Uh, so in ancient time, I, I believe that it was just folk tradition, and then it could have had a connotation with uh, religion, with the ascension of St. Mary. That's why this Felsetta concept and the fasting of the disciples of Jesus for this 16 uh, or 15 days, according to the Andem uh, Tauda Samariam or the hermeneutics of uh, praise of Mary. Uh, so, and then it become a modern festival across big squares of cities today. And then it's now becoming more internationalized among diasporas and so on. Uh, so we are just branding and standardizing uh, agenda in a way that uh, we can bold women freedom and then, and beyond. Uh, so agenda space is, uh, non restricted space. Ashenda ladies can move, can dance, can go wherever they want. 
within Tigray. Like they can go to the streets, squares, churches, mosques, and, and they can knock uh, doors. So it's all open. So it's not limited, but it's also inclusive space. What do I mean is uh, all social, like the priests or like boys, women, and so on, are part of agenda. But the ladies at the center of the stage, at the center of the space, we are all audiences, or like boys are escorts of the women or the ladies in agenda. What makes it something special is that the women are at the center, at the pinnacle point of uh, the, the stage. They created their own stage, uh, stage. they administer their own everything they create their own music and art <clears throat> so so it's they were not encouraged to create something they were not there wasn't any affirmative action for ladies to have agenda stage agenda space agenda setting but the space is spontaneously created by themselves and then they are leaders of the stage while the other uh, social organizations are audiences of their stage. And uh, beyond that, Ashenda is uh, <clears throat> a training place for music and art. So every lady or Ashenda lady uh, does have the capacity or the exposure to sing, to beat the drum, and to spontaneously produce a poem, a Grinya poem, oral poetry. So it is an open air school for uh, social performing folk arts and uh, modern music and art. I mean, you can imagine how many ladies uh, would uh, be artists, models, and designers uh, because of their exposure and agenda. Uh, so it has its own contribution for development uh, too. Uh, and it's also a stage of spontaneous production of uh, poems, like uh, Professor Katyn said previously just they immediately create verses, either to praise or condemn or curse or insult whatever, which is social critic. They, they spontaneously produce uh, poetry. So Ashenda space is also a place where, uh, you know, in the church, in the Mahalit church, the, the deacons and priests spontaneously produce any good any. The same is true for Ashenda ladies that they produce poetry or oral poems in the streets, fields, and so on. So it's it's wonderful time space. And it is also, I'm rushing because of time, hope and good wish. Uh, there is a big concept about vows, like wishing that everybody would stay alive and healthy by the next year, by the following year, and then they do have vows. It's not only just a wish of living healthy and alive, but it's also the eagerness to join this space, the Ashenda space. They are so nostalgic, by the way, Ashenda ladies. Uh, we, we, I mean, I have or I have seen what uh, the emotion of Professor Fatin uh, to I'm mean, to retrospectively about her uh, her childhood life. Uh, so Ashenda ladies are so obsessed about their Ashenda life uh, because it's something different. Uh, and so this vow, this wish and hope is just wishing peace, uh, life, health, and so on. And then at the same time, wishing to join this uh, space. And then at last, uh, Ashenda is uh, an event of salivation. Um, Ashenda, as a term, is vindicted as a metonymy of freedom and peace. And it is a personified female. Ashenda is someone, a personified female. Ashenda is just a female spirit. Uh, we can come to some of the, the poems. So in the name of Ashenda, in the name of Embe, in the name of Awesiye, in the name of Ainwari, she, I mean Ashenda, is uh, something or metaphorically a lady or like a personified female. 
for whom uh, the Ashenda leaders are speaking apostrophically. So Ashenda is, uh, it is also like, we can say it, uh, it is a symbolic, symbolic reincarnation of time spread for the latest cyclic redemption. It is a cyclic redemption. Every year it's seasonal, once in a year, once in a blue moon, they are redeemed. It's cyclic. By what? By the personified, symbolic, reincarnated time spirit, which is called Ashenda. She is a female. We can see some of the poems. Aita Sankilin Rigaha, Ms. Ashenda Iye Lilleha. I mean, I don't know how to translate. We all understand how translation is bad, uh, that every texture and every uh, flavor of the language is always lost in translation. Uh, so, but at least uh, it means, Rugeha is the name of a grass uh, that grows only during the summer season. And uh, so they are saying, don't hinder me walking. So let me dance with my beloved Ashenda. The Ashenda ladies say, let me dance with my beloved Ashenda. So you, Rugeha, you, the grass, I mean, don't hinder me. Uh, yeah, I mean, in uh, sort of structurally, we can understand that uh, the event, how something can hinder them uh, and so on. But deep structurally, they are criticizing someone or the society who can hinder them exercising their own freedom. So it's so symbolic, it's metaphorical expression. So that regha to me is not a regha, it's a symbol or a metaphor of, or it's an allegory of the society. So let me dance, let me have my own freedom. Don't hinder me. Let me not miss my own beloved Ashenda. Uh, so they need to be, so Ashenda is a representation of personified, like a mother of peace or a goddess of uh, salivation. So that's why they always metaphorically speak with the this Ashenda female. Uh, I don't know how, when, when they say Ashenda, I do have some imagination about this female called Ashenda. Uh, so for example, they say, Inkidri, Na'nai Bahri, Warkana Arri, like uh, uh, have this trade, you know, the, some of the uh, material that ties the jewelries. So they are speaking with the Shenda. Let me give you this thread and then let's go together to the Bahri, to the sea. Of course, Bahri does not only mean sea in ancient Semitic and other languages. Bahri means wide lowland. Uh, so like, let's go together. Like, you know, the Shenda leaders, I think need just to snatch or to take this ash this Ashenda, which is goddess of peace, to somewhere where someone cannot deny it or deny denied her or take her away, just to exercise their own peace in a secure world. Uh, so let's go somewhere to the Bahri. It can be sea or it can be somewhere, but distant from the, the patriarchal society, I believe. Uh, so, and uh, some of the poems about this freedom. Awali de ye la me eveda la alai samaido allo meida. Means, my ladies, let's play or let's be crazy uh, today uh, because there is no. A Plain or playing field in the heaven or in the sky or somewhere. What does this mean? Do they mean that the sky or the heaven is vacuum? Or what do they mean? Or does it mean that? But at least it means this is the only setting. This is the only time space that we can maximize our freedom. Because Ashenda ladies do not have as equal freedom as the Ashenda event in the whole year, to be honest. So they need to exercise and maximize their freedom and peace at that time. So the poem says, let's relax, let's rejoice, let's play today, tomorrow, or 
which is it, it's uncertain, but there is no, like they do have a doubt. It's, it is with question mark. So either a playing field in the heavens, in the sky. So we are not certain about it. Of course, in the, in the deep structure, the, there is an answer. Like, I don't think there is. So it's saying, let's play, uh, let's, let's, let's relax with this, our agenda lady. I'm a spirit lady, uh, symbolified, personified lady. Then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about to finish. Uh, which means also flower, is another name of Ashenda as a personified female. So they are appealing to a priest to give some justice because Ashenda is going away. She is going away. This kind of song is um, uh, played or sung at the end of Ashenda event. So they are, it's longing, even the melody is so uh, weak and so missing and so longing, like it's like, uh, so, even the melodies are so different by the way, the tones and the metres and uh, every uh, poem and sound has its own discourse, which has to be well stated by the relative uh, professions, professionals. Uh, so it's longing, missing, like, uh, you know, Ashenda ladies, when they depart, they, they just, they lament, they cry. And uh, so, so because they, they know that they would not uh, find this kind of ultimate freedom uh, once the event is gone. Uh, so, my beloved Ashenda is going away. She is crossing a river. So Ashenda, the personified Ashenda does have home. She has to cross a river or rivers to go away her home. Maybe to stay inside a cave with the key of peace for the whole year until the next Ashenda comes. That's what, what reminds me. Uh, so, so still they are appealing. Ashenda uh, my beloved Ashenda is going away. So the, it's a symbol of peace. At Ainwari, Fiora Ainati, Bulu Ilahida, Maikate Amati. It shows how much uh, the Ainwari event is too short. I mean, it's also one day, as I said. Uh, so it shows. So this does show like how uh, Ashenda doesn't have a marginal utility. It's just, I mean, it's like a free fall before rising. Uh, like uh, they, 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 I mean, they don't um, exercise and maximize and then have marginal utility of uh, this, uh, this peace and freedom. So because the event is too short for them, uh, so, that's what they are longing. Um, but in the next year, when they meet Ashenda, Ashenda na amen ame tegani na lomye. Just Ashenda of the last year we met now and so on. And the melody is something strong that has confidence, that has happiness, uh, not like missing melody, not mourning melody, and so on. Uh, so Ashenda to me is like it's um, it's a personified goddess of freedom. It's an event of uh, salivation. And upon that, at last, Ashenda is an event of purgation or it's an event of catharsis. Uh, last year, you know, the guy has been in, in, in serious human catastrophe more than for, for at least two years, and then all the grants and um, concerned international communities are in a serious concern and, and traumatized feeling and emotion. But like we try to celebrate Ashenda or many Tigrayans, you may observe many Tigrayans dancing, singing in uh, many places around Europe or US and so on. Someone may wonder why these people, are they crazy? Or like why, why they are dancing and playing why, why the people of Tigray are under a total siege and blockade. 
But I believe that this singing and dancing was one of the most important means of our survival, by the way, because it was a means of releasing negative energy. Uh, like it is a means of catharsis and purgation. But when it comes to Ashenda, it's the climax point of it. So uh, last year we tried to, Ashenda ladies were trying to celebrate here and there, even uh, in the field. And this week or this year, Ashenda ladies were also, they started to celebrate Ashenda and they, they tried to exercise uh, uh, not the freedom, but the purgation, like the catharsis. Uh, but once the airstrike happened in Magalem and Mohoni, um, it was so frustrating. And then it was like denying and snatching that kind of setting or time space of exercising this purgation. Um, so it was it was so. Uh, shocking and it was uh, we didn't expect it it would come again uh, as horrible as this uh, but still we are celebrating agenda today and tomorrow uh, around the world and because agenda is also a time space or setting of buoyancy and resilience and then we will stay resilient uh, so we will keep uh, uh, celebrating agenda whatever uh, happens in the grave, because it's a means of uh, branding our resilience, peace, freedom. And then I hope one day Ashenda could be, uh, today the international community is so reluctant about the freedom of women in the grave, while many, many thousands of female Tigrayans or women Tigrayans were sexually abused the, inter the international uh, community, the human rights whatsoever are so uh, reluctant and they are not so interested to make things accountable. Um, but one day I believe Ashenda itself will be in a big global platform in the table of justice of women. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Hagos. That was amazing information. Um, I really appreciate everything that you highlighted, especially that women created their own stage through Ashenda. They weren't really encouraged. There was no affirmative action, like you said. And also one of the most important points that you made is that Ashenda, the space is non-restricted. And I think it's important to remember that that's not just physically where you know the Ashenda ladies can go around to different areas of um, the place, but also conceptually, that aspect is sort of like a, it's symbolic of the freedom that Ashenda girls and women get. And also, um, I think for me personally, sharing a holiday like Ashenda with my mom, with my grandmothers, with my aunts and female role models, it's sort of the perfect practice of sharing love for womanhood through these generations of trauma, um, generations of war that Ashenda has survived through um, from the past and also this kind of thing that sort of gradually metamorphosizes into generations of healing and strength and resilience as you highlighted. So thank you so much, Dr. Hagos, that was incredible. Um, we will have questions for the panelists at the end, I believe. So for now, we'll just move on to the next speaker that we have. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce him, Dr. Wilbert Smith. So I'll go ahead and read his bio. So Dr. Wilbur is an ethno historian and adjunct professor at Ma'ala University. He's a senior researcher in ethno history, and he's also an adjunct member of the Department of Anthropology at Ma'ala University. Additionally, Dr. Wilbur is part of the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at the Frederick Schiller University, Jena in Germany. His PhD programs were in anthropology and the history of cultural studies, and he is part of the ICES 20 organizing committee in Ma'ala. Dr. Wolper has several academic memberships as well as publications and scholarly articles on various past and current topics. Um, also, Dr. Wolper has launched a scholarship which will contribute to funding research assistance with um, in-depth not with in-depth local cultural knowledge for Dr. Wolper's ethno-historical research within the framework of the Yehab Research Project. 
This will also help ensure the continuation of a long running German Ethiopian research project on the cultural heritage of the ancient cultural region of Tigray. So um, with us, Dr. Wilbert will be presenting um, Ashenda Modernization in Light of Values of a More Traditional Culture. Dr. Wilbert, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, while it is a sad time uh, now, um, two years have been have passed, uh, marked by a lot of hope and 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 uh, desperation. So, and so I was asking myself, to which degree uh, can we do um, uh, in-depth talks of culture, cultural heritage? Um, and yes, I think Dr. Hagos said it in a very nice way. Uh, Ashenda is a time in which freedom is celebrated, uh, in which resilience uh, is made possible. And so, yes, I, I agree. It is exactly by talking about ancient heritage, cultural heritage, and what is done today out of it, that um, we have to respond to times of crisis. So I have passed much of my life in Ethiopia, much of it in Tigray. Uh, I've done research in different regions, and um, I must say I'm deeply indebted to the people of, of Tigray, and I consider uh, Mekele my home, uh, while I'm, of course, also in, in Germany, in northern Germany, uh, while, strangely, during the war, I felt like a visitor of Germany and still as someone living in Mekele. Uh, this is not something you can switch off and on, and I think, especially in times of crisis, this is what happens. Uh, Anyway, short introduction, uh, just personal words. Um, so I was thinking how to discuss Ashenda. And I must say, uh, there's something very interesting which had been mentioned in the, in the film. It is the idea that Ashenda is reaching back uh, not only hundreds of years or tens of generations, but 3000 years plus. I sort of agree uh, that Ashenda is certainly um, um, delivering a framework of celebration of uh, uh, yearly celebrations, uh, which results out of an ancient heritage of women's freedom and restriction. Uh, you celebrate freedom, especially in a framework of restriction, in a framework of need of to respond to, re to restrictions, to respond to trouble, to respond also to times of crisis. So it is exactly uh, the response to times of crisis which make such a celebration of freedom, of happiness, of chaotic happiness, we can say, uh, necessary for resilience. Um, to come to my uh, slides, I would like to make you, uh, to, you to make me um, co-host. Then I can show you slides. Yes, I believe you are able to share your screen. Okay, I can do it. Okay, yes. let me let me try. Uh, just a moment. Okay. I try again. Yes, there there it is. So I think you see it. Yes, we can see it. Excellent. Very, very good. Uh, yeah, so uh, there is only one aspect which I wanted to discuss. There are so many aspects. The film showed it. The nice keynote speech by uh, Professor Fetain uh, showed it. Um, Dr. Hagos has discussed uh, some very important elements, which I found extremely instructive. Uh, I would focus only on one thing, the contrast between what I uh, tried to to uh, understand about the celebrations of Ashenda uh, in relation to space and interaction in space and how this kind of relationship to space is changing through our, uh, through, throughout the, the last, let's say, 15 years of modernization, also of modernization of this festival. Um, <clears throat> that's why I wanted to, uh, I want to discuss this, um, this festival uh, just in the light of values of traditional culture, which I try to define through some observations of this festival. 
It's absolutely not exhaustive. It's absolutely not complete. So I would suggest that what we see in modernization is one, on the one hand, the discovery of this in, uh, very rich heritage, <coughs> cultural heritage, which is marking Tigray, which is making Tigray, which is making the Tigrayan society, or we can say more generally, the Highlander society. Um, so this is a discovery of a uh, cultural heritage, of a dy dynamic cultural heritage on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also a radical change going on. By this discovery, there's also um, uh, uh, some initiatives of modernization um, which try to take hold uh, of Ashenda. Um, now, I will not uh, go too much into detail, but uh, I, I, I mention Shall, I shall mention that Tigray modernity, in my observation, is very often expressed very much through the involvement of offices, uh, of leaders, um, and of course, uh, of uh, big microphones, um, big sound, and stages. And of course, a public mobilization in front of TV um, in, and interviews in the radio and so on. So there is a sort of a uh, creation of a new public space, uh, which is in contrast uh, with the traditional use of public space. Um, and I will, I will look at that. Um, I would suggest, let me uh, put my suggestion at, at the beginning, uh, that in tradition, there's a sort of performative use of spa uh, space, dancing styles, changing from group to group, um, uh, according to regions, of course, um, clothing styles, um, which are slightly different from group to group, evidently. Um, but what is most important, it is a non-central or non-centralistic event, pluricentric, uh, in contrast to a modern tendency of centralization uh, of discourses on culture, centralization if, even of organization of feasts. So when what we see in this official and modernized uh, way of celebration is a stage in the center, I will come back to it very soon, uh, of Mekale, uh, a stage with loudspeakers, uh, with official speakers, with um, uh, selected persons to appear. But in contrast, the hidden aspects of festivals in general always continue. So we do have the movement of groups of young women and women in general and girls through the town while there's a stage, which is a typical element of uh, modernization. So we have an interesting contrast between a centralized stage, which represents modernity, which is nothing bad by itself. I just try to describe the, the contrast and something hidden. Um, I think much of the liberty, the freedom, um, the also the chaotic freedom, which is partially freeing itself even from rules of the society, which has been mentioned in a, in a polite way in previous presentations. Uh, this is part of this hidden uh, tradition, and I call it tradition. There is no tradition which just obeys to society, uh, especially in the tradition of festivals. Uh, be it of men, be it of mixed groups, being, be it of youngsters, being of, be it of uh, young girls. Festivals of young girls, of women, or any kind of festival always has this discourse level uh, where joy and happiness is celebrated um, in front of the public, in the public, using the public space. But on the other hand, um, Ashenda has also this hidden aspect of celebrating chaos, fluidity, uh, creativity, uh, creativity, creativity in songs, creativity in dancing, and creativity of provocation. Uh, that's the interesting thing here, and I want to focus shortly on that. Um, this is, I believe, when I compare to earlier uh, Ashenda feasts, which I witnessed, this is always what, what stays in any version of Ashenda. This is what stays very early in the morning, especially young women and women of any age um, come to the streets um, in, in absolutely uh, uh, stunning clothing, 
um, in, hap in, in, an, in, a, in, great hap uh, in great expression of happiness um, and singing and moving and taking the space of streets, taking the space of courtyards, taking the space of public spaces, uh, public squ uh, squares, invading shops, stopping any activity of so-called serious representatives of the society. So people um, are forced to submit to the freedom of this festival, um, which is an interesting action. It also shows that no society, and I think this is one of the messages, no society has the right to control the movement of everyone in the same way every day of the year. In the country, the same society which controls people, and in this case, heavily controls the behavior of women, as we know in Tigray, um, the same society provides solutions in the sense of freedom, both the freedom of dancing, of expressing happiness, of moving th through space in, in a spontaneous way, but also in the way of expressing emotions and witnessing emotions, including the provocations of love, the provocations of boys who may be felt to be ugly or to be attractive. Uh, this kind of provocation is creating an, a fluid and hidden part of uh, what life is, uh, uh, creating a space for it, a social space, a cultural space for it. Um, and in this sense, is defying some of the demands of society uh, to establish control. So we have a dynamic conversion of space. This is what I want to, to say. Space is not always the same. In times of agenda, space is moving into, is changing into something um, open, fluid, uh, marked by a liberty, which women are usually not allowed to take. But these women, the same women who will, uh, go back into their social ro roles only a few days later, will always remember this liberty and will insist on the liberty as a crucial part of their life. And I believe Ashenda is also uh, not only a celebration of liberty of a few days, but it is also creating uh, self-consciousness of women through the celebration of this liberty, through the provocation of others, through the provocation even against established rules. Um, as this establishes um, a self-consciousness of women, which carries them throughout the year and show them their own power. This is what I uh, would like to suggest here. Um, I, <clears throat> uh, I have observed, I, I've been following some of these uh, groups um, and I have uh, tried to, to observe a number of different aspects. Another aspect is this display. I described the moving, the partially chaotic moving through space, the appropriation of space. The other uh, aspect is beauty. Of course, uh, posing is very important in Ashenda, taking photos, uh, showing, displaying your beauty, uh, also in an innocent way. Um, I don't want to be said, uh, to be understood in, in, in a way that this is uh, uh, totally um, um, uncontrolled way of uh, displaying liberty in the in the country by the celebration, uh, uh, liberty gets uh, a new expression and a definition of its borders and of its chances. Um, so, what we can say, uh, while Ashenda is converting public space uh, during these three days into girls' territory, girls and young women invading virtually everything. Uh, it also means that the space will belong to the women uh, symbolically. Uh, and this also means to some degree factually throughout the entire year. The women know at some point we can dominate the space. We will do it again and again. So the space is also others. And men are reminded that they're only half of the population, uh, which is very important. So the freedom on the one hand is linked also with discipline. Through the ritual, uh, the celebrated freedom, the chaotic part of freedom is also set um, under discipline, the discipline of dancing, the discipline of uh, girls helping each other and animating each other. Uh, this is also expressed through the, um, through the uh, uh, music instruments. Um, but 
uh, then also, and that's the next point, not only through the movement of bodies, the movement of space, but also the talking. Wherever uh, women are in that time, this can also happen in any time during the year, evidently, but especially in that time, the boys cannot talk. They may talk, they may try, the women take over. The women uh, dominate the world. So um, what about the boys? Do they enjoy? Do they enjoy being provo uh, provoked, being rejected, losing their space? Uh, here you see my closest friends, uh, of course they enjoy. This is not only a girls' festival, it's also a boys' festival. It's a time of easy interaction, but a bo boys' festival in one very positive sense. Uh, I suggest that boys, a young man, only become uh, uh, responsible mm, future fathers, responsible members of society, if they know, if they experience the power of women. Without that, no man can have any role to play within the society. So on the one hand, the easy part of it, easy interaction. Girls are provoking boys. Of course, boys are also provoking girls. But don't forget that the girls are more powerful. But this aspect leads to a great enjoyment um, of the boys who also discover that their power is restricted. They have to flirt. They may be rejected. The women dominate. The dom women decide. So this is an aspect of the boys festival. You see the boys moving towards the public space dominated by women uh, shouting and singing hoya hoye, hoya hoye. And this also expresses the happiness, as you see, also of the young man. Um, now, the modernity, I already said a number of things. It is very much about the construction of images. This is now not anymore about the freedom of space, while this plays a crucial role. But here you see a drone, for example, uh, moving above uh, Ashenda Festival. And this is uh, shown in TV. And I would say there is one element. It's just one element. But this element has to be looked at, uh, which may lead or is leading to a radical reinterpretation of the girl space. The girl space becomes a stage. So um, here we have a stage uh, which is uh, established in the center of Mekele uh, with sitting people, with honorary guests, uh, with invited guests, invited speakers, and hundreds, thousands, in fact, thousands of uh, young girls and some boys gathering there and enjoying. So the enjoyment is suddenly creating, um, is suddenly part of another kind of setting. Instead of having the girls dominating the space, you have the girls filling the space and the stage dominating the space, including the space of sound. Um, that's certainly a reinterpretation of what Ashenda means. Ash uh, from my point of view, Ashenda is especially this dynamic element, uh, which is the country of establishing a non-dynamic, a stationary stage. Uh, on the other hand, the public approval is enormous. Uh, while there is this conversion going on, and this is what I said in the beginning, I want to underline it. It, at this stage, uh, it creates only a contrast. There's a stationary element now, which is a modern one, but the dynamic element of dominating of space, creating social, cultural, um, and other freedoms um, continue. Even they are strengthened by this public recognition. So um, there is this contrast. And I see for the moment the development not going into this uh, non-dynamic dynamic element, but this element of stage leads also to the public approval of this kind of modernization because it strengthens the traditional element, um, which is precisely the dynamic space. Uh, a short uh, description, a short comparison with Ashenda in 2005, um, as I witnessed in that time in 2004. Um, you see these differences in clothing. Um, in older times, you had a total dominance of the natural element, the leaves, um, the leaves which were used to decorate uh, the young ladies, which I think expresses a very important other element uh, the expression of link between. Um, the girl's life, fertility, uh, the uh, tradition of uh, caring for the beauty of the house, the beauty of public space, um, and the functioning of that uh, pu public space. So I would suggest that 
um, the, this dynamic element has to be set into the center of any analysis of agenda, uh, which includes also the invasion of public, uh, of private space, which is always temporary and temporary invasion of private space always means expressing uh, the need to challenge borders and challenge, um, challenge restrictions in order to redefine them and obey to them in the rest of the year. I stop here, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilbert, for your incredible presentation. We are so appreciative of all the research that you have and all the um, time that you spend um, doing this. We did receive a couple of questions, but we will have time for them at the end. So I'm going to move on to our next speaker um, that will conclude this session. So Dr. Azab Gurmai, we're very excited to have you here. Dr. Azab completed her Honors Bachelor of Arts in 1996 at the East London University. Dr. Azab worked for years in the NGO sector as a senior development practitioner, particularly in the Nexus Development and Environment in Ethiopia. In 2013, she obtained her Master's of Science on Sustainable Development and Environmental Economics from uh, the University of London. She then joined LDC Watch International as a lead policy advocate for climate change in Africa until 2016. In 2017, joining the Graduate School of Asian and African Area Studies, Dr. Azeb completed research on culture, livelihoods, and well-being in southwestern Ethiopia and accomplished her Doctor of Area Studies in 2020. Dr. Azeb works for the ECDC, one of the nine resettlement agencies in the U.S., as a senior reception and placement program officer since 2021. Um, Dr. Azab will be presenting cultural resources as gateway to annihilation and panacea to resilience, the case in Tigray. Thank you so much, Dr. Azab. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This is just an amazing day to hear all about Ashenda, um, um, an amazing culture for girls. Um, my presentation. Uh, is probably going to take you to a different feeling for a little while before I uh, highlight Ashenda, uh, because um, I am trying to situate the effects of the war in Tigray as a cultural trauma. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to read my presentation. Um, so, um, so as I said, trying to situate the, the, the suffering in Tigray as a cultural trauma beyond what we often associate the impact of war to damages on tangible cultural heritage that is logically observable in, in the physical. But that is, uh, I would say, beyond what we see, uh, as it may even account to a society's annihilation, as it is indicated in my title, but also. Uh, I would like to say in the end, uh, our culture is a means for healing and redemption. And I will explain what I mean. Um, in the event of a destructive war or genocidal war directed towards a group or a society like what's happening in Tigray today, since the 4th of November, 2020, the impact is expected to amount to cultural trauma and that is beyond our tangible heritage. I'm not a psychologist, but I have started to read about the concept of trauma after taking a short training last year on trauma awareness. As I came across the concept of cultural trauma, I'm still working on it, but I was asked to make a presentation today. So I have organized my literature review to present today. Uh, so I will read, as I said, uh, through my presentation. So bear with me, uh, because I, I I was fascinated with a presentation from Dr. Hagos, which was so beautiful. Everyone actually today, who made the presentations, it's just amazing how we have not done this before. So many richness that we have in our hands, and only this war had pushed us to look into our culture, to the beautiful culture that we are talking today. And it took almost half a day already. So uh, culture, 
as we know, is defined in numerous ways. But for today's purpose, I will use a definition by Marcus and Katayama, 2010, uh, and Betancourt and Lopez, and they say culture is an, an untidy and expansive set of material and symbolic concepts that give form and direction to behavior. The shared beliefs, attitudes, norms, practices, institutions, and policies of a particular nation and people. According to researchers such as Evans Campbell, Kwan and Reddy, Stema, and all some other more, cultural trauma is defined as an overwhelming and often ongoing physical or psychological assault or stressor perpetuated by an oppressive dominant group on the culture of a group of people sharing a specific shared identity. Affiliation that can, um, identity or affiliation that can be race, ethnicity, nationality, or religion such parallel to what Tigray is going through today, I feel. And in a number of literature in the psychological studies have shown that three types of society's cultural resources may be damaged due to cultural trauma, triggering negative health outcomes that may become intergenerational. These cultural resources are first cultural modes, a group of researchers define cultural modes as a group's language, norms, customs, values, and artifacts. And these are essential for healthy functioning as they organize and pattern one's thoughts, feelings, and actions. This has devastating effects on individuals' self-esteem and anxiety. I associate this to the atrocities in the form of rape and abuse to our girls in Tigray, as it was done to devastate the values, dignities of our girls. When cultural trauma damages a group's cultural modes, studies shown that healthy functioning can be disrupted, as modes serve crucial psychological functions, including protecting against stress and anxiety, prom promoting self-regulation and facilitating effective adaptation response to external stressors. Um, it's cited by uh, many researchers like Marcos again and Katayama and Norris and Salzman in various years. The second resource is cultural institutions. This refers to the sociocultural systems and policies upholding these systems that establish social orders in a society and govern people's behaviors and expectations. These systems cover all areas of social and community life, including family, economic, legal, educational, religious, political, and health systems. Institutions protect against stress and support health. But when oppressive institutions downgrade individuals into lower status and generate stress and derail health. The third one is the cultural land, which is fascinating. Is the third trauma impacted resource and refers to the material resources. These are physical properties, housing, health, healthy foods, transportation and wealth necessary to sustain health in a given society. The researchers in trauma and also colonialism showed that when a cultural group's land gain a dominant group's interest, the dominant group may wield cultural trauma to dispose the cultural groups of its land. And this is exactly what's happening in Tigray as we see it, potentially draining survivors of their health while restricting future opportunities to restore their cultural lands and health and to pre um, and lands. Within the lecture, le the literature, this cultural trauma appears to occur both through physical dislocation from native lands via force, genocide, or disease, or discriminatory policies that strip groups of existing cultural lands while blocking access to future lands and other flexible resources. Again, as I said, exactly what's happening in Tigray. 
the siege, the displacement of their ancestral lands like Western Tigray, and all the systems that that they, they, they held as their system has been wiped off their hands. And all these creates the trauma, which we always never associated it with our cultures. This does not any example as what is happening in Tigray is a current happening and its effect does not call for any expert to, to view as well as um, give a testimony. All of us are witnesses what is happening in our lives through our families and friends in Tigray. Uh, still, to just highlight what literature shows, this traumatic displacement presents a massive stressor that impacts mental and physical health in the short term and long term. As such, trauma has also termed, uh, these kind of traumas are also termed as collective traumas, where psychological reactions to a traumatic event shared by a group of individuals that becomes ingrained in the group's collective memories. And historical traumas, conceptualized as a multi-generational trauma in inflicted on groups of people with a shared identity affiliations that encompasses their psychological and social responses to the traumatic events. Of course, I can go ahead and this creates the intergenerational transmission of cultural trauma, which passes to in years and years to uh, families and children because of the um, secondary trauma um, discussion with families or the children's look, you know, faced with, with such traumatic events. But what I want to highlight today is the other side of the cultural values, which um, a lot of researchers have said is that culture is our saving grace too. Our culture is said to enable us to break free from the traumatic experience experiences that we are faced as a society. Under a community resilience or resistance to violence, a study in 2011 entitled Opting Out, Opting Out of War, Wallace and Anderson highlighted communities living in the midst of mass violence who managed to continue living without failing into the violence because traumatic societies produce traumatic people who also become violent. It, this is a researched and scientifically proven um, concept. But those communities who have managed to come out of this violence or to clear up or to heal, one thing that they had in common is their culture. Those communities that had very strong culture, shared values, and celebrations have come out of this violence cycle. What best example than Ashenda in our case, as it also is associated with girls empowerment, dignity promoting, it is our source of healing. Some of the recommendations um, using our cultures to come out of violent traumas is restoring damaged cultural moods via cultural legacy interventions. It's exactly what we are doing now, building cultural identities, pride and knowledge, and facilitating cultural healing through racial socialization or community mobilization, capacity building intervention to restore groups' cultural resources, exactly what we are to doing today. And Tigrayan society, particularly in the diaspora, are not short of this. They have shown their strength in this. And probably knowing or unknowing, we have been forced to show our culture through agenda or other gatherings to, 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 with, to, to demonstrate our strength it's really our culture that's saving us to bring us together to, 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 to be strong in the time of uh, hardship. So as a result, last year, the GSTS cultural heritage team came up with a brief also translated in Tigrian, Tigrinya, encouraging girls all over the world to continue to celebrate Ashenda. 
this was with an understanding that these celebrations have the, 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 the strength and the, the value of bringing the girls from their um, uh, traumatized situations so that they can continue without any um, um, reservation to, um, to demonstrate what is the essence of Ashenda consistent with their tradition, strengthening their defiance and triumph against all the atrocities directed towards them with a lead myth, uh, thematic team that we uh, communicated to all girls in the, in the world, also in Tigray, with a team called Breaking Free and Building Resilience, Asserting Dignity and Power. This gathering is also a continuation from what was uh, started last year in collaboration with the Center for Advancement of Tigrayan Studies, because this time it is not just a festival, but a healing process from inside without any reservation, particularly for girls, for them to understand that this is the time for them. Because sometimes I see during um, these celebrations that are transmitted through videos, and some people express their um, reservation. How can we be dancing and singing in times of atrocity, particularly what happened yesterday um, uh, with the uh, main damage uh, that, 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 uh, that, was, um, uh, that led to, to, to killings of children in a school. But what we say is, this is a, a, a moment of healing also for the girls. It's, we don't see it as celebration of um, the ordinary time. This is the girls and women uh, have to be allowed because this is the only way they can come out from their uh, trauma that has been uh, directed towards them. This is what I have prepared today. I, I'm sorry if I've taken a, a long time reading my presentation, which is very dry compared to the presentations that had uh, before me. Uh, this is, as I said, under research, I am really working on this to understand more, but really to share what I have read and uh, connect with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Azeb. You are very humble. This was really incredible information. Um, I do think it's very important to highlight the trauma that occurs during such wars um, and how it doesn't only impact the people in the wars, but also their children, their children's children, and you'll see impacts after five, 10, and 10 years and decades and decades of um, effects that it's not only socioeconomically impacts them, but also biological effects too. Um, so I think it's very important that we highlight that and then sort of see how that can be counteracted with holidays like Ashenda and cultural practices that can be used for healing and resilience as was described in the previous presentations. So thank you so much, Dr. Azza. Thank you, Dr. Wolbert and Dr. Hagos for this incredible first session. We are very appreciative of you all. Um, I think if you all, if anybody has any questions, I think now is the time to drop them in the chat and our panelists can answer them. I know there is one question already for Professor, Professor Bauer. Um, so I'll go ahead and read that for now. Uh, it says, I know many, if not all visitors or expatriates are usually surprised on the way uh, to Grian's grant Kubri to their elderly. What are your observations? How do you compare this to the rest of the world? Do you think modernization, such as providing elderly care facilities will affect the existing Kubri? Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, am I heard at this point or not? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, I'd say that uh, elderliness was an important quality, but there were a number of values that were associated with whether you were higher or lower in terms of Kibri. So that if, how religious were you? Uh, how did you uh, work for your community as opposed to only for yourself? Uh, and so that I went carefully and took cards with people's names on them. And I'd say, okay, uh, is this person higher or lower than that person? Oh, I put them in between these two. Well, why would you do that? Well, you see, he's really loyal to our town. He's worked hard for it. 
than somebody else who I said, but you know, he has a name of Reza Debri, a title. Why isn't he near the top and he's near the bottom? Well, because he was so outrageously uh, uh, enamored with himself that he would ride his mule right through the center of town to his house instead of walking humbly. And then Rindapest killed off his cattle and we had our pasture again and things like that. So this guy had dropped from being very near the top because he was really wealthy to quite low because they saw uh, his things as not being pro the town and perhaps being um, attacked by God, who knows, but he had dropped quite considerably. So that there were, probably a dozen different components that contributed to how respected a person was to be. How, or priests tended to be put near the top, deacons lower, and things of that sort. Uh, but acts that affected the community itself, I think, were fairly important. Uh, and well, it, one interesting transition was during the time I was there, uh, the Chikashum Kenya uh, Dimsu uh, was relieved of that job by the person who had appointed him. So he was no longer powerful and representative of one layer of government higher, higher than himself. And I thought, uh, gee, that's really going to be tough on him. You know, he was somebody I knew and I knew his wife very well. Uh, uh, she, she's the one who was the nun in that last photograph. Uh, and he stayed in his house for three months and got into no public settings where people would have to see him higher or lower or, or have him go through the door and try and figure out what to do with his change in uh, respect. But after three months, when people saw him, they let him hit a fairly high level. Whereas if he just lost all that power, maybe they wouldn't have known what to do or put him very low. So he allowed himself to be digested, his change in power. So you have a lot of components to it and uh, your contributions to your town, your generosity was more important than your wealth, for example. If somebody had a lot of wealth, if they thought they might go up and people, yeah, but you know, he's kind of proud about it instead of being a generous person who would lend something or give something to somebody else uh, without doing it publicly, just sort of privately give that person a hand. So I think it's important in terms of giving community values a sort of pressure on people to be more good citizens by how much respect you give them. But age was not the only component. It was an important component. Uh, and people who were aged and acted well for their community tended to be pretty high. But there were some who were regarded as not so good, who went lower. Okay, thank you so much, Professor, for that answer. And we do have a question from uh, Talahun. Go ahead and ask. Thank you, Samhal. Uh, my name is Tala Hon. I'm uh, one of the organizers here. What a wonderful presentation, to be honest. I'm just so em emotional, happy. I don't know how to say it. It's just a mix of uh, all sorts. Uh, I have a question to uh, Dr. Azeb. Um, you know, about the trauma, one of my concerns is uh, not only you know, the current generation, the victims of rapes and so on, the bombing. Uh, the fact that it is intergenerational is even just scary. <laughs> this impact is going to roll uh, from one generation to another generation. And I see Dr. Azev, your uh, uh, office and yourself are uh, preparing uh, for all these events. So uh, how, can we, how can we help? as a center, as the grants and so on, we know what's coming. It just, uh, uh, if tomorrow happens to be the day of peace and we're expecting all this trauma, all these victims, how can we help? How, how do we prepare for this? I know you're preparing as an individual and your office uh, probably, but you know, with uh, our cats and we have probably many young generations like Sam Hall and Daniel and 
many around us. How, how can we prepare ourselves to help the people victims of this trauma tomorrow? What are the resources out there? Uh, is, you know, how can we collaborate? I, I, I believe Dr. Uh, Akrilu is going to take this seriously and probably uh, launch you know, a collaborative research with you and many. Just give us some highlights, even the resources online, we can go and read. So you know we can yeah, we can orient you. ourselves so how 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 we can help even you know in in small terms to be uh, to be uh, ready for that day. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Talon. Well, this is the first um, action, knowing about it because we 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 honestly when I read this I was shocked because what we think is. You know, it, it even says in the in the um, literature of trauma. Usually, what we see is what we what we can see in the physical. Because war, of course, it damages people, it kills people, injures people, but it's beyond that. The children that are witnessing what is happening in Tigray itself is something that will take us for years and years if we don't um, know what the impacts are for generations. So the first thing is to understand what trauma means. And there are tools and there are resources actually. There is one uh, institution where I took this short training last year. Uh, it's in Virginia, which has uh, over 30 years of um, uh, experience in trauma in Africa, all over the world. Uh, so, and why I like this kind of um, research or uh, intervention is not clinical. Of course, the clinical trauma understanding is good. It's, it's essential because we have to have that, but this is working with communities. And it, you, you have to use what you have within you. This is why I say Ashenda is a self-healing process. We have to look for such uh, resources in ourselves and we have many. But it, first of all, we have to understand what trauma can, can mean to our society. It's not an easy business. War is, doesn't stop when the war ends. It will have effects for years and years. It is going to wipe, up, wipe off society if we are not careful. So um, there are tools, there are uh, resources, but it's us being conscious and ready to absorb it to understand it, to use it ourselves. But the resources are in our hands. We only need some facilitators and some guide how to use them. So we are not all lost. We have already started. Ashenda is our witness. Thank you so much, Dr. Azeb. Um, Danny? Yeah, thank you. I, I didn't mean to jump in, but I, I am inclined to ask a question to uh, Dr. Schmidt. Uh, you know, I, I looked at the photos that you had and, and I was intrigued. I, I, I'm amazed by what you've captured. And I just want to know what's the emotional feeling that you get when you're in the streets of Ma'ala or any other cities in Tigray while you're seeing Ashinda being celebrated? What, what's the atmosphere like? What's the emotions that, that come out? Because a lot of times we see pictures and we see videos and 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 it's it, it it doesn't speak the same as what does that emotion feel like what does it feel like to be on the streets walking around and seeing the girls celebrating dancing and and all that and i, I think that's important for us to highlight and actually kind of know thank you uh yeah thank you thank you it's a complex question let me try to make it short uh you're so right. The emotion is in the center. It's not this this perfect videos which show the celebration. It is the emotion. It's the interaction. That's even uh, perfectly part of my own my own observations. We should put the emotions, including the chaotic emotions, in the center. And if you ask after me, of course, I have to be careful. I'm a man, so I'm not supposed to to speak too much about it. <laughs> uh, one um, and. Not only that, I'm going there with my best friends, who are again men, um, who are taking this space, even uh, while they're invaded by the girls, they inv also try to invade the girls' space. Uh, I mentioned to you this hoya hoye, hoya hoye, I was dancing with them and, and, and going into the girls' space. That was just very captivating. But what is the main emotion uh, which I would like to underline? Um, when 
the first agenda caught me by surprise. I think it was in 2004. I was uh, there for longer research um, on other topics. And then all the girls were in the streets and I got kidnapped. I didn't expect that. Uh, I had something urgent to do. I had to totally forget it. Um, they closed me in a shop, uh, not by a key evidently, but by invading the entire shop and asking for money, making uh, jokes and songs about me. So I understood, uh, I have to surrender. And this emotion of surrendering, also the su surrender of so-called important things, this is a key emotion, which has, of course, marked my analysis. So I believe that this, this element of um, use of space, moving everywhere, is so important. And uh, uh, it includes the surrender of men who have to give up some of their business and simply answer positively to, the, to this interaction. Um, this was my emotion. And um, I'm very grateful for it. And I believe that this uh, is a very important part of, of the culture in, in, in Tigray and certainly in many other societies which have uh, comparable uh, festivals. Thank you for your question. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Wilbert. And we do have a hand raised, Dr. Azeb. Yes, I just wanted to say to Dr. Wilbert, you are part of the game, by the way. Don't feel guilty that you have yes. occupied a space because we, the, the Ashwanda girls, need you because they are showing off and just absorb, take the, 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 the event of the day because it, it's not only about girls. In fact, it's all about men too. They are showing off, you know, they have the space, they have the power, they have the, you know, the dignity, but just you know, be there and admire. So I, I don't think you take any, any, any space at all. You're meant to be there. <laughs> Thank you. Totally agree. That was clear. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Akwilu. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Samhal, my sister. And thank you everyone. Dr. Wilbur, thank you for the wonderful insight that he brought us about just occupying the space, the dynamics that takes place in there, and um, how women assert authority while they just fill up that space in order to make their voices visible uh, within that setting. So given this, uh, I just would uh, like to see the way you just explained was that that space is fluid. I understand it is fluid, but uh, at the same time, that is also the stage where women's, uh, women's agency is demonstrated. So how do you really um, uh, conceptualize or rather describe women's agencies in this kind of setting? Setting an agenda for authorities, challenging power and making women's issues embedded within the system, which is actually, literally speaking, not, uh, uh, I mean, patriarchal in many senses. So I just want you to speak a little bit here because it, I know you have a lot of resources to, to talk about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, it's it's such a big topic and, and you're right, the word agency, I didn't use it, but that's in the center of, of my idea. Women are taking back the agency. They are showing their agency. They are showing their power. And maybe I just uh, uh, pick out one word which I had used in my presentation uh, to make this idea stronger. I used the word hidden. Uh, the traditional um, narrative about um, especially Ethiopian Highland society in general, Tigrayan society, is that it is a patriarchal society. We all know that discourse. Um, even the, the word Kibri, um, it was very nicely presented by, by Dan Bauer, um, shows a certain domination of men, while he, he himself had shown that women also very high in this Kibri, in this system of Kibri. Perfectly agree. So we if we look closer, we see while there's this discourse of power. Um, the society imposing specific rules, uh, the society uh, impo imposing also rules of religion, um, 
the society demanding a specific role to be played by women, including uh, cooking, including the uh, serving of coffee regularly to their coffee addicted husbands and, and so on. The list is very long. Um, so even the women very often usually take this traditional role imposed on them, but also inherited by them, very serious. So we cannot simply say this is a society where the men dominate by violence. No, it is uh, a specific order uh, where there is a public discourse of domination of manly power, but it's a discourse. So here we have a very interesting element. The Ashenda Festival, from my point of view, is one of many instruments which women have to celebrate not their official power, but the hidden power. Here I come to the word hidden. Who in the society could dare to do something which the mother will not accept? Um, if we speak of the uh, relationship between mother and family, um, the mothers are usually an extremely strong uh, point of reference in, dis in, in, in discussions. Uh, it is, if you are in trouble, if you uh, ha have trouble in your family, where you will go? To your, to your cousins on your father's side? Or will you go to, to your cousins who are the sons and daughters of your mother's sisters? This is the side you will choose. Uh, the, the land which will be inherited from your mother's side is your is your backbone is is the is the land which will save you if you're in trouble with the society uh, here we have an, a, a lot of elements of women organizing society from the uh, nucleus uh, which is called family from the family networks but that's hidden but much more powerful uh, and then usually the discourses allow us to understand. So Ashenda is the moment of provocation where women uh, show their power. Uh, uh, I, I liked uh, the references to the songs, which also underline that. Too much to be said, but I wanted to, to, to uh, happily respond to what you say, because I believe the question is going exactly in the right direction. And let me conclude with one suggestion. Let's understand the Brian society not as a society of men, but of networks of uh, hidden power of women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilbert. And I just wanted to read off one comment quickly, and then we'll move on just for the sake of time. Um, from Professor Fetin, it says, the most important point for Ashenda is there is no exclusion and no societal classification. So I think it's very important to highlight how inclusive Ashenda is. And all of our panelists, you all have done an amazing job highlighting this incredible phenomenon of Ashenda and how it's developing into a global phenomenon and how it's not only a holiday, it represents so much more. And there's so many intricate details um, whether it's about the songs, the tones of the songs, um, just the, the holiday in general. So we are so thankful to have you present. This was such a great first session, and I will go ahead and pass it off to Danny. Uh, thank you, somehow You did a wonderful job of moderating and, and capturing the, the, the good moments, the, the best moments of the discussion. Uh, and I also would like to thank uh, all the uh, panelists who shared uh, insightful information about what Ashenda means uh, and culturally what it means to the greater good of the world, not even just the guy, but like to the greater good of the world. And it's, it's, it's amazing to see how a small cultural event can have such a meaningful impact on the greater society. Um, you know, we have abandoned a lot of the good things that happen in the small aspects. We don't signify and we don't put them out there to, to, for the world to see. We look at them as some events that happen that are normal. We do them every year and that's that. And, and it's not. It's, it's more than that. It's meaningful. It's, it's, a, it's a way of expression. It's a way of showing that the society that we all live in is a society that is uh, harmonious to everybody men, women, children, elderly, and everybody else. And, and the presentations that, that all of you panelists have done is phenomenal to describe that. And so I, I, I wanna take a moment to thank you. Um, we, we, uh, we skipped early on on um, having our um, uh, opening note 
uh, by uh, the president of Hazai Communities Forum, uh, Ato Ermias uh, Muradam, and, and I'd like to give him a chance to um, make his remarks before we go on to our next uh, session, if, if that's possible, uh, Ato Ermias. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, happy Ashenda to all of you. I uh, am here on behalf of the uh, Wala Tigray, and thank you, Danny and Samhal, and all the uh, CAT uh, uh, committee members and uh, the presenters here. Uh, I would like to say a, a few words in Tigrinya uh, on behalf of the uh, Wala Tigray. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm sorry uh, for the dignitaries here. If uh, they can hear it, I hope uh, Danny gonna uh, help. Danny or somehow gonna help to translate a little bit of that. Mo bar abzu nazba alzi muhniat kiru tadaliuz niye zhabar kumen zhabar kinen mahala reser diaspora tigray bchlaid ma nazba al wana tat zhon kin al tigrayin amla alam trkawan dekanustio tigray. Bishumain, Bishum Wala Mahabarasa Tigrain, Tigray Communities Forum, and Kwa Nazakhurti Baal Al Sahakin Al Sahana Havili for two. Bimajan Marta, his Venaz was Hazolo Aswan Hilkatin Kayakil, Abzusomuzi, Bugafao Devdav Nefarit, Hiotom the Halafu, Sudra Ashelatna, Sanati Haukum, Yahavanan Dalku, Abza Addisti, Nai Salam. فقرن ملكت ناس أنتن زخونات علت بجا هزبن كوينن زحلفا زلون زحلف زلون حربن ياتات نادما بقالك قلتو زخاب دني مسقاناي كأرمي فوتو مباركس وعلا محبرة سابة تقراي ويد ما تقراي كميونيتيس فورم أو أمريكا زنبر محبرة سابة حدنتو أطبيقو زحلو بتمرتو كتبا وعمون تتأنى خري عبزنا ورلو خبابي تسمع النت رقيبو نوعلون أبعدي نزركو هزبون زرو حلو بفل أيدما بوهلون بتاريخو من النتون قانقون زخرع محبرة سب عبداس فرا كومينيتي كهنس كهنس اندحر كوينو منا أسيدة كنا بهلومن تاريخومن من النتومن فليتوم كخرعو خنقبر النخل عوالات کمیتی خوانو مبرد تا طرح که کنس آمری هنات کمیتی تا کمیت سو به مقداری لات آمین عو آمریکا زلوا نایتگرای محبرس کمیتی تا عوالات زخوانالا محبریا. امبارکس زلوا معنتنا و علوز زلنا کفتم عبیتی به هلت هات بعالات نه تاریخ نه من نتنا نم حلال فل حد زخوانه بعالشندا نای Mahavara Seb Tigray Community is the Center for Advancement of Tigrayan Studies at Tigray Communities Forum. Waidma, Kat TCF Tadaliu, Abza Audi Buzuk Masnati the Kaidu Muran Tagarun was at in Yatatin, Sanataun, Wulkaun Tomokrom Kafluna, Uzu Program of Delaum, Bushumain, Bushum's Mahavara Seb Tigray in the Lenin Adan, Musganan, and the Aroku. عبزب علیزی به سات فوز الله حمد ما بزگات آموزیو، عبیین تاریخ آن سرحس لذخانه، عبیم سگانای که آری فتو یا آنیالی صبح و بعد خانه لا نقل دهنای من نه. Thank you Daniel for the opportunity that you gave me to speak on behalf of the Wala Tigray Committee for it. Thank you, Dr. Armias. Uh, as a chairman, um, we do want to make the space uh, to make your remarks. Uh, I think we had technical difficulties earlier. Uh, we weren't able to get you on, but it's important that you know we, we do things in a way that um, messages are shared, and and you did a wonderful job of sharing the message. And just to um, uh, speak briefly on your message in English, um, the, the main takeaway there is one: uh, you know we we were facing a devastation in in Tigray, uh, the bombing that recently just happened a few days ago, and Naala, and then there was an attack that happened in the funny. Uh, it's it's really a devastating time for Tigrayans. We're suffering. Uh, our people are suffering. Uh, yet we still celebrate. We still are resilient. And uh, it was just a welcoming message of happy Ashanda to all of you, um, to our society globally. 
and uh, that that all together, all of us, we can strive to make you know our culture, our identity more known through cats and and other organizations that are working so hard into doing research and and you know presenting ideas that would benefit us and move us forward in life. So. Uh, thank you, Arthemis. I uh, really do appreciate your uh, insight and, and your brief message there. Uh, moving forward, I think for, for the time until we get our next panelist, uh, um, if uh, Dr. Daniel, if you can play a song and just an admission so people can get a little bit of a break. Uh, we have been here for a couple hours now, so I would uh, think that that would be really good. So, um, Dr. Daniel, let's. Maybe play an Ashenda song so that we can get a, an idea of what Ashenda feels like through the lens of women. And, and I know my sister Alva can attest to this and my sister Rahwa can attest to this. So if you could play a Ashenda song, maybe the one with um, Eden, um, Tahas, and uh, Rahel, like that's, that's a very good song. So, um, and then in the meantime, I'll work on getting our panelists or our moderators to come on. Thank you. Thanks, Danny.
exciting, give you an edge at work, Grammarly can make your job one click simpler. Hi, Danny. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, to those of you that can actually understand Virginia, like you, you, you picked out some of the words, uh, the descriptions that that our panelists have had uh, in, in the last couple of hours. So it's it's just amazing, and it's important that we see it in in music forms. And much appreciation goes to. Um, uh, artist Eden, artist uh, Rahel, and artist Terhas for putting that piece of work together. That's very, very powerful. It was done in 2017, but you know, it's 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 really, really something that we should uh, cherish in our our society. Um, moving along uh, to the next uh, panel that we have, the next set of segments, uh, it is uh, going to be a conversation, um, an, an open conversation. 
Uh, and I'd like to invite my brother Biniam to uh, moderate this next set of um, uh, conversation that is going to take place. And it is uh, what the grand women entrepreneurs can do to thrive economically. And I think this is a very, very powerful conversation to be had because we're not only looking at our culture, but we're also looking at what is the future for the women segment of our society and today. And uh, Biniam, uh, take it away. The years, I'm, I'm glad you're here joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this call. Um, I want to thank first and foremost everyone that's actually on this call. Um, uh, can you can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah so I just want to make sure that um, I give my um, gratitude and show my uh, flowers to everyone on this call and everything you guys do for Tigray, not only for yourselves, but also for the betterment of our people. So thank you for being on this call. But yeah, my name is Biniam uh, Yitabadik. Um, I'm honored to be one of the moderators, uh, not only to shine light on the women um, in our uh, movement, but also on how we could do more moving forward. So um, let's see. So we have a part of our panel. We have, if I'm not mistaken, we have not only myself, but we have um, Michael. Gabon Miskil on the call. We have Hylum and Dr. Germay, as well as there is one more person, uh, Gita Chu, right? Um, so I just, just want to make sure that these are um, not only great men on the uh, call, but I also want to acknowledge that, um, you know, as, as well as um, I wish we had more uh, Tagarwati women on our panel, but I think uh, all these men are not only amazing on what they do individually, but also what they do in their own business aspirations. Uh, I don't know who goes first, but I'm assuming it is Dr. Gurma. Is Dr. Gurma on the call? Uh, sorry, Binyam. Uh, we also have Rahwa. Um, Rahwa? Okay. So, uh, yeah, just want to clarify. Okay, great. I'm just trying. I'm just reading my, my, the notes right now. So, um, is Dr. Gemai first on the, the panel? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Come can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself um, to the audience and kind of like a quick little synonymous on what you do. All right. Uh, thank you, Bina. Uh First and foremost, uh, Thank you to Grai Communities Forum and CATS leadership for arranging such a wonderful agenda meeting. And I'm honored and privileged you know, to be one of the panelists. Even though it is a sad week, but we have to continue on our arrangements and our tasks. Uh, today, uh, the title is, you know, what Tigrian women entrepreneurs can do to thrive economically. And at the same time, what are the potentials for diaspora women entrepreneurs and how can they navigate possibilities to thrive? Uh, I will uh, put mine, you know, in three parts. So the first thing is, you know, how to empower Tigrian women entrepreneurs. Part one is, uh, I would like to mention world and Africa population. Uh, we will reach, you know, eight million. Sorry, eight billion on November 15, 2022. This is according to United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Our population is growing, and according to Population Research Institute, 49.7 percent are female and 50.3 percent are male. When we go to Africa, there are more than 1.4 million billion and 50 percent are female, more than 700 million. So women have you know the same power as men in terms of population. So, and we have to work together to thrive economically and socially. My next part is uh, 
how to keep existing and create new women entrepreneurs. Number one is work and plan diaspora women to be prosperous in business economy, in business economy, health, education, agriculture, and other sectors. Number two, Tigrian researchers are needed to study the needs of Tigrian women in particular and African women in general, how to thrive, grow in business industry. This helps to create new business startups and upgrade existing ones. Number three, identify capital access and support system. A, we need to approach financial institutions. B, we need to uh, approach uh, community network networks and arrange and approach community networks. Nonprofit organizations like National Organization for Women, now this is in the US. It focuses on advocating for justice and equality in reproductive health care and the economy. The other one is uh, organization is a UN Women Organization. They have uh, branches in the US in every city, I join. Uh, I join in their meeting uh, in the LA area. So UN Women Organization, in their two, 2022 to 2025 strategic plan, they put that building a gender is to build a gender equal world. It works to achieve the empowerment of all women and girls. So we have to use you know, non-profit organizations in order you know, women to progress and develop you know, their business uh, needs. The other one is uh, federal government, states and cities. We can consider a small business administration, SBA, which can help you know, like uh, women uh, businesses and startups. Approaching various chamber of commerce in various cities would be also one uh, example. The other one is, you know, professional consulting and legal services to seek to seek professional consulting and legal services. Uh, so these uh, uh, different entities, you know, they can help you know uh, Tigrians uh, to start up their business. And at the same at the same time, uh, to help you know those uh, businesses, active businesses. Number three, uh, I would like to uh, add you know to this uh, uh, <laughs> approach: uh, reach women to help in women economic empowerment for capital access. Capital access is, is you know, the main part of the uh, creating a business and developing uh, uh, businesses related to women and others. Therefore, uh, we have to approach you know, rich women to help you know, for the cause of uh, women economic empowerment. For example, Melinda Gates, ex-spouse of Microsoft Bill Gates and Mackenzie Scott, ex-spouse of Amazon Jeff Bezos, gave away about 40 million to four organizations that promote gender equality in caregiving, technology, higher education, and minority communities. So these women, they help you know, uh, women to achieve uh, the economic empowerment. So it might be good to approach this woman and others. The other one is uh, create local women's social saving mechanisms. We call it, you know, uh, in our language like a group. So it might be good, you know, to create local women's social saving mechanisms in order to uh, open or create, you know, a new business. And at the same time, uh, to uh, bring more capital to the current businesses already in business. The other one is, you know, to uh, create women's business investment fund. This is very common, you know, in many women 
uh, investment uh, groups. However, women-led startup, startups received just 2.3% of venture capital funding in 2020. So we have to work hard, you know, to get more capital, more investment funds from the uh, institutional uh, uh, fund groups. Women only, they received, you know, 2.3%, which is very, very low. So we have to approach, you know, venture capitalists in order to give, you know, more capital to women. My last part is, uh, part number three is, you know, arrange business conferences, trainings, and female role mo models. It might help, you know, for women uh, businesses and startups. Number one is, you know, like we have to uh, have a vocational training, exchange experience and business ideas, share knowledge and skills, arrange business conferences and business meetings, attend business conferences and meetings in various cities in the US, invite Tegaru role models to share their experience and guide how Tegaru women can engage in business sector, innovation, and startups. For example, we can approach role, Tegaru role models like Professor Fetian in agriculture sector, Frowaini CNN in industry sector, Frowaini Columbus in retail sector, Mike Dallas in innovation and startup sector, and panelist Rahawa Atlanta in finance sector. These are examples, you know, we need Tagaru raw models to come up and then, you know, share, share their experiences and direct or guide, you know, Tagaru women to engage in business sector. So these are the three parts, you know, uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, in my conclusion, the bottom line is how to bring economic empowerment to women, reduce in income inequalities, and build a civilized society. Women have to use all tools available to achieve all tasks needed and to bring community worlds. To do that, they need to utilize resources, access to capital, share experience, knowledge, get ready and determined to start a business as an entrepreneur. Thank you so much. Thank you, Germay, uh, Dr. Germay, for that um, beautiful explanation. Um, I'll go ahead and transition to um, Hailom Tedesa, my brother. Um, so Hylum is currently one of, or is one of the six founders of Tegado Professional Networks. As you got, as you guys know, as TPN established in 2018, he is also the founding member of the Northbridge Corporation Investment Group. He served as the chairman of TPN for the last four years and is currently on the board of the Tigray Communities North America Forum. Hylum is an influential leader who brings a wealth of experience and driving change strategic visioning and building consensus for implementing new process and technology, agile transformation and focus on analytics, quality and efficiency. Hylum currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife, Olga. They currently have two boys, Helix and Omni. He's passionate about making a difference in diversity and inclusion, youth development and community service. So Hylum, I'll let you, Hawaii, introduce yourself and what we will talk about moving forward. Uh, that sounds great. Uh, Brother Binyam, that's quite an introduction. So I, I wasn't expecting for it to be right, but thank you for that. Um, and it, it, honestly, it's an honor uh, to be here and a privilege to talk about such a critical topic. And, and I do agree with Dr. Gurmai that you know we should encourage more women or give more women the platform and the opportunity to talk about topics that are relevant and important to them. So I think that's something that we really need to switch very quickly, um, and I'll talk about why. And um, and also, Dr. Gurmai, thank you for laying out. I think you, you laid out very good 
you know, foundation and structure. Uh, there's not much to add to that. I may want to just take a, a slightly different spin and talk about more around you know, how do we have equal treatment and then how that translates to some of the things um, that Dr. Germay uh, talked about. So I, I have four key points and I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. I think the first one is, and we have to do this one right. And uh, I, know, uh, I think let, let's, let's, uh, let's do this just so it's easier and concise. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves and say a few things. And then I think we will get a panel together where there are some set of questions that uh, my friend Benyam will ask. And then so that, that way we can have more fluid conversation. Absolutely. Work best. Uh, and so thank you. I, I, but, you know, your resume is long, so we can be here all day if you wanted to. So, uh, but, you know, introduce yourself and then let's, let's get everybody in. Uh, I want to get Lawa to be uh, in the conversation and, and, and everybody else who is on this panel. And then we can discuss uh, some of the uh, sub questions that we have around um, the entrepreneurship here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for that um, structure, Brother Danny. I think that's very helpful. Actually, I, I agree it should be more conversational. So I, I think my introduction is done. Brother Binyam did a phenomenal job. Um, I just want to just say thank you to uh, the, you know, the organization, the CAS organization that's really put this together um, and, and allow us the, the opportunity to spend time um, this afternoon with one another. Thank you, Brother Hailum. Um, so next on the board, we have uh, Gitachu Gide with over 15 years of experience in the financial service industries, serving as the board chairman in Tigray Global Chamber of Commerce in North America, um, as well as a board member in Black BSC, also another board member in the UHI Capital, and currently owns and runs uh, Gitco Financial LLC. Um, so that is Gitachu Gide. Um, and also we have Mike Gibbon Muskel. So Mike Gibbon Muskel is a member of the Tigran community in Dallas. He's also the co-founder of COO of Talisman, a venture black startup that serves companies money through IT automation. Um, so we have my brother, Mike Gibbon Muskel. Mike, you on the call? Yes, I am. Good, uh, good, af good afternoon now, everybody. Great. And we also have Rahawa on the call. Um, Rawa, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, I see you didn't get my bio, but that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you so much, Benyam. Uh, my name is Rahawa Isman. Um, I recently, about three years ago, moved from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where I was there for about 30 years and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am a tax accountant, uh, been in finance since 20, uh, 2007, opened my business in 2012. I'm also a life insurance agent and financial advisor. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm also a TPN member. I am the personal and uh, professional development chair. Um, and I really thank Katz um, and all of you for putting this together and just allowing me to be a part of the panel. Great. So yeah, again, thank you for everybody for being on this call. Um, hopefully we can have a powerful conversation, uh, not just um, currently, but just moving forward. Um, so with everyone's amazing resume and what everyone's doing amazing, I kind of want to start the conversation around what can um, to grind women um, as entrepreneurs do to thrive economically? And I'll start with um, Rahawa. Okay, thank you. Um, to grind women, uh, well, since the pandemic, even prior to uh, what's happening in Tigray right now, but since the pandemic, you know, we see how the, the fall of the economy, a lot of people lost their jobs. Um, and then there are a lot of single mothers, you know, or even just mothers that are supporting, you know, as a secondary income to their spouses and also multitasking. So um, one of the things that with Tigray and women, um, this is a good time for them to be encouraged to start a business, I would say, because it allows you to re-enter the workforce uh, when you are ready, because we all know that women are very uh, much multitaskers, especially Tigrayan women, we're very resilient. We don't back down, um, no matter what's going on back home, we're still emotionally intelligent. So we know how to um, pick up it you know, whether it's social cues, emotional cues, reading certain situations, helping other women also. But what we can do is find our passion is what I would say. We really need to, as the grind women, find our passions, what we bring to the table 
and see how we can turn that into a business. Because right now, um, as we can see others that have done that, the first thing that we all want to do is help to grind. Um, and once everything, you know, is uh, reconnected, we don't really know the magnitude of the damage and where we're going to, how much help that's going to be expected of us. But to grind women, because we are multitaskers, because it's so many things we can do, we are very passionate. It's time for us to just kind of put our passion to the table and turn it into a business. So that way we know that we are better equipped and well equipped into helping you know, Tigray into helping ourselves in our households because it does start at home. And once we are stable at home and we have what we need and we help our communities here, we can better help our communities back home because then we are connecting with one another. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. No, I did. Thank you uh, so much for that. Um, does anybody else want to piggyback on what Rahawa beautifully explained? Okay, Abinam, I can try. Yes, can you hear please. me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, first let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Girmay Gabrahiwat, and uh, I'm a specialist in uh, international relations, tourism, and investment. Currently, I'm the president of uh, North Bridge Connect and uh, Equator International LLC. At the same time, I'm director of African Diaspora Hub. Um, uh, I was the former uh, vice president of African Chamber of Commerce of Colorado. This uh, just, you know, in short, you know, I have been involved with, uh, in many uh, uh, tasks anyway. Uh, I, today, this might be enough for me. Uh, to come to the question, uh, number one, I think, uh, Women, they have to organize themselves, you know, as we, women business entity, to, you know, to, to know, to identify, you know, their desire, their goal, and so on and so forth. So they have to organize as women entity. Number two is, you know, it's good to share, you know, experience, let me see. experience and knowledge. Uh, the other one is, you know, identify sectors, which, which sector to engage. Uh, the other one is identify capital access and then be determined, take action. Therefore, you know, like if uh, these uh, steps are followed, you know, uh, at the same time to have a strategic plan, business plan, it will help, you know, uh, diaspora women to, uh, to thrive, you know, in the uh, business sector. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Germay. Um, so, yes, so several st studies have shown that if women are supported to reveal their full potential, they could harness tremendous achievement with the potential to boost the economy, the well-being of the society that they belong in. And I think that we've seen that um, our women are amazing. They have they have pushed the movement they are the movement right so and i think as 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 men of the diaspora um not only can we support but we can also up, uplift our women so um i i, I want to transition to uh my, my brother Hailum. um so how can we understand the significance of technology and as well as supporting our women amongst the, the diaspora um uh, I mean, that's a that's a great question um how are you I think I'll, I do want to add, you know, one thing that kind of, I believe, ties back to what Mahawa was mentioning earlier. I think the first step before we even implement anything is we, we have to treat our women as equal. Uh, I don't think we've done that in our society, even though we think we have and we feel, at least here in the States, uh, we've made some strides. We may have made some strides, but I, I don't think we have given them equal footing. And, and I'm specifically talking about when it comes to like their, their brain capacity, their leadership capacity, their just overall potential. Not this whole like cultural discussions around physical attributes, just purely what really matters. I don't think we treat them equally. And, and in our culture, I think, and I've seen this a lot, and, and I'm just trying to be very honest and, and candid about it because that's the only way I think we're gonna grow is we have to be honest about these things. And, and, and I've seen this in a lot of meetings that I'm about to share. I think in our culture, we defer to men um, even if the women that are the experts in those matters, 
are present, we still defer to men. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure why that's the case. We also default certain leadership opportunities to men. And this spans across everything, whether it is you know, in the religious context, in just throughout culture, throughout tradition, in various industries, we typically default certain leadership positions to men. And you'll see this if you just take a very simple study and look at where what, the identity of the Tigrayan culture, if you will, and in all aspects of it, most of the leadership positions are held by men, even though the, the overall capacity is exactly equal, if in some areas actually women are much more superior. Um, so I think the first step for us is how do we identify leadership opportunities where young girls can sit in them at a very early age so that they have the confidence, right? Because when you give somebody the opportunity to do something and they do it well, they're gonna generate confidence. And when that confidence comes, then they're gonna to start to translate that to dreams. And those dreams can create futures that we still have not even discovered or thought about right now. So to me, I think that is absolutely the first step we must take. And if we don't do that, anything else we do from there, it has no foundation because our foundation right now is not solid. So whatever we stack on top of it is eventually gonna fall. And this is even in scripture, right? The house on sand versus the house on a rock, right? And I think that's where it starts. Once we do that, then I think uh, we will have you know, the opportunity to start to really listen to them. Because if we treat them as equals, then we're gonna be open to listening to their opinions, their ideas. And then we can start to create like surveys, focus groups, bring in external expertise that, that specialize in, in women entrepreneurship or different career sectors. By doing that, then we're hearing from them directly what Waha was saying is where do their interests and passions lie? And once we know what they are, there may end up being five clusters of whether it's technology, civic engineering, area of space, construction management. There's a couple of sectors that we talked about in the past, or even like CEO positions. We can prepare them very early if they know they can hold those positions. And the way to do that is to give them leadership positions at the beginning. But anyway, so you take their interest and their passions that they're providing us from information, then you invest around that. And I think that's how we have, if we don't do the, the, the first one, then it's going to be really difficult to do the second one because if we don't have them as equals and we don't listen to them, then it doesn't matter what passion they share with us. What we're going to do is the natural thing that we've always done, which is put them in specific boxes. And that's not fair, especially now that we're in a country that has unlimited you know, capital, unlimited opportunities, unlimited you know, school systems, and money is everywhere. We're just not doing a good job of pulling that in. Other communities are, but we, that's the, I think we have to do that first one, and that, that second one will follow. Then we can talk about creating you know, VCs and investment firms that can focus on specific sectors, right? To me, what Dr. Grimai shared earlier, which is astounding, I thought I should have, I should have known this information, but the fact that only 2% of the investments through VCs is going to women, that's not great. And once we did step one and step two, then we put money aside, we can create seed funding. We raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. We raised millions of dollars for the guy. We can raise several hundred thousand dollars as seed funding for a VC based on their passion. Then we can start to invest in them early, get them in training, you know, introduce them to the tech sector, medical sector. Again, the neighborhood that I live in now there is a woman now across the street from me that is opening up her own dentist um, uh, office. It's because her culture, I think, allows it and invests in her to be able to do that. We got to do the same thing. There's a community supporting her. It's because I believe they're starting to make that transition. And I think that's what we need to do. And when once we do those, um, number one, number two, then I think the investment comes. And then hopefully women can create a multi-million dollar industry that we haven't even tapped into right now. Those are some of the thoughts. Thank you, Hilo. Uh, no, I mean, I think you're right. I think uh, what it um, centers around is um, as men, as like, we have to be more supportive, right? And not only just be supportive, but we, we have to be transparent. Like, what are we not doing um, in order to uplift our women, right? Um, and I think you're right. I think a lot of men are in leadership positions that should be <laughs> towards women, right? So, uh, I don't know if Michael, if you want to piggyback on what, what uh, Hylum uh, uh, fully explained in terms of what we can do to support, but also what, you know, what, what we can do to uh, defer as well. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, Hylum, you put it, you put it very well. Um, I guess like one good thing to note is uh, 
I looked back at this, like, I think sometime last year to see what does TPN look like from a leadership perspective when it comes to women. Turns out 66% of all of our chapter leadership and at the national level is all women. Um, and uh, even on our national team, I think we have three men and then the rest of the team is all women. So like even at the national level, uh, mostly women. And that was one of the goals that we suggested last year, um, both at the forum level as we go forward and at TPN is that we can keep that a consistent 50% or higher. Um, Cause at the end of the day, it's about equal representation. Um, the bad, the bad news I, I do have is I, I did a little more research on what Dr. Giermai was saying. Uh, that was one of the few things I had prepared was where does venture capital money go? Um, I think in terms of African-Americans, um, you know, we get 1.9%, but in terms of total, you know, startups to receive VC, that's, you know, a f I think a fraction of a percent. So that's 0.5% of startups get VC funding of that 1.9, uh, of that number, 1.9% uh, of that goes to black people. And then of that, 0.34% goes to black women. So really the, the deck is absolutely stacked against you know, black women in general, if you imagine like the women in our culture with the way society plays out, it's, you know, completely stacked against them. It's just being intentional about giving them opportunities. If we're, you know, owning businesses, let's be intentional about being 50-50. Let's be intentional about creating opportunities for everyone. Um, and then just not using gender as a way to gatekeep. Um, so a lot of what Hylum said is exactly what I'm saying now. So I won't go on too much, but it's just about being really intentional to see what talent level someone has, not what their gender is. Okay. Thank you, Michael, um, for explaining that. So like, so we all address um, in, in, in ways that um, our, our women could be more empowered, could be more supported. Um, so in this country, not only are we battling racism in, in terms of uh, towards the, the black man, but the most the, the most uh discriminated systematically person on this country is the black women right because not only are they um judge mean black but also a woman right so there is a, a gender um you know equality dis disparity in this country right so uh now that we're touching on that in terms of uh shifting towards understanding the significance of technology you know currently like familiarizing with uh applicable technology significantly helps to grind women to stand out in the market, right? So technology also eases to, to grind women's challenges by enabling them to efficiently allocate resources and discover new business possibilities. So on this panel, I definitely wanna really uh, focus more on how can to grind women thrive in that market, right? So um, I wanna kind of uh, start with Hylum and we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you, Brother Binyam. So it's specifically to the tech sector, right, Binyam, in terms of how women are able to um, have more opportunities. I think right now what I noticed, especially now you know, in my current career, the last, let's say, seven years has been purely technology and in larger, you know, large corporations, if you will. And what I've seen a lack of is women in tech leadership positions. Um, I think to me, that's what, probably one of the bigger gaps. There are other gaps in terms of just women engineers in general, um, especially when it comes to like solution architecture, um, there's a huge gap. And that's all about just designing how you want things to be built. Like our, our, our girls have the capacity to think about those things. They're, a lot of them are well organized. They have the ability to kind of sketch out a specific program of how things should be structured. Like to me, those are very teachable things that the only reason why there are men heavy focus there is because they're, they're going to school for it, they're encouraged to do those things. So to me, I think there's two sides to the tech sector. There is one where they can create their own products. In order to do that, we have to give them, similar to what we've done here in Atlanta, the coding program, we have to continue to expand that beyond just a coding program, truly making that a, an institution that gives them like hard skills that can be applied in the industry, like project management, product management, you know, engineering, uh, business analytics, and so on, communication. There's like so many specific things. And these are really high paying jobs in the tech sector, most of which are probably in the six figures, depending on experience, especially when you get to engineering and you get to solution architecture. There are people that are making 200, over $200,000 a year. Some are making $300,000 a year doing these types of positions. Those are teachable skills that we can 
implement. So to me, I think that's one side, which is a corporate structure. I mean, sorry, that is, is one side on the corporate structure would do that. And then from a, just an overall, like, um, you know, developing their own startups, that is where the skills in terms of truly helping them. I, I think, Mike, you're, you would be a good example in this, and we could find other people as well. Like, how do you build a product from beginning to end? We could show them what that looks like. And they have ideas of things that they want to provide as a service right now. I'm sure there's ideas that they're thinking about. They probably don't know, how do I build this? How do I code this? So we can show them how to build apps. So I think there are like some very specific, like fundamental things we can do and that's going to get them in the tech sector. But I think it depends. What do we want? Do we want to go after the corporate structure? Do we want to go after helping them do their own startups and creating their own markets? So depending on that, I believe there are very specific programs we can put in place. But at least we have a starting baseline in Atlanta that now has been going on for almost five years in terms of creating like a coding program. And almost every time it's either more women or girls, I guess in this age, because they're younger girls, um, there are more of them or equal amount that are going through the program, which is an amazing thing. To me, that was a big data point that shows they're interested and they're consistently interested because year after year, they're showing up. So we can take that it, because the whole idea with that is as a pilot, how do we expand is where I think we are right now. We have not figured out how to take that, put more rigor, put more structure, converted certification, and then give them opportunities to really, really go into these specific industries. But tech is probably one of the biggest areas right now where there is a shortage of, of women participation, tech and civic engineering and aerospace. Those are, I think, believe the top three. You can imagine five years from now, how many of our girls that are in, let's say, high school, middle school, or college we could target that right now in the next five years, I can guarantee you if 20% of them are engaged, depending on how much that is, that is 20% that is going to be making six figures in the next five years. Just think about what kind of wealth that generates. Then they can start their own startups and invest in girls because they know what it's like to, to travel this path, which is more difficult than it is. As a black man, it was already very difficult for me to travel this you know, tech corporate structure. It was a very tough climb. For women, it's even significantly <laughs> just like another weight on top of that that's added so i can only imagine how much tougher it is for uh, especially now i have three younger sisters so i know what it's like and i was fortunate enough to help my younger sister get into the tech sector now she's a very in my mind very successful product manager um doing incredibly well going into it, working for working for disney working for nasdaq i mean doing just doing amazing thing in the tech area in the tech sector I, I, you know, if that opportunity wasn't open to her, I don't think she would have been, that's something she would have thought about, but because she had an example and she felt like she needed to invest in it. And I was fortunate enough to be in a position to kind of help plant the seed and water a little bit. Now she's doing amazing things just because the door was open and there could be many of those success stories in the next five years. But again, we have to start with point number one, and then we have to build a structure around it. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think building around the structure is very, very important. And I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued. So with over 15 years of experience in the financial service industries, I'm very curious to hear what Mr. Gitachu Gide has um, his opinion on this um, particular question. So Mr. G uh, Gitachu Gide, please. Okay. Uh, hi. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I want to say uh, happy uh, Shenda for all our women. And I'm also like to express my thanks to the, the people and organization that uh, put together this. Um, saying this, I think our, uh, we know that our women are the very hardworking women. So if we look at specifically from our community standpoint, we need to really dip into the size. So which market are we looking at? So for example, I categorize them into two. One is, um, you know, kids who are born in, you know, are grown in US, uh, you know, they have all the access, education, infrastructure and stuff like that. The second group is the people who are migrating here. So it could be in a mix, but the majority of our, our women are uh, unskilled, right? Um, uneducated, um, and also very disadvantageous. It was a lot of responsibility at their hands. So 
uh, if we really want to make real change, we're going to have to pick our fight. Do we want to focus on the, our majority or do we want to focus on a small group that they can be, you know, literally uh, self-sufficient and also they can help themselves? So that's where we have to really uh, look at it. So from this standpoint, uh, I would like to focus more on our majority of our people. So uh, I'm going to, because, you know, I agree with all my, you know, all the comments from my colleagues. Um, and also I accepted all of the suggestion proposals. Uh, but uh, I don't want to spend much time on that, but I will pick up specific examples and also area of focus. So uh, being today is, you know, the main event is agenda, uh, right? Uh, right now from like, you know, uh, uh, celebrating agenda in a hall, we're moving into a city dance, right? This is one of, uh, I mean, a big progress to me, right? So how can we, at the same time celebrating, introducing our culture to others, how can we economically benefit our women due to this? So there are several areas. I'm, I'm focusing on the low hanging fruits, all right? So when we are like, you know, uh, stuff in front of us, we look further, that's our human nature. But one specific area is the beauty beauty industry, for example, right? There's a huge potential that they can utilize. Let me give you a specific example. In our culture, we have how many holidays? Maybe like four major holidays. If one woman, you know, like, you know, uh, be able to like just a simple uh, a braiding uh, business, if she braid 100 people, in one event, that's like a thin, you know, if she charge hundred dollars, we're talking about in one event, she can collect 10,000. This, she can do it right in her home, right? Right? So if she does this in four holidays, she can collect, she can make $40,000, right? If we add a shenda, that would be additional. And if she, break into other markets like Amharu, um, Eritreans, and Africans, that is a huge potential. There's significant potential. So we can create a lot of jobs. If this doesn't require special skills, special education. You don't need to go four years in college, right? These are some, some areas. And then I'm coming to Ashenda. We need to we need to transition agenda in a bigger. So what can we do with like, you know, a major annual agenda holiday in uh, one state? So a bunch of people comes and we just like, you know, we do it like two, three, four days and it will be a city, uh, a city um, uh, dancing, but you will have, you know, food truck, you will have retails, you would have a lot of stuff that you can organize. Can we do that? Of course we can do that. That would bring in additional benefit to our, our women and our communities, right? So uh, now what is the challenge? So the challenge right now is A, uh, linguistic problems, cultural problems, lack of uh, business knowledge and uh, lack of uh, business leadership and so on. We can uh, mention several of this. So how can we tackle this, right? So basically there are several ways we can tackle this. Um, I'm being a, a chairman of the Tigray Global Chamber of Commerce. This is one of the area that we're, we're looking at if we wanna help uh, our, our people. It's just, we need to create the awareness right? That starts. So uh, think about it. if the majority of our women are in a low income, 
how many new generations are they bringing in? So, you know, the impact, let's assume the impact. So the, the, the family that they brought up, they're not gonna have the knowledge. They're not gonna have the awareness, right? You know, my son, my little son says, I'm just gonna tell you this. The school are educating us to work for somebody, not to self-independent or search something else, right? So all these kids, they go to school, they learn. Of course, they're gonna get education. God knows what the quality of education, what kind of support system they have in the house, right? So basically, if we support this, this the larger community, then the impact would be tremendous. It's a humongous uh, uh, impact we can create. So uh, to me is, I think uh, we need to, uh, 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 we need to organize well, we need to create some kind of support system. We can help them get through this, uh, you know, how they establish, uh, you know, various trainings, uh, various networking opportunities, how they can expand and so on. So uh, this is what my, uh, uh, my uh, I can say a lot, but uh, for now, I, I, I want to stop there. Thank no, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gitacho Gide. And I, I think uh, we're all a little bit over time, but uh, I definitely want to conclude on this. Um, I think uh, we've all explained, you know, not only our lengthy resumes, but also uh, what we could and should do uh, in terms of what women should do. But I think uh, as men, and Hylam touched upon this early on, was like, I think as men, we really need to check our misogynist uh, attitude towards our women and, and like, honestly, just towards ourselves, right? Like, I think we really need to silence our egos and really cut the uh, cultural clashes that um, the diaspora have amongst the older community that came from back home, right? To like migrate in this country. Um, and I think uh, just the absence of like structure and systems that further makes it difficult to start and run a business in this country, just as a black person is difficult, right? So when you add um, the gender disparities on long this country, the black women, the Tigrayan women, is the most uh, systematically oppressed person in this country, if you look at the numbers, right? And as someone that also runs her own country, I do wanna um, ask Rahawa, like, what, what are your thoughts in terms of like having available capital, applicable skills and network that it takes to pursue a business? Um, that's a good question. Um, and you brought up some really good points. Uh, one of the things, um, as a woman to look into is when you're starting a business, it's definitely not easy, you know, uh, but there are like um, the small business administration, they have a lot of resources to help you get started as a woman. I always encourage, I help a lot of women on a daily basis, open businesses. And my goal is to get as many to grind women into business, um, you know, finding their passion, what they're good at, because usually when it's something that you're passionate, you're not going to give up when it gets hard. Because um, as all of you know that run a business, you know, running a business, it's going to have its ups and downs. And if it's not something you're passionate about, you know, sometimes you tend to give up on it. Um, there are so many other financial assistances available through grants, um, you know, for people that are looking to uh, or women that are looking to launch or even grow their business. Um, they're even way more uh, way more available now since the pandemic, um, just because they're, you know, so many that actually lost their job or the econ been affected through the economy. Um, so one of the things I would say is find uh, whether it's locally, whether it's through like grants, um, SBA, whichever one, find and connect with someone that already has a business. Uh, like I said, I love helping our people start a business. Um, and, you know, help them every step of the way. We do tax planning, you know, where we're not just doing your taxes. We're helping you to make sure that, okay, we have, okay, a six-month goal, a one-year goal. What is it that you want out of your business? Where do you want to see your business? You know, what resources are available to you and what resources should we dig up together and see what can help you, you know, in your field. Um, so there's so many things here. We're very grateful in the United States. We have so many opportunities um, that we um, that we can take advantage of that, you know, our people don't have back home. So what I would say is just really, it's all about resources. 
finding what works, um, finding whether it's statewide or nationwide, there's so many resources. And most of the time is really just by connecting with the right person. Um, so anybody has questions, anyone interested in opening a business, I'll be happy, especially for women, not just women, but for women that want to um, kind of build on their passion. Uh, that's something that we just love to do. Uh, we want more people to be encouraged. Some people don't know if they can do it. Um, or when they look at all the, uh, the things that they have to do to even start a business, um, sometimes it's uh, discouraging. Um, so having that support, having the right resources, and sometimes if it's something that we can't provide, it's something that we know someone else can provide, you know, and I love that our network with TPN, we have people from different fields, different backgrounds. So if I don't know something was someone that wants to get into like the IT or technical institute, I know that I can contact my brother, Hayalom, you know, or I can contact uh, Mike you know, um, and just say, hey, like, hey, I need your help in this because somebody's starting a business. I love that we have our own support group because I think it means a world of uh, difference when someone is starting a business because that is something different. It can be scary because you're not clocking in and clocking out. There's no guaranteed check. You know, you're working harder. You're um, sometimes going days, you're working so many more hours. Yes, you have that freedom, you know, when you're running your business, but if you're not working, you're not making money. So until you get the hang of things, until you get your business up and running, you're going to put in a lot of work. And like I said, it can get discouraging, but when you have that support that we have, and I'm very, very fortunate for the people that I have around me that have helped me along the way, even when I first started. And sometimes it could be just something as simple that you might just need your parents, you know, uh, to help you when it comes to financially, just to give you that, you know, to get you started. And then after that, you just need guidance from someone that's been in that field. So I think that's one thing is resource is going to be the biggest thing to help women here. Powerful, powerful. Thank you, Rahula, for um, explaining all um, that. And uh, I, I definitely want to um, conclude um, our amazing panelists with just the last question, right? And it's always forward, right? Like we can have these discussions uh, on the um, on the points that we all hit and the uh, prominent issues, but how can we move forward, right? So I want to ask everybody on the panel, what is a clear plan of action, right? Like how do we how do we concise a clear plan forward to not only um, dictate and um, build, but to empower us to grind women to be entrepreneurs. Um, and I want to start with uh, Mr. Germain. Okay, thank you, Tini. <clears throat> well, to help you know our women to be entrepreneurs, uh, it was mentioned earlier that you know, like. Uh, it is good to tell that uh, business is not easy. There are up and downs. So the girl women, they have to be ready that, you know, like uh, to start a business, but they have to also realize that uh, uh, the fact there is up and downs. Number two is, you know, like they need determination. They have to uh, determine that, you know, I need to be in business. And uh, it is a man-dominated society, but they have to be determined that, you know, like they are equal with men in terms of, you know, opening, running a business. They have to have that commitment. They have to have that understanding. If they have that understanding, then it would be, I think, it would be easy, you know, uh, to achieve their goal, to start the business. And uh, resources are also very, uh, very important. And then we have to work together too. We need each other, you know, they have to work with men. Men have to work, you know, with women because it is a teamwork. Uh, we have to share, you know, uh, experiences. We have to share, you know, uh, ideas with them. And then we have to, they have to get a tool for opening a business and expanding a business. Like they have to go, you know, to conferences, trainings, 
and seeking of uh, financial, legal advices. Also, it might be good, you know, to uh, seek, you know, uh, consulting services. And uh, through these uh, mechanisms, you know, they can be ready to open a business and then they can be successful. By the way, in the US, you know, uh, most businesses, they fail in the first three years. Therefore, uh, Tagar women, you know, they have to be ready not to fail, you know, uh, in the first three years. Uh, and then they have to be determined. And then at the same time, you know, like they have to know the reality. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Germay. Um, I'll pass it on to Michael. What are ways and plans that we can empower our grind women to be um, entrepreneurs? I think there's uh, two two ways to look at it. There's short term and, and then there's long term. Um, in the short term, I think, you know, as soon as we hear like, a, like, for example, if I hear like my sister speak about an idea, if I hear a friend speak about an idea, um, we don't immediately shoot it down. We encourage it and ask them like questions on like, how would you imagine doing this? Like, it doesn't take like expertise in anything to envision what that idea looks like at the end. So we encourage the idea. We ask questions and we want to learn more. We stoke the curiosity just like we would with anything else. And then we're intentional about, um, you know, helping out like, hey, how can I help you make this a reality? Like as long as we're lending a helping hand, I think that's most important. And that's easy to do in the short term. All it takes is communicating. In the long term, Hilo really laid it out well. Um, we can encourage entrepreneurism by, you know, creating a small seed fund, um, investing in women. But at the same time, we also bring women in to be the people who are investing in women. Women are going to know what women's problems are. They're going to see unique opportunities to create businesses that I, as a man, and the rest of us men here would not see. For example, um, I know a woman in Dallas who started a whole company and is making, I think, you know, six-figure revenue within a year, uh, just designing specific tailored suit jackets for women that have pockets. Most of the time, women's suit jackets do not have pockets. It's a huge problem. No one solved it. She's doing it. And now she's making, you know, over, you know, 500K in revenue in her first year. Uh, so we just need to be intentional about making sure women are investing. And then they also are investing in other women because they'll see those opportunities. Uh, so that would be my last point. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll go ahead and ask Hilo uh, the last question. What are ways that we can empower our Tagai women to be more entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, I think both of our uh, team guests so far have laid it out really well. Um, I really want to just go back to that first point, which is I love what Mike said. Um, whatever opportunities or whatever risks we allow our boys to make, um, at an early age, we should do the same thing to our, give the same opportunity for our young girls as well. They should be able to take the same risk. Whatever you, this is to the parents. I think that's where fundamentally a lot of this also starts is at home. To all the parents that are on this call, um, to all the uncles, um, grandparents, whatever the case may be. If you have um, a boy and a girl that are in the same house, you should give them the same capacity to take the same level of risk. Do not stifle the growth of our young women. Confidence is so key. And I've learned that a lot in myself. And I've seen it a lot in the minority communities. When we lack the confidence, we show too much deference. Even if we are better, smarter, faster, stronger, it doesn't matter if we have the best idea in the room. If we don't have the confidence, we will never speak up. And I've seen that over and over again in many places. I've seen many African-Americans that are far more capable than I am, they just did not have the confidence because no one was there for them to, to look up to. They didn't have that example. So they didn't know that they were capable of doing it, even though they were far more superior in different you know, capacities. So I think to all the parents, I really encourage you because these are the things that we can control. We can control how we treat our young women and how we treat our young men. We can do that at home. So to me, let's start there. Let's do that. And then also, I love what Mike said, what we've done in TPN, which has made it a mandate. Like, it's not even something that people have to think about anymore. It is a part of the DNA that women and men have to have equal leadership opportunities. So I would encourage all the nonprofits, anybody that's on this call that's a part of a board, make sure your leadership team is made up of 50% women, 50% men, because that is how our society is. We're 50-50. 
we don't have 60% male and 40% women. So then why should the leadership position have such a lopsided balance? It just, the math, even any of you, the, the math just does not make sense, it's not balanced. I, that's, that's within our control. We could do that. And by doing that, now you're gonna inspire millions of, of young women. Um, to be to have the confidence to be able to do that because they see somebody that looks like them that's doing it. And then that's where you create the, the bridge of connection. So to me is, let's start with those controllables. And then as Mike and others have laid out, then we can go to the larger, bigger tasks that are ahead of us. And if we cannot do the small things the right way, you know, God is not going to give us bigger problems to solve. So <laughs> let's clean up and do the small things right. Um, and, I, and I think God will show us the rest of the way. Thank you, Hylan, for elaborating that. You took the words <laughs> out of my mouth. Um, Mr. Gitachugide, what are your thoughts on how we can empower our Tagayan women to be more entrepreneurs? Yeah. Um, yeah. So my point of view, so when I'm uh, specifically on the entrepreneurship, um, there are, you know, I will have to look at it in two ways again. Uh, one is the active kind of engagement where you manage a business, you do everything from scratch, right? And the other form of uh, uh, engagement is also passive, right? So we're not, uh, this is not part of the discussion. I, I have not heard that uh, in this discussion, but the passive is also another way because not everyone, uh, not everybody is ready to actively manage or engage in the business, right? So basically, if we want to grow the economic empowerment for people, we're going to have to look up from a broader perspective. So uh, in this aspect, right, so education awareness is key. So the way forward, you know, if we look at from a long term perspective, institutions like, you know, our communities, uh, so, for example, we created Tigray Global Chamber of Commerce recently, almost a year now, uh, and other similar organization, if they have, we need to engage with them. We need to participate and we need to make a resource available, easily available to them, you know, for free. And then, you know, if there is more technical uh, support needed, then we can direct them to a more knowledgeable consultants and stuff like that, right? So uh, this would be the main, a key in a business. You know, if we want to engage actively, take the uh, active management role, passion is a key. So mostly if you're passionate about something, you engage in that business, the likelihood of success is higher. So, uh, you know, I, I would like to our people to be passionate on something when they get into a business, not only the profit, but the passion. Because if you're passionate about something, you, you will work hard. Uh, that will determine your success, right? So versus uh, the other way around. But regardless, you know, if you want to be financially independent, then, you know, any available opportunity would be helpful. So uh, now from organization standpoint, I, I specifically um, uh, mentioned earlier, but uh, my business, Gateco Financial, um, also do a lot of tax accounting, business advisory uh, and consulting, several, uh, you know, a research I do, and they are also handy available, you know, basically all the study, the business plan or already um, turnkey business are available. So in any way I can, you know, any advice, any area of interest, you know, I can help as well. So, uh, but this is, everybody need to be actively engaged in this. It's not just a specific group of people responsibility, it's our responsibility, all of us. So if you work together, you know, network, I think the likelihood of uh, being successful together is potential. So uh, th this is my uh, point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Gita Chugide, um, for elaborating all that. 
Um, and I'll end it with also uh, Rahawa, right? As a business owner, as a Tigrayan woman, right? Like, what are ways that not only can we support um, our fellow Tigrayan women to be more entrepreneurs? Your question is, what are ways to support Tigrayan women to be entrepreneurs? I think um, w- there are several ways. I would definitely say like, you know, whenever you're having, um, I would say have like a get together, you know, uh, whether it's like um, happy hour, you know, at the community center or something that you put together. I think sometimes it's not just about having, you know, getting, I know sometimes with the pandemic and everything, some people haven't seen each other in a while and they just, you know, want to catch up on what's going on in life, but also check on your interests, what's going on in your life. One of the things I think our people uh, do uh, that is really heartbreaking is they don't talk about what's going on at home, whether it's financially, we don't know how to ask for help, you know, and sometimes the person next to you might have the answer that you need. But the problem is we don't do that. And we are the number, but when we actually, (laughs) the funny thing is we come together and we help each other no matter what, right? But we don't know how to ask for help. And I think that is detrimental to our success in our community because when we get together or when they have the coffee ceremony, everybody gets together, it's really important to talk about and, and normalize talking about what's going on at home. You know, what's going on in your finances? Do you like your job? You know, anything going on? We don't have to make it sound like everything is peachy. You know, we can talk about it. You know, we can be each other's therapists. That's what sisterhood is. To grind women right now more than any time uh, post, uh, since the war, we have come together. We have to, uh, we have learned to lean on each other. You know, uh, because we've gotten used to now or prior to this, we, you know, we've had friends that are either like from other parts of Ethiopia, Eritreans, whereas now we, this is it. This is all we have. We have each other, right? So we don't want to just come together um, and not being able to really trust that we can talk to each other. I think that is very important because what happens is if somebody, for instance, is going through a financial hardship and that is my friend, I want to know because I just might have an answer for them. You know, but I don't want it to be where, okay, you know, like the God, we don't talk about that, you know, like it's just something that we just don't talk about. And I think that is one of the biggest problems that we have that we really need to break apart because that right there is holding you back from your success or the answer to what you actually need because you're not going to find it on Google. You know, uh, certain things you're going to find it next door, you know, or it could be your own family members. We don't have to always have it together. It's okay to speak about our problems, our finances. I think to me that is so important because we can, even if I don't have an answer, I just might know somebody that does, you know? And I can say, you know what? Here's such and such number. I'm gonna connect you with them, you know? Because I think that's where it starts. And then helping each other through these things really, really matter to us because when we get together and we can make it, a point where this here is talking about how to start a business. So if we do like a, a women's happy hour or a community center or a church or wherever you want to do it, you know, designated spots, do it like, hey, this time we're going to talk about women in business. We're going to talk about, okay, the women that are already in business get to share their perspective of how business is going. Women that are thinking about it, this is your chance right now, your opportunity to talk about, you know, what, what are your passions? What do you want to do? Because guess what? That passion, somebody's looking for it and is willing to pay for that service. So I think just communication is big. And then follow through. I think following through is really important. We don't want to just talk about things. Like this is a great platform, but once the Zoom ends, we don't want to just go back to, you know, okay, like we did it, great. But what are we doing after that? You know, we want to connect with each other, exchange numbers, uh, whatever, and get together and see like, okay, hey, do you have this person? Like, I want to, I'm going to put my number in the chat. Whoever just wants to talk, it doesn't matter what it's about. I want to be able to see if I can help you in any kind of way, because if, if I don't, maybe I know somebody. That's what resources are for. This is why we have all these organizations, you know, because we have connections with other people that have different backgrounds that can help us, right? So following through, meaning like put a plan of action together, short-term goals. I think Mike mentioned that earlier. It's like, okay, in a month, let's see what can we can accomplish within the next few weeks. 
And just that we don't want to even just do bigger goals because sometimes, you know, we have distractions. We have real life going on that we just might put it aside and think, okay, we have time. You know, we want to do something and we want to follow through and make sure we execute within the next few weeks to a month. So I think those are really, really important communication and following through. Yeah, no, that was amazing. Thank you. And I, I think you hit a very, 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 very great point, right? Was it's not just about like talking and what we could do, right? Like these are action plans that if you're not already doing it, it's time to do it, right? So uh, this was an amazing panel. You guys are all great individuals. Um, I, I'm, I'm honored to even know some of you guys from a from not only from a, a friend standpoint, but also from, from a business standpoint, right? Like uh, I met a lot of you guys prior to TPN and during TPN. Some of you guys I met in Atlanta during the uh, leadership retreat. Um, we are amazing people, right? And not only are everyone is doing what they already do outside of this, but like this is what we're everyone's easily accessible right so whether for social media or through organizations like reach out myself included like i'm i i work also in the technology sector i'm also an educator i'm also a photographer right like i'm accessible you, you can reach out to me I, I i respond back like everybody wants to help each other this is why we're a part of these organizations this is why we do what we do um you know it's also to grab first but also everybody here uh leads with our heart Right. So um, thank you again for everybody for their uh, just for their time. Right. And and, and for their uh, well a, a explanation. Everyone here is very, very busy. So I definitely want to give my flowers to everyone that was a part of this panel. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can do this again very, very soon. Um, and until then, I think I just said. <laughs> Thank you, Vinny. Uh, that was a, a well conclusion at the end uh, and, and really amazing panelists. You guys are amazing in your own scopes. You know exactly some of the things that we're facing, the challenges that we have, and then how we can progress uh, moving forward. So uh, I am forever thankful of your presence and your, you sharing uh, some of the ideas that you shared with us. And we've, we've gotten this recorded. So I, I know I'm going back to listen to it a few times. Just just to make sure I soak in that information because it's important that we uplift the women of society of our culture um, with the theme of Ashanda being um, the idea here that we have to. It's, it's not even a choice. It's just mandatory that we have lift our um, one half of our segment, which is the women. Okay. I'll, I'll come. Let, me, uh, let me do this. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, with that appreciation, I want to move on to our uh, last segment, and, and I know we've delayed it a little bit, but it was such a great conversation. We didn't want to intervene and, and cut it short, so uh, thank you for everything that you shared. Um, and the next, uh, the next segment, this is the last segment that we have. Um, it's, it's it's going to be. Um, I know Ola is here. She has been waiting a, a very long time. She's been here with us all day. Uh, but I do want to share her. Uh, I'm Lahawi, uh, I'm Mohammed Kim, and Gabra Mask Al Mariam, who are here with us to um, share their insights and, 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 and their presentations. Uh, to start off, I'm going to do Alaba. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Alaba Wada Kahle. It's not Alaba Wada Mikael. But I, I want to I, I make sure I'm being sensitive to your name. Uh, I want to read your bio uh, first and then. You know, give you the chance to, to present. Uh, Alba holds an MS in Health Informatic from the Grand Canyon University in Arizona. She's an active member of the Tagai Human Rights Forum, PHRF. Um, Alba was born and raised in Tigray. Uh, expertise in gender based uh, programs and healthcare management. Alba is passionate about indigenous cultures, uh, primarily the most popular Tigrayan festivity. Uh, festival, festivity, which is a shenda. Uh, I was also an active participant of uh, to that causes, and I've known Alva for a very, very long time, and, and I can attest to all of what I've just read. Uh, she's been an advocate for today, and and she has showed up time and time again, uh, whether it's on social media or in person. Um, the second person I want to read their bio. I just want to get out of the way before we get uh, the the panelists come on and and kind of present their um, their presentations is Amlahawit Amahamed Hin, uh, born and raised in Ottawa Tigray, uh, DSC in electrical engineering from Bahadur University, Ethiopia. 
uh, MSc in Computer and Information Science from North Carolina Central University, North Carolina, uh, US, and a former lecturer at Mo'ala University and research associate at North Carolina Central University, uh, currently a full-time mom uh, to her beautiful boys. And so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be uh, in, in company of you. And then lastly, we will have Gavramaskar Gavramariam, who is a Tigrayan human rights activist. Uh, I don't have his bio, but I'll have him introduce himself uh, lastly. So Alba, please, the floor is yours. I know you waited. You look beautiful today. And and, and go ahead and, and, and take it away. Alba, thank you, my brother, Danny. Uh, I feel like so special. And then overwhelmed to be last panelist and then presenter with a lot of great information I overloaded with the business, with the cultural background of Tigray, with everything. It was amazing. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for inviting me today for this wonderful event organized by the Tigrayan. Uh, community forum. I am honored and uh, very humble um, and I feel special to be part of this uh, special occasion uh, for my very, very favorite Ashenda events. And then thank you, Katz, for inviting me. I am uh, uh, representing today one of the Tigrayan communities, the Women's Foreign Committee, and is part of the Wa'ala Tagaru. So, um, very, very, uh, I'm very, like, fascinated by uh, the presenters, professor. Uh, I, I'm not good with names, so I have to call you by your first name, Dan. I'm sure I'm gonna miss it up if I say the last name. So very, very apologies, <laughs> Mr. Dunn. And then very, um, it is like awakening, mind awakening, the curry. I did not um, really comes to my mind that the curry woman, the curry tagaru is very important into our daily, um, Lives. Uh, that was amazing. You took me back to my grandma, uh, the style of the nun, and then the whole ceremony. Yeah, I was reminding all my grandma's uh, moments. And then uh, Professor Walbert, uh, it was very alarming to think about, um, and then very timing to think about the space of women in a liberty is all presentation is like gathered into my, it's enlightened my presentation really, as soon as it's part of it. Uh, and then that's uh, amazing to think about it. Uh, Dr. Hagos is mentioned about the different names and then cultures and then values of Ashenda Maria and an Ainwari that's very, uh, very meaningful and then very resourceful as well. Dr. Hagos is, I call him my quick Google. Google, when I need it, any resources to think about even like to ask quickly like this. Uh, and then like our generations, like amazingly like business entrepreneurs, uh, like I had like aha moments. Oh, yeah, the beauty and then the culture, how to elevate it to the next level as a business or entrepreneurs, like, oh, what I'm gonna do with that? That's a big assignment to me. So I'm not sure if I see myself as an entrepreneur, but I will think about it. Something is like sharply like hit my mind really quick. And then um, Dr. Azib was uh, a really, that's mainly my focus and then my really deep presentation I have to have in a mention. She explained it each and 
everything like amazingly. The cultural trauma, the cultural trauma is something nobody noticed, but killed us really silently. When we when we think about when we Ashanda every year comes, we normally used to celebrate happily, dressing up, braid our hairs, put all the accessories. But uh, since the war initiated in Tigray since uh, 20, November 4, 2020, I observed our Tigrayan woman kind of down and then take it a uh, kind of excuse not to celebrate the culture and then not give uh, enough attention to the cultural phenomena. We have to raise it up. We have to use it as a form of a uh, healing process, as a form of voice to, the, to our women back in Tigray in a lockdown siege. Uh, and then they feel so bad not to celebrate it. That's a kind of cultural shock. Uh, not shock, but trauma. The, the shocking way of trauma to shut down, not to see in a bright level, in a bright future, in a very meaningful way. So today, even though I am very deep hurting and then uh, saddened and then sorrowing and then uh, with the all um, what's going on, the crisis in Tigray, but outside I'm shining with my beloved and a very favorite culture of Tigran. We own it, we possess it, Ashenda. So this whole outfit, you can see my background is Ashenda Tigray. I'm sorry, Mr. Dan, you can read it, but Tigrinya, it says Ashenda Tigray. Uh, my background set up like ahead of time, like few months, everything, social media, everything, my mind, things start thinking about Ashenda in Tigrinya. It is even my way of thinking process starts in Tigrinya, thinking. So it's not easy for me to think about or to say or to talk about Ashenda. Well, long conversation, short. Uh, thank you for everyone, Dr. Akilu, Dr. Tlahun, uh, my idol woman, teacher Zuriash, um, Professor Fortin, Dr. Azib. I grew up watching Dr. Fortin at McLean University while I was a, a law student. Uh, she was our uh, very leading and a superb, strong woman. So um, it is a pleasure to attend in an honor to attend you all. Uh, well, I am going to share my presentation. I did not prepare it in the slightest because uh, the topic is so wide. And then I was uh, trying to do PowerPoint. It just ended up like over 50 slides. So <laughs> I said like, oh, this is a waste of time. Let's like uh, summarize it in a, uh, the way it is. Okay. There is. Why open so many documents? I believe this one is. Okay. Can you all see this? Can you see? It? Uh, no. Uh, can you double click it? I would be. Oh, uh, unexpectedly, why? Okay. Hey, wait. Send to Zoom. Your screen is sharing actually, but it's not displaying it. Okay, uh, can you see? 
Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, uh, Alwa. But uh, go go to that green button at the bottom of uh, the Zoom. Yeah. And then share your screen. It should allow you to do it. Yes, that's what I'm doing. But it, it is um, something. I it's it's the co-host uh, privilege. Yeah, you have, I think, to put me. Perfect. We can see it now. Oh, you can see it. OK. Perfect. OK. So, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Again, yeah. My name is uh, Ababa Waldetakhla. I raised in and born in Tigray. Um, yeah, uh, my brother Danny explained my bio perfectly, so I don't have to repeat. Uh, the title I have for today is, um, this is for the Center for Advancement, CAT, uh, the National Conference for Ashenda, Ainuari and Anamaria. Uh, the title I have today is, it's something related to my educational background, which is legal matters. Uh, which takes my time focused on the rights of women. Uh, it was not easy to shorten the statements. So Ashenda, rooted as um, a cultural endeavor, and then how the Tigrayan rights uh, we use in Ashenda, the women's right. So different... Um, Communities worldwide celebrate uh, occasions and uh, significant historical acts or cultures. Uh, but today in Tigray, the one African country which is the broad with um, a lot of uh, <coughs> cultural backgrounds, uh, the, the gender based violence is uh, a very high impact out there, uh, not only due to the war currently going on, but overall as uh, one of sub-Saharan countries, uh, women's violence and gender-based uh, violence and discrimination is against women is so high in general. Uh, when it comes like, let's think, just my heart is reaching to think about the word Ethiopia, but since it is part of the historical background. I have to mention it, uh, it is part of the Ethiopian uh, communities in general. Uh, there is high discrimination and violence against women. So when it comes to um, uh, Tigray, uh, the um, immense discrimination in and sexual violence, especially in the Tigray community with the border of Eritrea. Uh, seeing as Tigray is a border of Eritrea, it is in several occasions, a lot of massive violence witnessed in Tigray genocide. Uh, while the Ethiopian in an Eritrean forces uh, used rape and uh, gender violence against women as a, a weapon of war and uh, a valuable tool erasing deeply embedded cultures of Tigray women to destroy one of our culture is the, the means of the use is to rape our women. That's very heart-wrenching and um, painful to explain. It was not easy for me. However, I have to do it. Serious issues. Uh, resilience and strength of the women of Tigray. I'm here uh, to be a voice uh, for the lockdown women and then for the violated women back in Tigray. Uh, I might take my time uh, a little bit slowly. Uh, um, stop me if you do not understand or miss something or uh, at some moments, uh, Involving myself emotionally, but uh, hopefully not. Um, today, I am here to speak about their rights, about their pains, violences going on currently as we speak in Tigray. Ethiopia and an Eritrean forces 
are raped and violated as a weapon of war. Right. Venus, the war started on November 4, 2020. This is uh, caused by a kind of uh, numerous reasons, but one of it is the poverty of way of thinking. It's not only resources, the poverty of way of thinking. They raped women for generation and generation as a weapon of war, particularly in the Tigray region, as a poverty of the, their way of thinking. It's not only resources or it's not only lack of education, it's way of thinking. And then uh, the distance from home, the school also, those are one of the ways women can rape and then violate. Lack of facilities, early marriage is part of also uh, a way of rape, like early marriage, unwanted. Forcible, firstly, marriage. Where gender violence is prevented, women apply different means, likely socially constructed culturally norms to challenge general societal structure practices and injustice. Those are the moments of injustice, inequality, and then a kind of shutdown of women's voice not to be heard as a way of one way is to rip and then mix them down, not to speak. They are pains. Uh, overall today, since we, I say this uh, introduction a little bit about, <clears throat> the other way to, they use rip against women and then violence is the gender by violence using the a kind of a challenge to the general social constructed practices injustice. Additionally, it's a structural marginalized forced violence to significantly affecting their rights and in the lives of the society. A woman is one of the backbone of the community, the Tigrayan community. Affecting her life means affecting the community. So if a woman is a backbone of the family, a family is a backbone of a community. So means affecting the whole society in general. At marginalized level, the Tigrayan people take them down structurally, culturally, and then overall their lives. They also find approach to help reduce structural, uh, marginalized force violence. As I said, Tigrayan women successfully use Ashenda, uh, also called Maria or Ainuari, as traditional liberation for Tigray women to overcome in and fight issues such as oppression in an injustice manner described as joyous. So like as introduction level, as I explained a little bit about the violence, one of the mechanisms Chigrayan women use to explain their way of oppression or a kind of strike in a beautifully manner to fight for their rights, to use it, the Ashanda festivity through their way of music, through their prizes. They use this culture as part of a strike or to express their feelings. So Ashanda is not only to celebrate for the festivity, but also it can creates and then clears the roads for a change 
and for injustice moments to stop there by the way of song or singing or um, praising way of their songs to kind of indirectly manipulate the injustice system of what is going on at the ground level. And then also Ashenda is one of uh, the way of um, means to use a tool of to create a peace. Woman seeks a peace in in a different ways. No woman needs unpeaceful or unhappy moments in their lives. So Ashenda is, it is beyond the culture. It is part of the woman's right to express their feelings, their oppression, injustice systems for a good purpose to eliminate that injustice crisis into a brutal rights and justice and unfairness to be happening in all women's life. So that means the grand women use agenda to fight against uh, social discrimination, gender violence, and then gang raping by Eritrean forces and in the Ethiopian region and in other additional forces who are attacking women seen as the war started by raping and then physically, emotionally damaging. The culture helps people appreciate women, respect their bodies, and create an environment for women to thrive despite numerous challenges. This report aims to reflect on Tigrayan's national heritage to understand the role of <clears throat> agenda culture in promoting the freedom of women. <clears throat> on agenda, women has a freedom of speech, movement, and then whatever a source, uh, a way of means to explain or to do some sort of their change something, a change they really want to be happen. The study uh, as a objectives, agenda cultural known as a way of initiating a healing process. It's our healing process also. Uh, one of uh, the things I would like to mention to my Tigrayan woman, please do not feel guilty to put the outfit is you like. Do your hair. Put the jewelry you, you like and then gives you a sense of your heritage, a sense of your root. That's part of the healing process. That shows the indigenous Tigrayan people who are strong and then resilient to show in the these tough moments as a resilient people, a resilient woman. So do not feel guilty to put your outfits on in a time of Ashenda. Ashenda is not only, it's not only for Ashenda, but every day. The pain is in, inside of us, but we have to smile and then walk through, to speak up, to stop this violence against women and then not put our heads down. To cause a cultural trauma. That's what they want. And then when we traumatized, they will claim that culture belongs to them. Maybe they can go take it to a higher level to register to at the UNESCO. That's what happened. And then the what's that what they tried to do. But not really, not to happen since we are alive. So Ashenda is also a healing process for population that experiences genocidal scares 
or Tigrayans. Aspects of Tigray culture. What are the aspects of a Tigrayan culture? Tigray is the most richest in a uh, very glamorous culture, rich people. We have it. Tigray is a community with a rich cultural heritage and a music. I uh, have to smile when I say that. Yes, indeed. We Tigray is the cultural heritage, dance and music. We possess it, we own it, and then we are the source. The community is known as for using drums and other instruments to create unique aspects of music and culture. Yes, we are the source of Saint Yorit, who is the one creates, I guess, the music uh, is Tigraya. So we are the source. They even play secular music with traditional horizon background, while their religious songs are performed through the Orthodox Church casting approach. Tigray is often associated with foundation of, I would say, the Ethiopian civilization with a landscape full of history moments. In this case, numerous cases of virtual occur in Tigray in the Tigray community, where most of their ancient and historical aircrafts were destroyed. Some examples of virtualities in Tigray include destruction of Zalambasa. So when they try to distract, when they distract the rail in Tigray, when they walk to war against Tigray, they have a purpose because Tigray is the source of civilization of Ethiopia and some other neighbors country. I have to say this confidently strongly and loudly. They have a purpose. This is not the first war they walked against Tigray. This is a continuously ongoing war. It was our grandparents told us what happened in the past. And then I have seen it. This is my second war. I am seeing it right now in my life, the dark region and then now. Tigray has been distracted and uh, currently distracting by continuously, I call them enemies of the Tigrayan source in culture, heritage, and the race. Because Tigray is the source. Again, they have a reason. When we say that Tigray is a foundation of civilization with landscape in a historical moments. That's why the example of virtualities in Tigray destruction. One of them is Zalambasa, located in eastern Tigray, and Asimba in the same region, both of which were bombed and destroyed by Eritrean soldiers. The region continued to rule Ethiopia until Tigray Liberation Front rejected to total region in 1991. So they have a cause. This is not the first time, but happening right now. Eritrean soldiers also burned and destroyed a church where about 61 civilians lost their lives. That's Dr. Hagosabai resource and reference I use. You can find it on his uh, um, some uh, sermons and in, uh, interviews he has been conducted in the past. The horrific aspects of uh, this was killing of three sons of uh, and trying the father to watch three days, which was only possible through the help of Tigrayan people. The numerous battles and in violence against Tigrayans in the region mainly affected women through sexual violence in gang rapes. They, they use it, the women's body, as part of uh, 
a weapon of war. Promoting agenda is one of the prominent and prestigious rights of passage for girls and women. It is vital to consider the importance of culture in promoting peace, coexistence, and in reducing violence in Tigray. So we call today Ashenda. Uh, it is way a little bit is beyond the normal Ashenda celebrated annually. It is beyond that. We have to describe why Ashenda is now needed to explain the woman's right to stop the violence, to seek peace. We women need peace at any circumstances, at any time, at any moment. So Ashenda is now comes to my favorite um, topic that, so now the introduction part is uh, done. I am a little bit to say about the Ashenda, the cultural ceremony. Why I'm here right now like this, maybe some of you can think, oh, what she looks like. Doll kind of girl. Um, her background, what is that? That's Ashenda. When you call it Ashenda, as it is explained by Dr. Hagos very um, carefully and meaningfully, um, has its own meaning. It's, it, it usually celebrates a week of uh, August, weeks of August in Tigray. 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 The con I can't say the region. Tigray is a country already. Since Tigray is a source of all the cultures and heritage are all. I send a beautifully culture for Tigray because it applies artistic appeal, creates artistic beauty. It establishes within the society. It's generational. We did not create a gender right now. I can say myself, my great, great, great grandparent, grandma, she passed away at the age of 130 years. She passes that culture to my second grandma with a special outfit of Ashenda. This is your culture. Please pass it on to the new generation. That comes an example in my family. It stays over a hundred years. Ashenda stays with me, in me. I feel the ownership of Ashenda as Tigrayan. It belongs to Tigrayan. It is a source, even though it disseminated to the other part of Ethiopia. We Tigrayans are the source of Ashenda. We are the creatures of Ashenda. It belongs to us. No matter what happening right now, we cannot take it down. So I cannot take it down, even though I'm living the pain of my people back home. Currently in a lockdown siege, in a war, no food, no electricity, no water, no bank. I'm not happy inside me, but I have to show what is the agenda culture mean to the society, to the beautiful people, to the beautiful women of Tigray. That shows our resilience and strength. Yes, we have to celebrate it as it's, it's supposed to be the braid, the outfit, the goggle, the necklace, the kuticha, the duty, and then the amber, the ring. This all has a meaning and then it's a healing process that hinders various issues and then hinders popularity to the international community to see the festival of Ashenda. Once it is ignored by media, television, however, we have to take it up loud to show the world who we are, what we own, what we possess, what we currently are as a community. Now, that's why I'm full of agenda. Not exactly, I can't say the full culture, 
dress up, but I'm trying to be. This is what it looks. Cindy, that represents the girls. So today I am here as a grown woman to represent the girls of Tigray. That's their traditional, that's their culture. And then the international scene the international media in and families ignored about the violence against women in Tigray. We have to applaud and then the voice for the voiceless of women locked down in Tigray by showing the beloved culture, the beloved, their heritage of Ashenda. So uh, besides the shadows, the analysis failed to present a detailed picture of the culture, does not fully represent the artistic value as artistic gender morals and an implications. There is a need to explain both oral, material, artistic, traditional associated with Tigrayan traditions. That's what we have to claim it. That is the respect of our gender morals, to be known as a Shinda girl, to be known as a Shinda woman, to not feel guilty celebrated it. That's how we raise our voice to the international community. Well, since the gender-based managers of songs in and poems in Ashenda traditions in and festivals, there are numerous artistic and um, physical expressions applied to festival that requires through explanation. It shouldn't be noted even though a gender festival occurs once a year. It stays for years out there. The music we sing a song right now, we got it from our generation. We got it our great, great, great parents. Even though they criticize for some administration issue, that song stays for generations right there as a change, as a means of change, as a means of oppression, and then as a claim of peace, seeking for a peace. So the harmonies, drums, and in singing way of Ashenda is not only for festivity, but also it helps for a change and then creates harmony and peace among a community or society or neighborhood countries. Empowers women in an girls in restrictive society where women usually feel oppressed and expected to be insubordinated. Well, in case Ashenda helps inspire and in empower girls and in women in society, especially to stand for their rights and in fight for equality. Here is a very, um, very interesting point I can focus on. Ashenda is not only a festivity for Tigrayan women. As a society, as a culture, uh, a little bit make um, unspeakable or not to express women their feelings or their pains or their uh, way of ideas to share with everyone. But in Ashenda time, at Ashenda time, women and girls are free to express their freedom rights as they have a right and then they have to show the equality of their gender, gender equality. They can be a leader among their own group. They can be a cheer uh, woman, speak, sing, dance freely and then they can stand for their rights. Uh, through their music in a way of dance and an expression to the society. Ashenda uses similar songs in a cultural content, all but some areas. It has different names, as I say, Maya, Ainwari, even though the dates are different, even though a sort of the background of their uh, stories are different. However, one thing 
makes them all together the same. They are girls are uh, festivity and then they are girls power and then the, the way of singing, the way of how we braid our hair, the whole culture. So traditionally, as I said, every year on August, Ashanda celebrates uh, approximately from the 13th to 29th of August in all areas of Tigray, Ashanda celebrates. Uh, what Ashanda do, as I say, uh, my entrepreneur um, young generations were explaining about Ashanda the beauty and then the culture, how to take it to the uh, next level of entrepreneurship at the business. Well, yeah, Ashenda, the woman in and girls purchase fashionable clothes, cosmetics, adornments, including kohli, that's the eyeliner, uh, and think ornaments. Uh, they also purchase a kind of hina uh, to put the, to decor their hand. They prefer uh, they prepared as me as a milky cream. It's better to put in and moisturize their hair. Uh, the girls in and women prepare local herbs to make uh, some attractive aroma smells, which apply clothes and they put on their clothes. This is also the clothes, uh, the jewelry, the earrings. Uh, everything is that's a very indigenous cultural um, phenomena like a source and it's very unique you can find it in Tigray so that's how to uh, lead that in a managed way of um, to the next level of fashion we can do that also uh, and then um, girls in Gaza elect a leader who manages their way of teaching groups conduct uh, dances coordinate as a group events for entire festival week. Uh, the group also select one member of, uh, collect store gifts and then receive from people in terms of money, food, drinks. Uh, they don't, it's not really a source of their income. It's, uh, they play in and praise in and sing to show the culture, but not really, uh, to get, uh, more money. It's just the way if they get the price, that's fine. Uh, they can help their, uh, or give that money to their community in need. Uh, most of they give it to the church or let's say this year we give to the, uh, violence, uh, to the women who are a victim of this, uh, uh sexual violence back into, right? Um, that's, uh, uh, a way of, uh, the ceremonies, uh, well, uh, this is more the cultural, and then we praise, as you say, Ashanda is not only stood up for their rights, uh, or to express their, uh, the injustice, uh, feeling or happening occurrence, uh, or any conducts, um, but also to praise their community, to praise, uh, the people, the society. Uh, like, uh, when you handed them money or a bread, Kambasha, we call it, or suwa, that's, uh, uh, or honey wine, a kind of homemade, uh, uh, our drinks, alcohol, like traditionally, uh, normally you cannot give to underage girls, it, it just for the culture. Um, they praise the song. The gifts are putting like faces, uh, hasa, we call it. The gift is our, it's very hard to translate to English, but I'm trying my best. First, uh, uh, means like the, the gift is our pouring, uh, like the rains of August. Uh, August is the most rainy month in, uh, Tigray. Uh, what is, uh, uh in a, what is, uh, uh, Lordship has given me while be enough for a year. Uh, what her, uh, leadership has given me will be enough for a year. Uh, first, uh, her main has, uh, and then we praise that to the society, uh, the community, or uh, the people, the elders, who show, and then, uh, humble us with the gifts. Uh, that's a kind of, uh, the great passion, uh, a different style of, uh, 
way of singing, jumping, running, uh, and I don't know, we call it. Uh, whatever, uh, we're so excited. So I'm one of these girls who is uh, very passionate and uh, happy and then um, sing all day in and 24 hours for Ashenda. Uh, but at the same time, we praise and then we criticize if uh, someone rejects to be nice to us, uh, to the Ashenda girl, not to give a gift. Instead, uh, they try to degrading them or down them with something, uh, unnice words and then unhappy uh, moments. Uh, Ashenda girls also express their feelings with the criticism, uh, tries to oppose their songs. Uh, the girls sing typically song to show they are free to sing anything during the festival. Yeah, Ashenda, uh, on Ashenda, a girl does not have a judge. Uh, she's, uh, a girl is wild, uh, free, and then, um, liberates their own, uh, um, rights to speak up uh, to do whatever they want and when i say to do whatever they want is take in terms of the action of way of expression not really instruction uh the um precise well, a person you uh, is that a judge to ashenda girl for <laughs> like as I said, it's very hard to, that's the hardest moment I found <laughs> translate into English. When the festival almost comes to an end, the types of songs changes to express anger. And nostalgic uh, uh, if that agenda is ending, for instance, it's uh, common for girls to sing the following verses when uh, the festival approaches to the last days. Ashenda, Ashenda, my flower is going. Khadet, Khadet, Ashenda, Bre, Khadet. Ashenda, Ashenda, my silver is going. Abil Ashida, Nina, and the Khaida Ada, Samwana. Please, Father, or a priest, help me to stop Ashenda from going. Abil Ashida, Nina, the Khaida Ada, Samwana. Ashenda is going for we have no one to stop it. Girls go crazy today. Ashenda Halifa, Bizabandere, we anu we anu Kadim Kevin. Ashenda is going to her country. I don't know where is her country. I believe it's Tigray. <laughs> but that's a way of singing. I'm always like laughing at myself. Like <laughs> uh, sometimes we consider the Ashenda Ashenda festivity is like a type of girl who were a friend for us for the days of the festivity. So we just uh, <laughs> accompany her to somewhere she's going. Uh, so the songs and poems are used to reflect ideas learned by girls from their mothers and an elder sisters. As I say, my great, great, great grandma, she passed away at the age of 130. And then my second grandma at 110. And then my first grandma at 100. Ashenda outfit. The outfit of Ashenda transfers, like trans, like pass it on from generation to generation. So when I say Ashenda belongs to me, it is with a reason in a loud voice that the source of Ashenda is integral, integral. I, I'm like, I cannot be sure with so many things, but I can be sure with one thing. Is it? source of agenda because I was um when I was a kid I was in uh, some parts of Ethiopia the Amhara region my parents were um traveling for work we've been staying there for a few years nobody knows agenda nobody I was crying every year even though I was a little girl that was in a time of the transition between drug and then the TPLF regime. It was on a war. Uh, I couldn't, you know, understand in you know, other things, particularly since I was a very, very little girl. But Ashenda was something I cannot miss. 
I used to cry for Menzies to send me back to Tigray while I ask my friends, schoolmates, my neighbors, celebrate Ashenda, which they never heard for. And then they did not know. That's the moment I know Ashenda belongs to Tigray on top of additionally my great, great grandmothers were passing on that agenda in a serious level in Tigra, in my home. Uh, overall, like, uh, this is, as I say, overall, um, uh, the agenda festival needs to be embraced or promoted in the country in and receive national recognition. Give girls and young women a chance to address Gender-based violence is the main key point today. I'm here to present. Shenda is known for years. Nobody can take it or down it. But today, we got some issue back in Tigray. There is a war. Women are raped, violated, distracted. Their properties, their children killed. Their fertility being erupted or erupted or damaged not to have a new generation to replace their identity. Today, I'm here to call to stop the gender violence happening in Tigray. My voice is so loud. The international community has to respect for any gender, any woman, regardless where from, where as, as a woman, any violence happening against women, it does not have to be a family, a friend, or common Russian something to open my mouth to be against that violence. So the international community has to give a value, attention for all the women, regardless of the color, religion, poor or rich, um, developing countries or developed, doesn't matter. When a gender violated, when a woman's body used as a weapon of war, they should open their mouths to stop it. Stop it is stopping. Today, the gender violence, the violence against women, the rape, the gang rapes by Eritrean, Ethiopian forces, and then some other alliance going on in Tigray, it could happen tomorrow. I am living here in the safest country in the United States of America. That's what I think. But if no one speaks about it, it could happen today here in the very freedom country in the United States. So today, again and again, I'm calling to the international community to stop this gender violence currently going on in Tigray. Tigray, located in the northern part of aching my heart, but to say it, in the border of Eritrea, in the northern part of Ethiopia. Everyone knows this gender violence against Tigray again has to stop it. Today, it is a gender. Our women, our girls in Tigray are locked down with no medical facilities, medications, treatments. Even they do not have UTI antibiotics, which we can buy it here over the counter of in a pharmacy out there. They can be bleeding, be painful, be hurt. So, I'm hurt. This is in a my body of that. So all the Chikai women raped, harassed, and ignored not to be here. A member of the United Nations woman of the United Nations 
my parents were. Here's the American parents, they paying thousands of money every year for donation, but they ignored about my work. To be a voice to stop this violence. As of today, I quit my membership. This is in a memory of them. Tigrayan woman, the indigenous and then the source of the culture, the resilience, the strong woman of Tigray. Tigray shall rise from the ashes. The woman, they gonna smile again. I am smiling. I am dressing the full agenda of me. So, even though my inside is right. Thank you so much. Thank you for the singing. And I'm so sorry for this emotional thousand. Hopefully tomorrow will be another day. We can celebrate with a smile. Thank you once again. Thank you, uh, Alafi. Um, I know it's very, very hard to make that presentation in the way that you did. It's just emotionally taxing. And then um, I, I admire your courage. I do want to pass it to uh, my sister Fadila, uh, who's going to carry on participating the, the rest of the, the panelists from here on out. And welcome, Fadila. Thank you, Danny, um, for the introduction. And thank you, Ababa. That was an amazing presentation. Um, it was very emotional. And I especially appreciated your message of hope and encouragement to Tigrayan women diaspora to still dress up and show their culture and support of women and in an act of you know resilience on behalf of our people back home. Um, so we still have two more panelists for you guys here today. Next I would like to introduce Amlak Awit Man going to give a presentation on the topic of the Ashanda girl and um, revolving around lamination and hope. Um, so Amlak Awit you have about minutes to present your speech and I will now pass the floor to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Amda Kamis Madhan. Um, today, I am here with uh, a personal reflection of Ashenda, while the Ashenda girl, the woman of Tigray, is entering an active genocide. Uh, the title of my presentation is Ashenda girl. Uh, I can show, right? Yeah. Yes. This is the title of my presentation, Ashenda Girl, Lamentation and Hope. For a long time now, all I can think of is her, my sister, the young mother of the crime. And now that is Ashenda time, even more so. As you can see, my sister, the strongest and the most resilient woman I know, the, the strongest and the most resilient woman I know has lost control and fallen unconscious. In the very streets, she used to come out and celebrate Ashenda. I know her spirit won't, but her body has succumbed to the unrelenting brutality she has been subjected to for the past few years. My sister has been forced to leave the care of her baby daughter to no one. And we you know how kind and overprotective my sister is to the neighborhood children, let alone her own little one, you will know why I am living with this deep cutting pain and I am not able to take off this image of my mind. This was supposed to be her week. This were supposed to be the few days in a year. She should have been devoted to herself, to her beauty and her joy. She should have been gracing her hometown with her breathtaking beauty. She should have been losing herself in the moment with overpowering joy and unashamedly showing off how beautiful and free-spirited she inherently is. She should have been dancing and singing Ashenda, Ashenda Ade in the streets of Ma'ala, Macho, Adgrat, Abiyadi, Adwa, 
Aksum, Shura, Sharraro, Humara, and in every other little towns and villages of Tigray. She should have been beautifying her little girl with kuhli, jewels, fancy traditional hairdo, and what have you to get her ready for anywhere. I should have been scanning social media to catch one more glimpse of my beautiful sister, adorned with her heart melting smile. I should have been waiting for her calls and texts with overwhelming anticipation. She should have been sending me snapshots and catching me up on the highlights of the holiday. I should have been telling her, I am so delighted for her, but I am feeling down because I am homesick. I would have told her I miss her and I miss home so much. And she would have comforted me the way sister always does. She would have known to say the right thing to lift my spirits up and get me laughing out loud in no time. You see, Ashenda is my sister's absolute favorite time of the year. And she should have been doing all the above and much more, but she isn't. Instead, my sister is in a refugee camp in a foreign land, depending on the kindness of strangers for her food and shelter. She's been forced to free from her home with nothing except the clothes on her back. Worse, I hear that her family is not poor. She does not know the whereabouts of her loved ones, including her own children. She does not know whether most of her family members are, and friends are alive or not. She is in an IDP camp with no sustainable access to any life-sustaining necessities, weakened and emaciated from hunger, illness, and trauma. She has been chased out of her home, leaving everything she has worked for her entire life behind her property, her business, her farm, her crops, and her livestock has been looted and destroyed. Her home has been burned down. She has heard several of her family members have been massacred before they got a chance to flee. Her daughters have been brutally raped right in front of her eyes. She has been sexually violated herself as she is. She is living in a state of shock. She is anguished. She has borne trauma and witnessed atrocities no human being should have. She is numb from the unimaginable loss and grief she has suffered, yet not even gotten a chance to properly mourn and process. She is in safe houses and shelters beset by the unfathomable physical, emotional, and mental trauma she has sustained. She has been subjected to the most cruel, barbaric, and horrifying sexual violence our world has witnessed in recent history. She has been tortured, gang raped, and kept as a sex slave. She was raped in front of her family members. She is an extremely high physical pain. She has contracted HIV AIDS and other sexually transmitted diseases from the rapists. She has gotten pregnant from the soul. The barbaric and savage rapists have put foreign substances, including hot rods and nails inside her. She has not gotten basic help or treatment for the physical, emotional and psychological injuries she have been inflicted upon her because they have looted and destroyed the healthcare systems that could have served her. Then they put her under siege so that more help wouldn't reach. She is helplessly watching her severely malnourished and ill children in the MPT hospitals and healthcare centers of Tigray 
which offer no help because they have run out of therapeutic food and basic medication due to the pillage and siege. She has become a target of weaponized starvation along with her own family and her entire community by the government which was supposed to protect them. My generous and kind sister has nothing to offer to her own hungry children. Of all the unimaginable and horrifying acts of cruelty she has been subjected to over the past 21 months, I hear that this has become the most unbearable one. Of course, I knew it would. What could be more insufferable to any mother than being forced to watch her children suffer and die from starvation? Words fail to even attempt to express her anguish, her bone crushing pain, her desperation and agony. So there you see her, my sister, collapsed helplessly, leaving her baby girl unattended. Her unconscious and worn out self bearing witness to the complicity, silence and indifference of the world in the face of this ultimate evil, as much as the immeasurable cruelty and brutality of the barbarians. Mind you, my sister was not weak or helpless. On the contrary, she is among the most resilient, industrious, and self-reliant woman you could ever have known. You see, before the agents of death and destruction visited her home, my sister was this formidable doctor, engineer, a teacher, economist, and what have you who endeavored to serve her community and support her family. She was not only self-sufficient, but she supported her uncles and aunts along with her elderly family. She was a university professor, a researcher, a scientist with boundless dreams and aspirations. She was educated abroad. She could have chosen to stay and make living there like me, but she was more selfless and brave than I was, and chose to go back and serve her community. She was an aspiring entrepreneur, a businesswoman, a manager, an administrator, a CEO. She was more than self-sufficient. She had enough saving in the banks and investment incomes to last her and her family more than a lifetime. She was a daily laborer, a waitress, a maid, a clerk, a chauffeur, a street vendor, and you name it, who religiously believed in hard work and self-reliance and made sure her children were well-felt, well-dressed, and were attending the best school she can afford, even if it meant she had to work hard from pre-down to way after dusk. Make no mistake. Make no mistake, my sister is not starving. She is being starved. The end the world is letting it be in the year 2022. She, her children, and everyone who's been depending on her are going hungry because the genociders had killed her sons, her husband, her brothers, and raped herself her daughters and sisters, all with the intentions that of draining her economic support system, among other things. They bombed, shelled, looted, burned, and destroyed her home, her farm, her crop, her livestock, and every other source of her livelihood. They looted and destroyed the, her place of work, her business, her private property, and the public infrastructure that served her. They looted and destroyed the health care facilities in her area. They burned, looted, vandalized, and destroyed her children's schools. After they successfully engineered man-made famine via this state-sponsored genocidal campaign, then they put her under a complete blockade with no access 
to her own money in the banks, electricity, fuel, transportation, communication, humanitarian aid, basic health care, medication, and all other life-saving and life-sustaining services and commodities. My sister is not weak, not by a long shot. I implore you not to imagine her so. That would be adding another layer of injustice to the one she has been bearing. That would be cruel, that would be unkind. Unrelenting act of cruelty of the authors and perfectors of the great genocide, complicity of the majority of the world and indifference of the rest is the reason you see her like this. That all energy has been drained out of her and that she has collapsed in the streets that she should have been celebrating Ashenda now is a testament to the fact that the world had turned blind eyes and deaf ears to her pain, desperation, and agony. This image stands witness to the heart-wrenching reality that not only has the world failed her and her children, but it has failed humanity once more again. My sister is not the weak one. Weak is the world which lets this happen to strong, self-sufficient, peace-loving women like her. Weak is the world which abandoned its responsibility willingly. So, because global, political, humanitarian, and human rights leaders chose to ignore her pain, loss, and suffering, and cozy up with genociders, my sister is bearing pain of a degree and kind unimaginable to the rational mind. And I ache for her. I ache for her children. I ache that my world has chosen to ignore her suffering. I feel betrayed by the world that just to simply shrug off my sister's suffering as if she isn't a human being. I yell, I scream, I cry, I beg, I plead. I plead for her, I plead on her behalf and I plead for myself freely because my existence would not be of much meaning without her in it. Not surprisingly, the world which has chosen to disregard my sister's tears of agony continues to brush off my cries as well. I feel deep pain at a level and degree I never knew existed. I feel betrayed by the world that I had put too much trust upon to do the right thing, to stand up to barbarians and killers and genociders, to uphold its responsibility to protect the victims as it promised it will do time and time again. The world that I had trusted, it has failed me. Thus, at the end of every day, after I pray to my God for mercy, divine providence, deliverance for my sister and her children, I pray to her as well. I pray to her to just hold on for a little while longer. I plead just this one time when my beloved and down will come, I say, I beg her not to give in to the complete darkness and utter disparation that is threatening to swallow her whole. I beg her into willing herself to rise up and keep going, no matter how hard. I pray her to promise me that she will survive, to promise me that she will persevere, to promise me that she, I will see her again, to promise me that we will celebrate Ashenda together again. I beg her to promise me that she will live. And I trust she does hear my prayer. I trust she does promise. I know she does. She is my sister. The selfless, kind, compassionate, strong, unbreakable, and resilient one. Mind you, over the past two years, I have lost faith in so many things that I thought unshakable, but never in her, never in my sister. I never lose faith in her resilience and ironclad will to persevere. I never lose faith in her innate strength to fight back desperation and hopelessness. Did you ask why? Because I know her, because she's my sister. 
I know my sister very well. She will rise from the ashes no matter what. She will overcome against all odds. And yes, she will celebrate Ashenda the authentic and magical way only she can perfect. The streets of her hometowns and villages will once more again be adorned with her graceful beauty. The sweet melody of her sound, the medical rhythm of her dances, her infectious laughter, and her overflowing joy will reverberate across the hills, mountains, and valleys of the ground again. My sister, she will rise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amla Kawit. That was a very um, important conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to come here and present this to us. Um, the Ashanda time for us is a time of celebration and a time of hope. And um, that's exactly what you spoke to. You spoke to everything that we have been through and everything we have yet to overcome. And I'm confident that as a community, we'll get there. Our next presenter is Gabriel Mescal. Um, she is also going to give a very uh, thoughtful presentation. And I'll go ahead and pass the floor to her. Her presentation is going to be on um, the rehabilitation of Tigrayan genocidal rape victims. So it will be a heavy conversation. And um, I want to mentally prepare us all for that. I really again want to thank our presenters again, and I will go ahead and pass the floor to Amla Gawit. Thank you guys. Sorry, not to Amla Gawit, to, uh, uh, to Gebra. Hello, I am Gisele. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, hi. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to say happy Ashenda to all the grand women and the girls across the world, and especially to the Waros who are fighting against the fascistic and genocidal invading forces in the battle fronts. Um, so my presentation is about the rehabilitation of Tigrayan and the victims of the genocidal and weaponized rape. So um, why do we need to give this a special focus? Why do we focus on victims of this genocidal rape? So personally to me, I would put it this way. Um, I was invited to present this, I mean, to, to say something about the agonies of the women and the girls of the guy uh, in a mark. And I, I say that the level of the, the layers of agony of the Tigrayan uh, women and girls, and of course, some men and boys uh, is threefold. And that's why it deserves a threefold focus. Um, so I put it this way. The first layer is that they were targeted as every Tigrayan, this is their ethnicity. They have been starved, they have been denied of medical access, they have been murdered, massacred, everything as ethnic Tigrayans, as the men and the, the boys have been targeted. And secondly, they have been targeted because of their gender in the same way that women or girls in other parts of the world are targeted because of the, their gender by perpetrators. And thirdly, they have been targeted, they have been specifically targeted because of the joint ethnicity and gender, because they are Gryan women and the girls. That's the worst level of agony 
they have been targeted in a very special way because they are the growing women and the girls. So the, the level of violence becomes very much worse when the gender and the ethnicity is combined, the Grian plus women and the girls. That's why we have heard a single Tigrayan woman being raped by 23 soldiers for two weeks. That's why we Sorry. Sorry, uh, That's okay. the reason why we heard a Tigrayan woman have been gang raped and then Allen materials have been inserted in, in, in her genitalia. I'm just mentioning singular, I mean, um, individual, this is bad. the scale is in the hundreds of thousands. So they have been targeted in the, bay, in, in a, in, in the most brutal way that is unthinkable in the 21st century. So the agony is threefold and the focus has to be threefold. Um, so how, how did I get at, um, especially attracted to this topic of weaponized web? I remember on the 23rd of January, 2021, Reuters published an article uh, that says uh, an Ethiopian soldier pointing his gun at a young Ryan lady and telling her either she has to say, okay, is rape or he would kill her. That was, in the first month of 2021. And in the second month on the 11th and the 15th, there were other two additional articles on separate stories. On the 11th, there was a very uh, graphic article, the content so graphic about a young grand lady who was put in sexual slavery by the Eritrean soldiers alongside her own younger sister and other eight young Tigrayan ladies in a town nearby at the Grad. And on the 15th of February, the news of um, uh, Mona Lisa was published by the BBC. So these three articles uh, made me Put special focus on the issue of weaponized web. And on the 25th of February, uh, I was part of a group of the brothers who came up with this idea of um, rescuing the Tigrayan victims. So the purpose of with this, we have focused on three things. Number one, on searching for the victims and um, so trying to help them as much as possible with finances so that they can visit nearby health centers, etc., and also they can cover their expenses for sanit buying sanitary parts, etc. And the second, the purpose of this organization was that we document the agonies of that when women and the girls, when it was fresh. So that as time goes by, it is obvious that the story gets, you know, forgotten. And we wanted it to be documented um, when the memory is fresh. And the third point of this movement has been to, um, to seek justice for the Tigrayan women and the girls by providing the first hand data we collect to international human rights groups as well as uh, the UN offices. So these were the three points or the three reasons that we decided to come up with this idea of creating a movement 
and of course rescue the Bryans who have been victims of this genocide and, and weaponized rape. Um, so there is this uh, argument, should we use um, weaponized rape or complete rape sexual violence? Uh, so uh, uh, of course, uh, the definition of conflict rape sexual violence Includes uh, weaponized rape. So, weaponized rape is a subset of conflict related sexual violence. So, it would be better to use conflict related sexual violence every time we uh, engage with UN offices and other international human rights groups because it is formally. Um, in use in the UN offices. And also it includes a wide range of sexual violence. For example, rape, gang rape, sexual slavery, forced prostitution, and forced pregnancy. Uh, when we say forced pregnancy, it is because the fascistic and genocidal invading forces of uh, Amhara, Eritrea, and Ethiopia they intentionally destroy the health facilities throughout the right. And then they started raping and gang raping and putting the Brian women and girls in sexual slavery in military bases, in their homes, in church, uh, inside IDP shelters, uh, in safe houses, in medical uh, centers, everywhere, anywhere. Not, nowhere was safe for the grandmothers and women. Even the church and the mosque were not safe enough for them. They couldn't hide even inside the most sacred places on earth. So um, after they raped, after they uh, had gang raped them, they would deny them access to medical facilities. Number one, there is no, I mean, there is no functioning health facility. There was no, at least by that time, no functioning health facility because of intentional uh, vandalism, destruction, and um, ransacked and transported to Asmara, to Gondar, and to, yeah, of course, especially to Amhara and the Eritrea. So the Eritrea. And then there is no nearby health facility. They cannot visit a nearby health facility. And if they wish to go to a remote town where they think there might be a health facility, there was no transportation because the Ethiopian government has intentionally um, disrupted every service in Tigray. And they, they didn't have any finances because their bank accounts have been frozen. Every Tigrayan bank account has been frozen. And this is, of course, a genocidal uh, tool. So they have no money. They don't have medical access. They don't have psychological help. So the trauma stayed with them for a long period of time. That is not the only case. They couldn't abort their pregnancy. So they were forced to carry pregnancies of the weaponized and genocidal rape. And when we say forced abortion, there, were, there have been many Tigrayan pregnant women uh, whose pregnancies have been three months, five months, seven, eight, even nine. Women who have been about to deliver in a matter of two or three weeks have also been intentionally targeted targets of weaponized rape. So when they get raped by multiple soldiers, obviously the Tigrayan baby in the womb gets aborted naturally. I don't know what miscarriage they, they fit, I mean, they experience miscarriage because of the weaponized rape. That have been very, very rampant. And the forced sterilization, they have been mutilating their genital bodies. They have been inserting uh, alien substances, items into their genitalia. They have been spraying chemicals into their genitalia, intentionally infecting them with HIV, AIDS, and other STIs. 
and there, 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 has, not, there has not been immediate medical help. So we can imagine the amount of damage that they would be uh, exposed to with uh, uh, those intentional um, damages targeting their reproductive organs. And of course, forced marriage, I, I cannot call it forced marriage, it is sexual slavery. And, and they have been kept for months, several months in military, in military bases, in detention camps, in concentration camps. They have been targets of uh, multiple and repeated gang rapes, all forms of gang rapes, and of course, other forms of sexual violence. So all of these are contained or under the umbrella of conflict with sexual violence. So the broad scope Conflict related sexual violence includes weaponized rape. So it's better to say conflict related sexual violence than saying weaponized rape when we are engaging in a formal uh, tasks with the UN offices or other international human rights um, groups. So, why do we call this genocidal rape? Is now the question. I, I'm not going to say too much about this. This single article. Says it speaks volumes about how genocidal the rape has been integrated. So this Tigrayan uh, mother, mother of uh, three in the article, if I am not mistaken, it is in Al Jazeera. I can Google it. Uh, when the Amhara forces were trying to gang rape her. Not only gang raping her, also burning her genitalia with heated metallic rod. She was screaming and begging them, what wrong have I done to you? When she asked, the answer was, you did nothing but to us. Our problem is, is a womb. That the grand womb should never be burst. So there cannot be a genocidal, an expression um, more genocidal than this expression. And I want also to bring it into attention that uh, throughout the, the, the number of direct interviews, phone interviews I had with Brian women and girls, and of course the men, I have also been uh, on the phone with men, uh, victims of genocidal rape. So especially with the women and girls, what I observed has been, there are three patterns. The, in, the intention of the Amhara forces primarily is to um, make sure that the Tigrayan women uh, carry Amhara pregnancy, a pregnancy that whose father is Amhara. So they would impregnate them, deny them access to medical center so that they wouldn't abort the pregnancy. And then in the long term, in, in the long run, they hoped that they would have Amhara babies born from the grand wombs. That have been the basic and the fundamental calculation and intention that I have observed um, when interviewing women and girls who have been uh, gang raped by Amhara forces. Of course, there are exceptional cases in which, for example, in this case, in this Al Jazeera article, where they would damage their body and, of course, they mutilate their reproductive body. But most of the time, they would gang break them and deny them access to medical center. In the Western Tigray, there were some functioning health centers still now functioning. So they wouldn't let them go there and get uh, the abortion services. So it's obvious they have been doing that because they wanted to grant one best for these Amhara babies. And verbally, they have informed them that we want you want to uh, give birth to Amhara babies as well. We have heard Naima in Bagir interviewing Dr. Tedros in um, the IDPs in Sudan, and Dr. Tedros was saying that. We want to purify your womb with the Amhara blood. What does this mean? We want your womb to carry Amhara baby. You have to give birth to an Amhara baby. 
So that's genocide. Exterminating a Tigrayan uh, generation and then making sure that Tigrayan women give birth to Amhara babies is genocide, just simple. So the definition of genocide formally, according to the United Nations, definition of genocide. Uh, so any of these five actors committed with the intention. So intention plays a big role in order to, to, to say if a crime is genocide or not. The intention of the intention of destroying a group of people, the group could be ethnic, religious, or any sort of political group, it can be anything. A group who identifies themselves as belonging to a specific uh, domain. So killing members, for example, when connecting this with a with weaponizer or the conflict with sexual violence, uh, what did what did happen? What has happened to the grand women and girls and the boys and the men? They have been uh, serious bodily harm and mental harm have been inflicted on them. So the bodily harm is obvious. They have been ganged with by many armed men. Amhara militia, Amhara Fano, Eritrean soldiers, Ethiopian soldiers. Uh, in all interviews I had with the victims, there, have, there has been only a single case when the victim told me that she was raped by only a single man. Otherwise, the rest of interviews I had, all of them have been gang raped multiple times. Of course, raped multiple times or gang rape. So obviously there is bodily harm and they would torture them, they would beat them, they would starve them, no medical help, and they would mutilate their genital bodies, they would burn them, etc. So these are all bodily harms. And the outcome is the victims wouldn't be able to give birth in the future because they are damaging their reproductive body, most probably permanently. And they are infecting them with STIs, including HIV, and mutilating their genital body. And the mental and psychological harm is very obvious. They are traumatized. And if not, if, if they don't get timely mental health therapy, as time goes by, the trauma would leave a permanent damage in their health. So this is obviously, this satisfies the definition of genocide. Inflicting on the group conditions of life calculate to bring about the destruction in whole or in part. By the way, in genocide, number doesn't matter. Number doesn't matter. What matters is the intention behind the very crime. So, inflicting conditions of life, conflict, destroy to bring about physical destruction of a group. That's it. Saying that grand woman should never give birth to grand baby. That's calculated to bring a physical destruction in the long run. So it is a genocide. Measures intended to prevent births. I was contemplating on this for the point, what measures intended to prevent births within the group? So I was in a webinar where I, I asked this question to the presenter and he said, um, separating the male and the female members of the society for a given period of time. It can be for several months or a year, etc. So that they wouldn't be together and there would not be the creation of pregnancy within the group that the grand people, for example. 
The males have been done to concentration camps when we take Western Tigray. And the women, having been gang raped, some of them fled to Sudan. And some of them were displaced, evicted to Dedebi, to Shere, to other parts of Tigray. So families have been intentionally split. So that is obvious. That is prevention of birth within the Tigrayan people. If a husband and a wife that don't live together, there cannot be a baby. So that's also a genocide, a genocide. And the forceful transferring of children. There was one incident in which the victim told me um, she had, of course, she has a, um, a baby girl. The, the baby was at the time one year old, and the Amhara Fano, there were three of them, Amhara Special Force actually. After they gang raped the woman, they told her that they, they, they wouldn't kill the baby. The, the baby is, I mean, the, the, the do her daughter is young enough to be Amharanized. She, she, she is young enough to, to learn the Amhara culture. So when they use the young enough, the term young enough, they mean that she is not easy to the Grayan thinking. She's not easy to the Grayan identity. She's not easy to the to, Grayan to pride, etc. So that we can raise her in an Amhara mentality. So that is an indication that they have also been uh, thinking of Amharanizing Grayan babies or children who have already been in the Western Tigray or other parts of Tigray. So the final uh, version of the presentation is, what are the rehabilitation means of this genocidal conflict related sexual violence victims? So we I, 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 as to me, I would suggest those five bodies should work hand in the glove. The government of Tigray should take the responsibility of drafting new laws to protect the survivors. So I would interchangeably use survivor and victim. When I choose to use victim, I want to make sure that they get enough attention or survivor might, might be misleading because for me, it's my understanding. When I when people use survivor, survivor, and, and then the intent, I mean, it might create this assumption that the, those who were targeted by this genocidal rape has or have already got enough support, financial, mental, medical, psychosocial, etc. That might create such kind of thinking. So I don't like to use survivor most of the time because. I want those who were against of genocidal rape to get the proper attention, proper care, the amount or level of um, support they should get. So it, survivor for me finds her expression, luxurious expression. Of course, for the, when I speak with those who are targeted, I have to be careful. I have to use positive words as much as possible. But when we are talking among ourselves, we have we shouldn't be. Um, I I don't know. I I don't want to be the the, the their agony to be a kind of. Uh, I, I don't have the right term downplay. It is not downplaying. But downscale, maybe. It shouldn't be downscale so that they get immediate attention and proper attention. That's my concern. I hope I, I quite would clarify why I would use a um, victim uh, until I, we make sure that they have got enough support and attention. That's my argument. Otherwise, survivor is a nice word. So why would the government need new law? We know that 
there are some members of our community who would point their fingers on the survivors or victims who would undermine them, stigmatize them, uh, keep uh, name calling them. And of course, the children who are born out of the gang rape, Dhala uh, or very uh, fresh words. So they have to get enough protection. And there has to be a law that criminalizes any person who attempts to verbally, physically, or emotionally abuse, harass victims of genocidal rape, including the children who are born out of this rape. That's my concern. So the government has a big responsibility. Religious institutions as well, they should take a big role. They have to provide spiritual counseling to the victims. Um, there is a case, we are very religious people. Christianity, Islam, it doesn't matter. The grants, we are very religious people. So those victims, they need the religious fathers, the religious people to counsel them, to encourage them, to comfort them, that it is not their mistake that they are pure, as pure as they were yesterday, as pure as the rest part of the community. It's not their mistake. It's not their mistake. So, and it, they didn't commit any sin. So it, it, it is uplifting. It empowers them. It sheds light in their soul. Otherwise, they are in a very in absolute darkness. They lose hope very easily. So the religious institutions, they have a big burden. And not only the victims, but also the community. The religious father should shape the community, should guide the community so that the community embraces the victims, shouldn't stigmatize them, shouldn't traumatize, re-traumatize them. They have to be embraced as equal as the rest part of the community. And the community leaders, they have a big role as well. They have to influence the rest part of the community. The survivors, they are part of the day-to-day -day livelihood of the community. They can be married, they can be engaged, they can be part of the um, morning, they can be part of any daily events in the community. So they shouldn't be um, isolated, they shouldn't be sidelined, they shouldn't be left behind. So community leaders have also a big role to play in uh, influencing, persuading the community members to embrace them, to stretch welcoming hands to victims of this genocide array. And number four, public charities. The Grayan charities, they have to work very hard in pulling international fund towards the Grayan. Uh, the Tigrayan finance that is collected from the Grayans in the diaspora is not enough. We have to make sure that we pull as much as we can finances from the international community. So legally and formally registered charity organizations, Tigrayan organizations, they have to work very hard in searching for international NGOs who would sponsor um, activities related with survivors or victims of the genocide and rape. In create, uh, opening uh, safe houses uh, in big towns in Tigray, for example, in every zone, in Magadan, Al Maito, Adigrat, Aksum, Shira, Hamara, etc., in the zona, or if possible, also in other towns as well, to make sure that there are enough safe houses where the victims can be admitted in rounds, first by, second by, etc., like that, where they get psychosocial support training. The, the very fundamental thing is, in addition to the, psych, um, the mental and uh, medical help, they have to be empowered. Whether we like it or not, there are um, 
family, I mean, there will be divorces, whether we like it or not, because of uh, his wife is raped and he doesn't want to be um, in a married life with her. So the man wants to divorce her. Such cases have happened and in the future, they might also happen. Uh, of course, if the religious institutions and community leaders play their big role, the number of divorce might decrease, but we, we cannot stop happening. It, it will happen. We only can uh, lower the number. So those who are divorced, they wouldn't be um, concerned for their livelihoods if they get the proper training, if they are empowered in such kind of centers so that they feel that they can generate income, not only to help themselves, but also to contribute to the community. They feel that they are as e equal capable as the rest part of the community in um, playing their part in the development of Tigray as well. So they, their confidence is uplifted to the level of not only supporting their children, but also the community. They can play a positive role in the development of their community and environment. So that's the very uh, fundamental purpose of creating training centers across the ground. Um, and finally, the media. The rest, the other part, the other four, the government, the religious institutions, community leaders, and public charities, they, in uh, combination with the media, the media can be a very uh, conducive platform to continuously disseminate um programs that would shape the community so that the community opens our eyes opens our mind so that we become very welcoming accommodating sympathetic to the victims we don't stigmatize them but we can become very helpful to them mindful of our mouth not to damage them not psychologically re-traumatize them and also for their children, for the children born out of this rape. So the media, they can design a continuous regular program every week or every four, four days, doesn't matter, where they invite experts, uh, psych clinical psychologists, community leaders, religious fathers, uh, government uh, people who work in the government, etc., who would you know, convey very helpful messages to the community, psychologically, as well as um, other aspects of the community, where the community would know that those victims or survivors are as equal human beings as the rest part of the community. And finally, I would like to present a practical example, uh, recognition of existence in, in the Bosnia, I hope, all of us know Bosnia, the, in the 90s, 92 up to 95, there was a very bloody um, uh, civil war or genocide against the people of Bosnia um, by the, the government of Serbia in that time. So during those three years, there have been a very wide scale of war related rape or gang rape, weaponized rape to put it the proper way. So uh, many children were born out of this rape. And what happened wa was, you can count the number of years, 92 up to 2022. 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, imagine, now 30 years old, uh, man or woman who were born out of weaponized rape in Bosnia, they didn't have recognition of existence in the Bosnian uh, society. In the system, they're not recognized. So they face it psychological, social, economic, multiple forms of um, uh, difficulties and hardships. But they created an, an, an association. So they fought hard for their free rights, for human rights to be recognized as 
as uh, victims of, uh, you know, the war crime or uh, victims of civilian victims of the war. Now they are recognized. I think it was in August that they were recognized. There is a special law drafted by the government of Bosnia that mentions what rights and recognition is those uh, uh, men and women who were born out of the with rise rape should get. So that is a big relief to the mothers, not only to the children, but also to the mothers. Do you do we think that the mothers would feel good when the children are stigmatized, name called, uh, you know, isolated from the community? They are not going to feel good. For example, one of those who, with whom I have been on the phone, she is a very, she was a teenager when she was held in sexual slavery by the joint Ethiopian Eritrean soldiers in a military camp for uh, over a month. And then um, she was pregnant of this weaponized rape. So she fled to a neighboring country and now she's uh, in a refugee camp. So she delivered to a baby in the refugee camp. I was in contact with her even while she was delivering because we were very stressed. We had to find a gynecologist and it was um, a long story anyway. And then after some weeks, um, she found herself in a very stressful situation where she couldn't breastfeed the baby and she, emotionally she was not ready. She wouldn't feel good when she sees the baby, etc. So we managed to get uh, what you call this uh, formula milk for the baby so that she, we would help her um, get some level of relief from the stress because she's not feeding, breastfeeding the baby. And she's very religious. She feels that she is uh, uh, committing a sin. She is uh, becoming a sinner, etc., because the baby is getting starved. So after she got the formula milk, the baby immediately started to show uh, physical, uh, what we call, uh, growth. So in a matter of uh, three weeks, the baby was in a very good uh, health and physical condition. So the mother, started to have, you know, um, a positive attitude towards the baby. And then I asked her, uh, okay, we'll provide you the formula milk for as long as we can, but do you want the baby to, do you want to raise the baby on your own or we find an uh, NGO that would take the baby and uh, so that the baby can be raised in a, an orphanage center? And then she said, no, if you help me for the formula meal, I can't take care of the baby. I would raise the baby. So what I'm saying is uh, the mothers, some of them might feel it is committing sin to give away the baby to an orphanic center. I have to take care of the baby if I get the proper um, kind of financial or other forms of support. And then when a mother who dedicated herself this might to a baby that was born out of the weaponized rape, finds her baby or child being harassed, isolated, stigmatized, demonized by the community, what do, you, what do we think she would feel? should be stigmatized equally as equal as a baby, as a boy or the girl. So in order to make sure that the victims, the, their children and the community entirely are, uh, if all of us are to heal from the trauma, then we have to be very mindful of our words, our expressions, our actions, towards the mothers as well as their children. That's the big lesson I took from the Bosnia case. For a, a 30 years old man, stigmatized, isolated, in, uh, in a, a various forms of war, uh, various forms, 
So that's not good. The mothers were equally suffering. That's the whole story, including this article. With this, I wind up my presentation. Finally, I say Salalna Tigraiya. Of course, this is not just a simple statement. Uh, I'm part of a group of people. Uh, so we are about to establish this organization entirely dedicated to the Tigrayan women and girls, and of course, men as well, who are victims of genocidal and uh, fascistic uh, rape at the hands of the Ethiopian Eritrean and Amhara forces. Hopefully, we'll, come, we'll make this happen, is in the process. So we didn't want to continue with what you call the weaponized rape in the title. We want something positive that create as positive energy. We don't want that tapella to be there and the women are inside there. And the tapella says, rescue to cry and weaponize the victims. No, it doesn't make positive feeling. We want a, an expression that creates positive feeling. So we came up with this idea of Salal Natigra. Tigra is our home, our, you know, our umbrella, our shelter, our what everything. And inside this institution or organization will be able to support victims of this genocide. Okay? That's the meaning. Uh, finally, I would say send like an agenda. Uh, Thank you. Um, that was a very important conversation that we had. I think the thing to highlight from what you said, Gabra <clears throat> Mescal, is when you said that when it comes to genocide, it's not about the number of people that pass away, but the intent behind it. And I think the Ethiopian government has made it very clear what their intent is with our people. Um, they've used a lot of language, calling us cancer, saying they want to eradicate us, like you've given many examples of. And um, you highlighted exactly what the root cause of this issue is. So I really appreciate your insight on this issue. And I do want to say thank you to all three of our uh, panelists today. You guys gave a very educational, very... Uh, you know, uh, important discussion. Um, and I can tell you guys put a lot of hard work into it. So we're gonna go ahead and move into the question and answers portion of our conversation now. If there's anybody in the audience that has any questions for our panelists, go ahead and present them now. There is a Q and A tab in the webinar where you can question, you know, put your questions in there. Or if you want to drop them in the chat, you can go ahead and um, put them there. So um, if you have a question, very specific panelists, you can mention them by name, or if you just want to open it up to the group, um, I'll go ahead and give you guys a couple minutes to drop any questions that you have. Um, again, this conversation was centered around Ashenda and um, the, the message and the meaning behind why we celebrate Ashenda and exactly why Ashenda is so hard for us this year and for the past two years because of the conflict that our people are in, especially this year, because it's, you know, right around the same time that, um, you know, the, the, the war has kind of been reignited. Um, so we've kind of, you know, had to, didn't have to deal with a lot of the trauma that um, on such a large scale as we were in the beginning for the past few months due to the humanitarian truce. But now that that is over, um, the magnitude of the war is all coming at us really, really fast. And it's also happening around the same time as Ashenda, which I think, you know, kind of has some blessings in it because we're still congregating, we'll be together um, and celebrating the resilience of our people together, not necessarily celebrating, but supporting each other um, throughout this hard time. So um, if there's any questions, again, go ahead and present them. Um, if if not, I will go ahead and ask a few questions. I'll go ahead and start with Ababa. Um, Ababa, I did have a question for you. I know that um, you were speaking highly on like Tigrayan rights and um, what the women in Tigray and in the diaspora should be doing um, you know, during this time to uplift each other. I wanted to also ask you, um, in terms of advocacy work, what do you feel are the strongest ways that we should be advocating on our people? And do you have any suggestions for, uh, you know, to 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 in the diaspora um, for the things that they should be doing in order to be a voice for their people. Um, thank you, Fadia. Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, I would say uh, 
Number one, like to watch for ourselves, like as a woman in our community. I think we have to start doing a uh, uh, community uh, get together kind of group discussion. I've been working with a uh, woman empowerment and gender issues back in Tigray for years, especially with the war vulnerable women uh, uh, after the Ethiopian air trail war in the border of uh, Zalambasa, Fati. That was my location. So one of the methods we used to use uh, with the help of UNFPA and um, <clears throat> UNDP uh, and then UNICEF, uh, a kind of community mobilization and then a group focused discussion among women. It's coffee ceremony. What we need in our culture is a kind of healing coffee. We chatting with coffee or we dress up like this, uh, whatever we like, chiffon or uh, have a shout with uh, But we have to be open and then discuss to eliminate a little bit our emotions. I can see from my own perspective and on my own side, I think we just dying inside uh, emotionally. I cannot even hold my emotions uh, everywhere, but I was not like that in the past. Uh, number two, in the uh, community, uh, like for the international community, I would say we have to change a uh, kind of our advocacy a little bit uh, beyond uh, something demonstration, but more technical. I think we have to spend more time with foreigners uh, to spread out and then to create more uh, awareness and then to uh, being a, to build or have more support from the international community. I think we all tight together among Tigrians not to spend our time kind of eliminating not to talk about it's a kind of tired to our mind uh so we spend more time together but we not we ignoring or we reducing spend more time or create a relationship with other uh communities i think community is power and then, uh, so we have to spread it out to all over the community, but so far I'm so proud of you, like you, Faria, and then my brother Danny all the time. Um, I'm a kind of one of the person I can call him in a kind of emergency for my personal, even if I want it. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys are being amazing and then keep it up. A good job. Thank you. Thank you, Ababa. That means a lot. And I know Danny is amazing. He's there for anybody that needs him. Um, so, and I think that's something we can say about our whole communities. We're a very supportive community and emphasizing the need to community build is something that we can all benefit from and will definitely help in our advocacy work. So thank you for your insight on that. I do have one more question before we wrap up. Um, Lakawit, I wanted to ask you, I know that you were speaking on um, the the issues you focus mostly on like the struggles that our women or back home are going through and sent like a message of hope and resiliency for them I was wondering if you could do the same for Tigray and women in the diaspora I know that the past two years has been heavy for us um you know we're you know the, the not knowing has definitely been very hard and that the few information that we get has definitely taken a toll on us so I'm like I'm wondering what advice do you have to Tigray and women in the diaspora to take care of themselves to make sure that they are healthy and any self-care tips that you can give to women to protect their peace and their mental health during this time generally I am very proud of the woman Tigray and women in the diaspora, the work you guys are doing, the work everyone is doing. But always I would say like to focus on, on yourself, on your mental health, on your family, at the same time, like on the sisters like around us. Uh, the only thing I can say is usually now since it is uh, like virtual world, we meet here, we talk, we like, we feel like we are together. Then we go home and we're alone. So my advice to to Brian woman in the diaspora is to forge personal relationships outside of this virtual communication. Sometimes, like you would think, someone is surrounded with like 
hundreds of people, but probably at home, they are by themselves. So if we can forge personal relationships, if we can reach out to each other after these meetings, if we can be, I mean, like friends, if we can make friends in the real sense of, now I think mostly we, we communicate, we interact to do something. But then we need to, we need to have relationships. This is probably like, uh, The, the one advice I could give, but I am very proud of you guys. I couldn't be prouder of the work you guys are doing, your strengths, your resilience, your re leadership. I'm so proud. Thank you. That does mean a lot. Um, I can speak, I think, on behalf of everybody here that we're very proud of you guys too. The presentations that you guys gave today were very, very thoughtful, very insightful, and we learned a lot from you guys today. Um, you know, especially the young generation, everything that we are is because of the people that, you know, worked really hard for us. So I'm personally very grateful, and I know everybody here is too. And your answer was spot on, I think. Uh, even for myself, I know we're always on our computer, we're always on our phones, we're always meeting over Zoom, especially since COVID. Um, but we do need to rekindle that now, now that the world is, you know, we're just trying to get back to a sense of normalcy now that COVID has died down. It's important for us to still meet in person and to have those in-person connections and bonds in order to strengthen our community a lot more and take care of ourselves because, you know, human interaction is important. We can't live our lives on Zoom. So um, thank you for that answer. Um, I think that is going to be the end of the Q&A session. For the sake of time, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank our panelists again. You guys were very helpful. And thank you to everybody who's attending. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to you, Danny, and you can go ahead and introduce the next session. Thank you, Fadila. Uh, again, like Fadila said, very insightful. I was so happy to see uh, the ladies present and, and, and my brother also presenting in the last session. You guys are amazing individuals and, and, and we're so, so proud to have you. And uh, from this point, I, I do, uh, uh, for the sake of time, I wanna pass it to the CATS team that organized this. Uh, I'm forever grateful. They do a lot of work behind the scenes to make this happen. And uh, we don't always recognize that. And I wanna give you guys your flowers as well. Uh, starting with uh, Dr. Ahiru, um, uh, Dr. Gazi, and, and Dr. Danny, and everybody else behind the scenes that are doing all the work that it takes to coordinate this kind of event, a day-long event. And so, uh, Dr. Ahiru, I'll pass it to you to close us, and, and thank you for uh, everything that you've done to, to make this a reality. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you, all the participants. With this, we have come to the conclusion of our one-day-long event. And uh, the only thing remaining is uh, to thank and to to just to, to go with the with the closing speech. First of all, I would like to thank all panelists and presenters for bringing us the thoughtful and provocative insights, the session moderators for effectively and if professionally chairing their slots in a reasonably timely manner. I am also very thankful for the participants who joined us on this virtual session and the streaming platforms. Your active participation has provided us a unique experience that otherwise couldn't have been missed. Without your participation, valuable ideas and discussions, this conference would have not, would have not been able to get the insightful reflections and presentations in real time. A conference such as this, takes the whole village and many hardworking colleagues, both in the Center for the Advancement of Tigray Studies, CATS Forum at uh, Tigray Communities Forum and Tigray Communities Forum Women's Committee have worked day and night to make this event a success. When we plan to organize this conference, we at the Center for the Advancement of Tigray Studies wanted to pull together the following milestones. First, encourage Tigray scholars and Tigray-based international researchers to engage in, um, in mutual conversations about the most important questions of women and ritual as it matters. Second, we wanted to center Tigray and women not just as active and self-fulfilling part of the society, but also as women who endured the brand of challenges such as 
the violence uh, they are experiencing at the consequence of the ongoing genocidal war perpetuated by the Ethiopian and Eritrean forces and the brutal siege imposed on them for, the, for over two years. Third, we wanted to encourage communities and scholars to explore possibilities and opportunities for Tigrayan women in the diaspora. Above all, we wanted to bring us much diverse perspectives and views about Ashenda and its many social youth. It is amazing that in the one day long event, we have interrogated several issues and raised diverse ideas. The turnout of the participants and the substances of the discussions have exceeded our expectations in many aspects. The concurrent sessions, the roundtable panels, and the doc documentaries have laid the foundations for further interrogation and to interrogate Tigrayan women's intersecting challenges and potentials. I hope your collaboration with Center for the Advancement of Tigrayan Scholars, the Scientific Service Unit of the Tigray Communities Forum will continue in the future as, a, as the cuts leadership continues to believe are very useful. I believe we have benefited from the sessions and the discussions tremendously. Today, Tigrayan women are subject to multifarious and layered violence everywhere they are. In Tigray, the ongoing war has been ruining not just their assets and rights, but it is also inflicting irredeemable pain in their dignified bodies. Tigrayan women have been treated as disposable bodies, converting their bodies onto a battlefield with, with much deadlier than the war that's been fought in the front lines. We at Center for the Advancement of Tigrayan Studies call an end to the insurmountable violence against women and the systemic siege and blockade that has been claiming the lives of women and girls more than anyone else. In the diaspora women, in the diaspora women, Tigray women are experiencing inequality by virtue of their womanhood, blackness, and disparities arising from their position in the society. Tigray women's vulnerability, however, exceeds other inequalities first, first for because of their diasporic status, and secondly, because of the heavy weight of the ongoing war that's been fought in to grind for over two to three, three years. Therefore, we are going use Ashenda as a space for to grant women and men to, dem to demonstrate agency and resilience while reimagining the future of women within the challenge. In, the in what follows, I, will, I would like to thank once again all of you for your patience and contributions. I am also pleased to see many colleagues and friends from LA University. Um, it is also an honor to have Professor Dan Bauer as a keynote speaker along with Professor Fortin, sharing their thoughts and reflections uh, from their past lived experiences. With this, we have, we have come to the conclusion of this conference, but let me acknowledge the unwavering efforts of the following who worked hard in planning and organizing this conference. I would like to acknowledge and thank all member board members of the Center for the Advancement of Tigrayan Studies. I would like to thank Mr. Mulugeta Gavru for supporting us from day one to this time. I would like to thank Member Zoya Shamar representing the Women's um, Committee of the Tigray Communities Forum of North, North America. I would, I would like to thank the Tigray Communities Forum as an umbrella organization helping us and uh, uh, providing us with all the, the necessary uh, materials and support. And I would like to, uh, to thank uh, my sister Ababa Waldetekla who has worked with us uh, as a as a, as member of the planning team representing the Women's Committee, Committee of uh, Tigray Communities Forum. Most importantly, I would like to, 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 pro, to, to give a special thanks to my brother, Danny, Daniel Waldo, Danny Denver, and the moderators 
who have really just exerted tremendous support and energy in order to make this conference a success. I am very much honored and humbled by the diligence and flexibility and support all of you have pro provided us. And uh, I am uh, very excited to see all those great ideas have been shared and reflected in this platform today. And with this, we've come to the end of the day and the end of the conference. And uh, I wish you all the best from this on. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alfredo. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night, okay? Have a good evening. Uh, all the organizers, you guys are amazing. Yeah, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy it, Shunda. Be happy. Don't Thank be you. Thank you. I'll, I'll happy try Shunda, everyone. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, Walbert. Well, how are you? Bye -bye. Nice to see yeah. you, Arby. Yeah, good to see. Very long oh. time. Long time, indeed. Yes. Uh, very, very fantastic.